Chapter 15 Going through the motions of disembarking the aircraft, getting through customs, and picking up our luggage felt a little bit like one of those strange dreams where everything one of those strange dreams where everything around you felt fuzzy and unreal. But there was a part of you, deep down in your consciousness, that knew it wasn't real. Only this time, it was. And the loud thump, thump, thump in my ears was evidence of just how much. And yet, as much as the part of me kept repeating that I would wake up while my heart kept screaming that I already was awake, and that it was really happening, the moment the arrivals gate came into view, my whole body froze with realization. My suitcase wheels screeched against the floor as my two feet became rooted to the spot. Breath stuck in my throat. I watched the gates opening and closing, letting out whoever had been walking ahead of us. I glanced at Aaron, who had been walking beside me, but was now a couple of steps ahead. My overpacked bag hung off his shoulder again. Aaron, I croaked, that thump, thump, thump growing louder and louder. I can't do it. Feeling as if my lungs had been filled with cement, I brought a hand to my chest. Ay Dios, I heaved. Ay Dios mío. How had I let this get so far? What was I going to do if everything blew up in my face? What if I made it all worse? I was crazy. No, I was plain stupid. And I wanted to punch myself in the face. Maybe that would snap me out of it. My gaze roamed around desperately, probably looking for an escape, a way to get out. But I couldn't see anything past those gates that separated us from my parents and kept swallowing passenger after passenger. No puedo hacerlo, I muttered, not recognizing my own voice. I can't do this. I just can't go out there and lie to my whole family. I can't. It won't work out. They'll know. I'll make a fool of myself, the fool that I am, because... Aaron's fingers found my chin, tilting my face up to meet his gaze. Hey. The blue in his eyes shone under the fluorescent light illuminating the terminal, snatching all my attention. There you are. Not able to voice a single word without completely losing my shit, I shook my head lightly. His fingers remained where they were. You are not a fool, he told me as he kept staring into my eyes. My lids fell closed for a moment, not wanting to see whatever he was looking at me with on top of everything I was barely keeping at bay. I can't do it, I whispered, opening my eyes and meeting his gaze. His voice hardened. Catalina. Stop being ridiculous. Contrary to the gentle grip of his fingers, his command was blunt, insensitive, considering he was talking to a woman on the verge of flipping out. But something in it forced me, enabled me, I realized, to take the first full breath in the last couple of minutes. So I did exactly that. I breathed in, and then I breathed out. All the while, Aaron looked me straight in the eye with something that should have made my anxiety shoot back to the roof but that instead brought me slowly back. We've got this, he said with confidence. We, that simple two-letter word somehow sounded a little louder than the rest. And then, as if he had been waiting for me to be ready to hear it, he went for the killing blow. You are not on your own anymore. It's you and me now. We're in this together. And we've got this. And somehow, for a reason I knew I would never be able to explain, I believed him. I didn't question or fight him. Neither of us said anything else. My apprehensive brown eyes held his determined blue ones, and some kind of silent understanding passed between us. Us. Because we, Aaron and I, had just become an us. Aaron's fingers dropped from my chin and wrapped around the hand that hadn't been clutching my chest. He squeezed gently. Ready? He asked me without words. I took one last deep breath, and we headed for the doors that opened to the arrivals terminal of the small Spanish airport. To my parents. To this outrageously ludicrous farce we were about to embark on. To this, what had we called it before? Oh yeah, to this whole Spanish love deception we had planned. Because we, Aaron and I, got this. He had said so, and I believed him. I just hoped, for both our sakes, that he was right.
Papa, for the last time, we are more than okay here. My eyes searched the small room for my fake boyfriend, looking for backup. The corner of his lips tipped up. Maybe if we move Abuela to your sister's place, Papa continued. You two could take the big guest room in the house, although I'm not really sure if Tio Jose and Tia Inma will be sleeping there. Wait, let me call him. Papa, I cut him off, reaching out to pat his arm. It's okay. This apartment is more than okay. You don't need to move us to the house. Leave Abuela alone. A wave of nostalgia and familiarity hit me right in the gut. It had been so long since I had come home. All of it felt as familiar as breathing, and at the same time, it was like a memory I had not revisited in a long time. My dad and his good heart, always so accommodating, caring too much, trying to make everybody feel at home even if it meant going through the bedroom hunger games. I had been so preoccupied with dreading the moment that I had forgotten they were my family, my home, and God, despite everything, I had missed them with all my heart. My mom shifted from the entrance of the cramped bedroom, assessing the situation. Ay, cariño, your father is right, no sé. She hesitated, looking for the words. Este hombre es tan alto y grande. Her gaze landed on Aaron, traveling from his head to his feet and back up again, while she shook her head with a mix of awe and skepticism. I thought I had seen that start of a smirk on Aaron's lips inching higher, which earned him a questioning look from me. I know what grande means. That little bend of his lips was there until he turned to my mother, squaring his expression. I appreciate your concern, Christina, but we will be perfectly fine sleeping here. Muchas gracias por todo de nuevo. Together with my mother's, my jaw almost dropped to the floor for the second time today. The first time had been earlier in the airport where I had first learned that Aaron did speak enough Spanish to introduce himself to my parents in my mother tongue with barely an accent. Quickly after, and while my jaw stayed right where it was, the grin that was reserved for a very limited number of people came alive in Mama's face. Then, I watched her release a breath, half wonder and half resignation, as if she was fine to accept Aaron's statement without putting up any kind of fight, as long as he kept talking in Spanish which was something she reserved for very few, too. My very lucky and very much fake boyfriend gifted her with a polite smile. Catalina doesn't take that much space anyway, Aaron suddenly said. We will find a way to snuggle in, right, Bojito? My head swirled in his direction. Yes, I gritted out. We will snuggle right in. Promising myself he'd pay for that later, I looked at my dad in horror. Much to my dismay, I found him grinning. My mom, on the other hand, just nodded, her eyes flitting from Aaron to me, assessing our difference in size and height. Which, thankfully, wouldn't be a problem. The convenient apartment that my parents rented during the high season to vacationers had two bedrooms. Just like everything about the flat, the rooms were small and functional, with only what was strictly necessary. But that meant that we, Aaron and I, wouldn't be doing any snuggling. We were not even going to be sharing a room. Thank the heavens. Which reminded me, it was time for my parents to leave. Okay, you two, thank you, but this is enough of a welcome, I said, walking up to them and pushing them lightly toward the door. We have suitcases to unpack and a bachelor slash bachelorette party to get ready for. Vale, vale, my mother said as she grabbed my dad's arm. You see, Javier, they want to be alone. Her eyebrows did a little wiggle. Ya sabes. My dad muttered something unintelligible, showing that he had no interest in finding out why. So I ignored my mother's innuendo, and after wrapping my parents in a big hug, I shooed them out the door. In the meantime, Aaron politely thanked them again in Spanish for my mom's benefit, and remained in the corner where he had been standing. With my parents finally gone, I turned to Aaron and found him placing both of our suitcases on the bed. He unzipped his and started extracting pieces of clothing and toiletries. Actually, you don't need to do that, I told him, not bothering to open my bags. Aaron cocked an eyebrow. We will sleep in separate rooms, I explained. Oh? That was the only thing that came from him. Ignoring that puzzled look he had just shot me, I made my way to the hallway to lead him to what would be his room, with his very own bed. 
Right behind me, Aaron stepped in the space only a few seconds after. Ta-da! I gestured with my arms. Here's your room, your dresser. Your bathroom is out in the hall, though. And yeah, that'll be your bed. I pointed at the twin bed as I took in its ridiculous dimensions. The room was much smaller than I remembered. Glancing at Aaron, who was right by my side, I found him inspecting the bed with his arms crossed over his chest. Just how my mother had done a few minutes ago, I eyed him up and down. Yeah, that was not going to work. All right, I said, accepting he would never, ever fit there. I'll change rooms with you. Take the other one. It's bigger. I'll take the twin. It's okay, Catalina. I'll sleep here. No, you won't. You won't fit in that tiny bed. I pointed out the obvious. Not even diagonally, I don't think. It's fine. Go and pack your things. I'll make it work. You won't. There's no way you can sleep here, I insisted, ignoring the dirty look Aaron sent me over his shoulder. I will. Stubborn, hard-headed man, I thought. You are the only hard-headed one here, he said. I narrowed my eyes at the mind reader. Well, if you want to be my pot, I'll gladly be your kettle, I pointed at the bed. Prove it. Show me you fit in there, and I'll leave you alone. Aaron sighed as he uncrossed his arms and brought a hand to his face. Would you just... He stopped himself, shaking his head. You know what? This one time, I'm going to humor you, just to avoid wasting away both our lives arguing over this until we're rolling on matching wheelchairs. He was wrong. Matching wheelchairs was something that would never be in my plans where Aaron Blackford was concerned. In two strides, my fake and very tall boyfriend was right in front of the modest twin. He won't fit. I was sure of it. So I leaned back and waited for him to prove how right I was. As soon as Aaron climbed onto the tiny piece of furniture, the mattress bounced a little too wildly under his weight. With a loud squeak, he adjusted his body lying on his back, changed his position a couple of times as the mattress complained under his weight. Nothing. He did not fit. Taking in the clearly larger-than-the-bed man in front of me, feet dangling off the frame and glaring at the ceiling, I couldn't help but let the grin I had been fighting finally break free. It wasn't the fact that I had been right all along. Nope. The satisfied and toothy smile that split my face had everything to do with the grumpy Aaron who was lying diagonally on the tiny twin bed with the scowl that went for miles. The best part was that he had humored me and proven it just because I'd told him to. Just because we were equally stubborn. And that only made me grin wider. Walking closer, I didn't turn down the megawatt smile as I looked down at him. Comfy? Very. I just bet you have never been this comfortable in your life. He rolled his eyes. Fine, Aaron said as he sat up. The springs in the simple and, let's face it, most likely cheap mattress creaking loudly under his weight. So you were right, he continued as he moved to the edge, trying to leave a bed that seemed to be turning into quicksand, swallowing each of his movements. Now if you would just... Before I could even realize what was happening, the structure of the bed gave in with a big bang, engulfing part of the mattress and Aaron along with it. A gasp shot out of me as my hands flew to my mouth. Jesus fucking Christ, Aaron growled. Oh my God, Aaron. The cackle that left my mouth as I stared at the grumpier-than-ever man sitting in the middle of the box spring catastrophe was probably heard all the way to New York City. He didn't look anywhere near okay if the way he glowered was any indication. But I asked anyway, are you okay? I tried to sober down, I did, but I couldn't hold in the laughter. So I laughed. Then I laughed louder. Yes, all good, he grunted. Nothing I can't handle. Okay, but just in case, I stretched my hand to help him out. But both of us froze when a holler came from the entrance door of the apartment. A voice that sent shivers down my spine. Hola, a pitchy shrill tone called. Was that? Hay alguien en casa? That voice I realized I knew and I was related to called again. No. The woman whose red hair I was almost certain was about to make an appearance in about two seconds asked if there was someone at home, as if she hadn't probably known already. 
Charo. My cousin Charo was in the apartment. And judging by the quick clicking of her heels, she'd be in the room in about... Ay, pero mira que bien, someone is christening the bed. A giggle that was not adorable and was outright evil instead reached my ears from behind me. Understanding flashed through my fake boyfriend's face. Not caring to wait for my response, my cousin continued blabbing. Look at this mess, she tisked. After being single for so long, one would think you were out of practice, Linita. I grimaced. Way to put it out there, prima. My eyelids shut on instinct, and I felt a blush climbing up my throat. Because really, how many years have gone by since the whole thing with Daniel exploded? Three, four, maybe more? Oh, sweet Lord. I wanted to disappear. I couldn't believe Chato had gone straight to that after barely saying hello, and in front of Aaron. I didn't want to look at him. Didn't want to look in his direction, for that matter. Couldn't that busted and mangled bed swallow me up, too? And just like that, my wish was granted. Aaron tugged at my arm and pulled me right with him, ripping a squeal out of me, right onto the chaos that used to be a twin bed. My body ended up sprawled half on top of him. Not for long, though, because before I knew what was happening, his large and meaty arms flipped me onto his lap turning me to face my cousin Charo and causing my body to go as stiff as a broomstick at the change of positions. Holy shit, I am on Aaron's lap, back to front, ass on, yeah, on his lap. I'll take the blame for this. His deep voice came from very freaking close behind me as I slowly recounted all the body parts I felt pressed against my own much softer ones. Thighs, chest, arms, all hard and flushed against my body, against my ass, against my own thighs, and I had to stop thinking of body parts. Hard to resist myself, really. My fake boyfriend's words entered my ears at the same time I noticed the muscles underneath me flexing. Right, bollito. Oh, my God. He was, I was, I just, right, <laughs> I croaked, osito. Chato beamed at us, 100% satisfied with the show. She had just gotten to the apartment and already obtained a story I'd be hearing about for the next 10 years. The time Lena and her boyfriend broke that twin bed. I bet she'd add stuff that never happened. Maybe that she had seen Aaron naked or something. A mental image intruded my mind. One of Aaron, sans clothes, with all those muscles I was feeling. No, no, no. I look at you too, my cousin said, bringing her hands under her chin. You look so adorable together. And Lena, I never thought you'd be this kind of crazy. Chato wiggled her eyebrows. Aaron's hand landed on my knee, the contact branding the skin under my jeans. God, I could feel him all around me. If I relaxed my spine, I'd snuggle right into him. The warm palm squeezed my thigh. I kept losing my focus, and now Charo seemed to be waiting for me to say something. Oh, yeah, I recapped as fast as I could. I needed to get out of here, off Aaron. The position we were in was too distracting, in a very, very, very bad way. Ahem, <clears throat> yes, crazy. Oh, you bet. This is all super crazy, I said, squirming in Aaron's lap as I unsuccessfully tried to make my way out of the man-sized black hole that had sucked me in. It is crazy because I am super crazy. Crazy about him, that is. I squirmed some more, realizing I might be stuck somewhere between his large thighs. Keep talking. Like, so crazy in love, it's even crazy, you know what I mean? So crazy. I think she got it, my fake boyfriend whispered in my ear, sending a stupid shiver rushing down my whole body. I kept shifting further in his lap, ignoring how everything I felt underneath me or my ass more specifically, was solid and warm. No, hot, it was hot. Muscles upon muscles upon more muscles, some of them becoming harder with every useless effort I made. Oh my gosh, oh, Dios mío, was that? No, it couldn't be. Aaron couldn't be aroused. Desperate, I tried to propel myself off him one more time, obtaining a little grunt from Aaron's lips. It landed on the back of my neck as a puff of air. Stop, he breathed in my ear. That's not helping with the situation. I immediately obeyed, 
forcing my body to relax into him. Okay, I have this. Think of it as a chair, a throne, not Aaron, just a hard, man-sized throne. I gave my cousin a fake smile. So, what are you doing here, Chato? Oh, I was going to stay with a friend for the wedding weekend, but the bathroom in his apartment flooded or something, and I have no choice but to sleep here instead, she explained with a little wave. I'm sure you thought you had the place to yourselves, huh? She wiggled her eyebrows again. I swear I won't be in the way. You won't even notice I'm here. There was only one way we wouldn't notice Chato snooping around, and that involved hardcore narcotics. Great. Well, we should really unpack and let you do the same, I announced from my position on my Aaron throne. I cleared my throat. Yeah, all right, let's do that, I added, neither Aaron nor me moving. I cleared my throat very loudly. Don't you think we should get going, Osito? Before I could ask, Aaron's hands were on my waist, and I was lifted off his lap and then up in the air. With shaky legs, I landed in front of my cousin. Whoa! Okay, so it could have been that easy. Aaron, who had mysteriously regained his usual agility, followed suit, leaving behind him the spring and wood disaster. I haven't introduced myself. Aaron stretched out one of the hands that had been wrapped around my waist a little more than a second ago, the one hand that squeezed my thigh. Soy Aaron, un placer conocerte. My cousin, who I suspected had already requested all of Aaron's available information from my mother, took his hand and pulled him to her. Ay, y habla español. El placer es mío, cariño. She planted one kiss on one of his cheeks. Yeah, I was sure she hadn't been lying when she said the pleasure of meeting him was all hers. After my cousin released Aaron, who looked a little dumbfounded, she engulfed me in a hug, too. Come here, prima. I have kisses for you, too. And she added in a whisper so only I could hear it. ¿Dónde tenías escondido a este hombre? Where were you hiding this man? I chuckled. Oh, prima, if you only knew. Stepping away from my red-haired relative, I was startled by the contact of Aaron's palm on the small of my back. I jumped back right into his front. Aaron looked down at me, a question in his gaze. Go ahead to our room and start unpacking. I'll take care of this mess for your cousin. That was so very thoughtful. I had forgotten about it. Apparently, leaving my cousin to deal with a broken twin bed wasn't high on my priority list. Oi, no, no, Chato intervened before I could apologize. I will call Tio Javier, she said, referring to my dad as Uncle Javier. You two go get settled in. I'm sure you're exhausted from the trip. Just make sure not to break the other bed, too. She accompanied that with a cackle. I can take the blame for this one, but yours... That would be an awkward conversation with your dad. Then she winked. Without more than a thank you, we shuffled back to what would be our room. Our room, which we had to share now. Damn it. We'd better unpack and try to get comfortable. If that had been any indication of what was ahead of us during the upcoming days, my fake boyfriend and I were in for a messy ride. Suitcase almost empty an all-wedding attire already hanging in the closet, I sent a sideways glance at the bed in our room. I had been doing that for the last 15 minutes. I'll be waiting, it seemed to sing, making me wish it would magically crumble down and disappear too. Stop worrying. I can sleep on the floor if it makes you that uncomfortable. Aaron looked at me, eyebrows creased. I'm not worried, I lied. Sharing a bed with Aaron was something I hadn't expected or planned for. My parents had said only we would be staying in the apartment. Most of the guests were from the region, and the ones who weren't would be arriving only for the big day. We're adults, and we have known each other for almost two years now. We can be civil and share the bed. At least it's a double, and it's standing up. I'll tell your parents that I will take care of the other one. I'll pay for the damages. There was something in his voice. He sounded pensive and almost embarrassed. You don't have to, Aaron. And I meant it. It wasn't your fault. The bed had lasted more than it should have, really. These things happen. Grabbing a couple of shirts off my suitcase and unfolding them, I pondered my own words. Never in my life had I witnessed that firsthand, but hey, these things did happen. Maybe to Aaron they had. 
Maybe he had destroyed dozens of beds, reducing them to a mess of wood and springs. He was a large man, one who was built to. Beds could very well give out and burst under his weight. Maybe if he moved around too much, or if he dropped his body on them with a certain force, or if he engaged in activities that tested the resistance of the frame and springs and... No, no, no. I kicked out of my head that image of a sweaty and naked Aaron doing... No. Okay, Aaron said, zipping closed his emptied suitcase. And if you're sure we can share the bed, then we will. With a little luck, this one won't shatter too. A whole new mental image ambushed me, one very familiar, but that now included me and, nope, I needed to stop this nonsense. It's settled then, I said, getting rid of those unwanted thoughts and ideas. No sleeping on the floor. We can't risk getting caught having Chato around. Couples share beds. And we would get caught exactly how? Does your cousin go around entering bedrooms she doesn't sleep in? Well, Aaron, I really wish I could tell you she didn't, but I would be lying. Years had taught me that Chato was unpredictable. So, I changed the subject. In a couple of hours, we will be meeting the youngest members of the Martin clan for phase one of the bachelor slash bachelorette party. A little briefing, please, he queried. Aaron had finished unpacking, which I hadn't, so he leaned his back on the wardrobe that was in the corner of the room and gave me his full attention. You'll be delighted to hear that we will spend the day outside, enjoying the warmth of the Spanish sun on our skin, and doing something that has nothing to do with sipping mimosas and getting massages, which was my idea. I walked to the narrow dresser and grabbed a neat stack of towels. My maid of honor duties were overruled by one of my youngest cousins, Gabby. I placed the towel on the comforter. And that means only one thing. I paused dramatically. The wedding cup. A wedding cup? A chuckle left Aaron's lips. Strangely, that little noise made me want to smile. I ignored it and gave him a rundown of how we'd be occupying our day instead. In the wedding cup, I sighed. Team Bride, which is composed of all the females invited to the bachelor slash bachelorette party, competes against Team Groom, which will be composed of the male ones. I said that last part with sarcasm. Real refreshing, huh? Boys against girls competing in a series of games and activities. Yay! Aaron nodded, not taking any side. I can tell you are very excited, but please continue. I sent him a look. The team that collects more points will secure the win and obtain the wedding cup. And is this cup a physical trophy or just a symbolic reward? Aaron asked, and I could tell he was trying to take this seriously. Unsuccessfully. He could barely contain his amusement. Listen, my arms went to my hips in an attempt to make myself look imposing. I told you I was not in control of this. I am more of a representative maid of honor. My cousin Gabby is one of those fitness-obsessed people, and she organized the whole thing. So just be glad that you are not stuck with me on your team. Picking up my toiletry and makeup bags, I walked to the modest, in-suite bathroom as I kept absently filling Aaron in while I placed all my things on the narrow space available. I am not happy about this, okay? If it were up to me, we would be at a spa while you guys went somewhere to do guy stuff. Guy stuff? I heard Aaron's voice coming from the bedroom. Yeah, punch your chests, drink beer like it's the end of your lives, or go to a strip club. What do I know? I shook my head, knowing I was being a little too stereotypical. But no, I continued, placing a travel-sized container of shampoo on the counter. We couldn't be so lucky. Funny enough, the one on board with this thing is Gonzalo. Who would have thought a stupid competition over enjoying his last day as a bachelor away from his bride? Not that I'm shocked. Gonzalo has been crazy about my sister since the moment he laid eyes on her. So why would he want to spend a day away from her? What they had was the real stuff. Honest, devoted, palpable love. The one that transcended distance, differences, and obstacles. The kind that was meant to be written about in books. Thinking of it filled my chest with warmth and longing for something I didn't know whether I'd ever be able to find. Anyway, Gonzalo is the wedding cup's biggest cheerleader. And something tells me he'll be more than thrilled when he sees you. He'll holler and bro-hug you, and you'll be his new best friend, I can tell. Gon is so competitive, always has been, 
so he'll be over the moon to have the closest thing to a freaking Greek god on his team. Straight out of Olympus, I snorted. Aaron did look a little like one of those sculptures, all stoic and smooth and symmetrical lines. Gonzalo would love Aaron on the... Hold up. What did I just say? My eyes closed at the realization that I had called Aaron a god, a Greek one, out of Olympus, out loud. Oh, please, bathroom walls, be thick and soundproof, please. Sensing his presence somewhere behind me and considering the dimensions of both the room and en suite, I remained very still. I opened my eyes and looked at his reflection in the mirror in front of me. Aaron was leaning on the doorframe. Inhaling a deep breath, I let my eyes travel around the counter, taking in everything and making my way up until finding Aaron's gaze in the mirror. Chances of you not hearing me from the bedroom, I ventured. It depends. I watched his throat work, swallowing. How good hearing do Greek gods have? I have two options. Own it like the grown-up woman I was, or ignore this had just happened and be a total chicken shit. Rearranging every item I had just placed on the shelf in silence, I opted for the latter, all the while feeling his gaze following my every move. A moment later, I sensed Aaron turn around, but before he walked away, I called out, Oh, and Aaron? I watched the reflection of his back in the mirror. The losing team has to perform a choreographed dance tonight. No answer came from him, but when he finally took a step away, I could perfectly imagine the competitive gleam coming alive in his eyes. Chapter 16 I stood with my hands on my hips, getting a little lost in the palette of blues and greens that painted the view before me. When people thought of Spain, they thought of jammed beaches under the merciless summer sun. They thought of tables loaded with jars of sangria, pans stuffed with paella, and a payload of tapas. They most likely thought of some dark-haired dude serenading the evening with impossibly masterful fingers strumming a guitar too. And in a way, they were not completely wrong. One could find that in Spain. But it was only a small part of what represented my home country, one that sadly didn't even cover 10% of what it offered. The small city where I had come from stood on the most northern coast of the peninsula, wedged between the often fierce and ivory-topped Cantabrian Sea and a range of emerald mountains. Contrary to general belief, the country wasn't bathed in sun throughout the whole year either, particularly not the northern region. Nope. The north of Spain was known for granting its inhabitants the chance to experience all four seasons in the span of a few hours any day of the year, which made it possible for the vegetation to grow wild and lush engulfing pastures and hills, and creating an image very few thought of when it came to Spain. So yeah, summer wasn't all that great in the north. But surprisingly, today the sky was clear, and the breeze from the sea was gentle. It brought me back to a time when, in days like these, we would try to make the most of it, as if our lives depended on it. From dawn till dusk, Isabel and me, Las Hermanas Martín, the Martín sisters. Taking a peek at the group of people who had gathered today for the wedding cup, a little part of me wondered what was going on inside Aaron's head. What had been his first impression of the place that had seen me grow up? Of my people? Introductions had gone better than good. If Spaniards were known for something, it was their openness and hospitality. Nobody had seemed to bat an eyelash at my fake boyfriend, not more than the awkwardness of having a guidi, what we called tourists and therefore having to use their rusty English. Only the youngest generation of both the brides and grooms' families, their partners, and some of our closest friends were here. Except for our barbaric and free-spirited cousin Lucas, who no one knew where he had disappeared to this time. And the best man, otherwise known as Daniel, my ex, my first and only relationship, or the man my family believed I had never gotten over. He had not arrived yet. Aquí está mi hermana favorita. My sister's voice reached me a heartbeat before I was tackled from behind. I am your only sister idiot. Of course I'm your favorite. I wrapped my hands around her forearms, which were resting on my collarbone. Forget about technicalities. You are still my fave. 
Sticking my tongue out, I looked at her over my shoulder. If not for our heart-shaped faces, we wouldn't look anything alike. Isabel had always been taller and leaner than me. Her eyes had a little green speckle to the brown we shared, something I had always been envious of. And her hair was curlier and darker, just like Mama's. But the differences didn't stop there. Where my sis was this puzzle piece that fit anywhere at the first try, I had always seemed to struggle with finding my place. Somehow, I always managed to be missing a little corner or have an extra edge that pushed me to keep trying somewhere I might fit better. That pushed me to keep looking for that place to call home, because that was no longer Spain for me. But neither was New York. As much as I had Rosie and a career I was proud of, it had always felt a little lonely, incomplete. Hello, Earth Calling Lena, she said, coming to my side, tugging at my arm. What's up with you today? Why are you hiding here? I had been doing that, hadn't I? Even if only for a few minutes. My big sister knew me far too well, so I made a note of being extra watchful around her with Aaron. If there was someone who would see through the deception, it would be Isabel. Not hiding, I shrugged my shoulders. I was just trying to have a moment of peace away from the bridezilla. I heard she almost ripped the groom's head off because he'd bought the wrong shoes. I stepped away and turned so I could face her. You heard that right. My sister and bride-to-be brought a hand to her chest, feigning dismay. I let him pick one thing, Lena, one. And he came home all proud and happy with a pair of shoes that made me question my taste in men, really. She shook her head. I was this close to uninviting him to my wedding. <laughs> Our wedding, you mean? I laughed. Yeah, didn't I say that? The corner of her lips tugged up with mischief. Anyway, think we still have about an hour or so until lunch break. Are you ready? A look passed between us. For my death, always. Come on, drama queen, Isabel said, linking our arms and pulling me in the direction of the group. Time to go back. Gabby sent me to fetch you. There's a schedule, you know. I pouted. Oh, stop that. It'll be fun. It hasn't been and it won't be, I said, dragging my feet, but following her because what choice did I have? Gabby has turned into this cute but terrifying sports mogul and everyone is scared of her. Issa snorted. It's not that bad. Plus, we might still win. We are only three points behind those stupid suckers. Did you just call your fiancé a stupid sucker? Fine. We are only three points behind Team Groom. Better? Better, but... I shot her a humorless glance over my shoulder. They are still going to smash us like cockroaches. Shaking my head, I thought of how unathletic Team Bride was compared to our male counterpart. The points we had collected were lame pity points Gabby had given us to keep the team motivated. Well, everybody else on the team but me. Motivation had left me long ago. I was ready to call it a day and go stuff my mouth with food. My jet-lagged body had flipped the hungry switch even before we started running around with his nonsense. You can blame yourself for that, my sister's index finger added to her accusation. You brought Clark Kent's doppelganger to the party? He does look like him, doesn't he? Isabel nodded. And by the way, she paused, and before I could dodge it or be prepared for it, she tugged at my ponytail a little too hard. Hey! I grabbed my hair and moved out of the trajectory of other possible attacks. What the hell was that for, Bridezilla? Don't be a baby. You deserved it. How dare you keep that? Isabel pointed at Aaron, making me smack her hand down. Hidden from me. Isabel, I warned. She went on, ignoring me and waving her index finger in my fake boyfriend's direction. When my sister starts dating someone, I expect a full report. Vivid descriptions, photos, videos, oil paintings, I don't care. Even those dick pics I mentioned, which you never sent. Isabel, I lowered my voice. Shut up, he will hear you. We were only a few feet away from the group. She cocked an eyebrow and then tilted her head slowly. Damn it. He's dating you. What's the big deal with him hearing you talk about it with your sister? You've seen his penis. We are allowed to discuss it. She rolled her eyes. Actually, I think we are expected to do that. I'm sure he's talked to his friends about your boobies. 
I cursed under my breath. She stared at me, inspecting my reaction. I looked nervously in Aaron's direction. Our gazes met. Those blue eyes, which always seemed to find me, held mine for a long moment. Jesus, did he hear that? Shaking my head very lightly, I returned my gaze back to my sister. You know, she said, shrugging her shoulders, you only mentioned him a couple of times, so I was convinced it wasn't that serious. But I'm not so sure of that anymore. What do you mean? My heart sped as I feared what she might say. We had barely had any time to act all snuggly and lovey-dovey or however a boyfriend and girlfriend were supposed to behave. The wedding cup shenanigans had consumed all of our time and energy. Well, for one, he's here, Isabel pointed out. You bringing him home to meet Mama and Papa and basically the entire town tells me that he's not just anyone. There must be something special about him. You wouldn't bring someone you are casually seeing or dating, not even if they looked like he does. You don't trust people easily anymore. Stumbling over my own thoughts, I came to a stop. Her words had smacked me right in the face, emptying me for anything I could say. Imposter. The accusation took shape in my head. How could it not when I was a big, fat liar? Isabel took my silence as a sign to keep talking. Then there's the way his eyes have been on you the whole time we've been here. Whoa, what? It's only been what, a couple of hours? And he's still absorbed by you, watching and following every single move you make, as if you were pooping rainbows and leaving behind a trail of glitter. It would be disgusting if I wasn't in love myself, she patted my hand. And trust me, sis, you all red and blotchy, not that cute. My head whirled in Aaron's direction again. He was chugging water from a bottle, not looking half as physically exerted as everybody else, even after carrying Team Groom on his back along with Gonzalo. As I got lost in the way his arm stretched and his throat worked down the water, I wondered if my sister had imagined all that or if Aaron's acting was that amazing. Maybe I hadn't given him enough credit. Anyway, she added as we finally reached the group, you'll have to catch me up on this and tell me all the dirty details. Don't think that just because I haven't drilled you for them, I don't want them. Isabel warned me with a look that told me she'd bug me until I broke under the pressure. But until then, just keep doing whatever you're doing, she winked. Because hermanita, he has it bad. A snort involuntarily escaped my lips. Yeah, sure. Isabel quirked an eyebrow. Oh, shit. Of course he has it bad, Isa. I waved my hand. He's my boyfriend. I tried to assure her, not sounding anywhere close to convincing. So I quickened my pace and left my big sister behind before I led her to uncover the whole farce. Thankfully, as soon as I reached the group, Gabby was already wielding her printed schedule and trying to gather everyone closer in a perfect circle. Rolling my eyes at that, I watched my cousin and wedding cup mastermind start shouting out orders in Spanish while we all tried to ignore how Gonzalo snagged my sister from behind and engulfed her in an embrace that included more than a fair share of inappropriate groping and fondling. Yikes, I muttered under my breath. That's my sister. But at the same time, something squeezed in my chest. I realized that a small part of me observed the public display of affection with something that felt a lot like longing. And that compressing sensation bothered me. It awoke a very particular set of questions I had no answers to all of them revolving around the same thing. Would I ever find what Gonzalo and Isabel had? Would I ever allow myself to? Would I ever be so head over heels, crazy in love that everything else would fade to black noise? My gaze searched for Aaron, not because I wanted him to emulate Gonzalo, but because maybe everyone else expected him to. Not spotting him anywhere in a less than perfect circle of people around Gabby, I grew a little concerned as she shot more and more instructions to the group. His head would roll if he didn't get here ASAP. A light touch on my arm grabbed my attention. Turning my head, I was welcomed by a pair of blue eyes that regarded me with something strange. Here you are, I whispered loudly, while Gabby kept going at it in the background. I was scared for your well-being. Where did you go? I've been right here the whole time. That strange quality was still there, but I brushed it away. 
I had no time to inspect whatever I'd thought I saw in Aaron's eyes. Instead, I focused on how good he looked in his nylon shorts and short-sleeved Henley. Are you having fun? He offered me a bottle of water, pushing it gently in my direction. Oh, thank you. I reached for it with both hands, managing to brush my palms along his fingers somehow. Sparks traveled all the way up my arm, making me retrieve my hands quickly and hold the bottle to my chest. That was sweet, very boyfriend-like of you. I looked up at him, finding him frowning. I didn't give him the chance to complain. And not too much fun, to be completely honest, I admitted with a small pout. I had been serious when I told my sister that I was ready to call it a day. Thank God we're about to be done here. Otherwise, I'd have to fake breaking a leg or a wrist. I lowered my voice. Or knocking off Gabby with something. I hope we don't get to that point. The right side of his mouth tipped up. What's left then? Well, Gabby saved the best for last, I sighed. Now comes the real competition. I gestured with my hands, as if I were unveiling a huge surprise. The star of the wedding cup, the soccer match. Aaron hummed, lost in thought for a short moment. I don't think I've ever played soccer. I perked up. Never ever? I watched his head nod. A chance to win. Like, not even once? Not even once, he answered. His mouth opened and then clamped down when Gabby hushed us in the distance. Jesus, that woman needed to cool down. We straightened and faced away from each other. Aaron lowered his voice, speaking from the side of his mouth. You think that will be a problem? She seems a little strict. Oh, I wouldn't worry about her. I waved my hand, keeping my eyes up front. You, on the other hand, I'd worry about getting the hang of it in time. Out of the corner of my eye, I sensed Aaron glancing over at me quickly. And what happens if I don't? My smile turned lopsided. Then, Team Groom will lose, miserably. I didn't think that would happen, but Aaron had admitted to something he wasn't amazing at. And that was new. I stole a quick glance in his direction. He had tilted his head and crossed his arms over his chest. If you end up sucking at soccer and messing up, everybody will blame you. But it's okay. You can't be good at everything. He didn't move or say anything. And you couldn't be scared of dancing with the rest of the guys, right? Another quick look allowed me to see the word challenge written all over his face. I snickered. Oh, maybe you are. I didn't peg you for a chicken, but it kind of looks good on you. Maybe I should call you pollito instead of osito. His head turned very slowly. My gaze remained on him as I helplessly forgot about Gabby. Did you just call me a chicken? He said, the blue in his eyes flaring. In two different languages? Oh, you bet I did. I would be scared too. Our team is strong. It wasn't. And just so you know, I make for a wonderful central defender. I didn't. But maybe you don't know what that means. It's okay. Just know that some used to call me Ruthless Lena. Not exactly true either. Of all sports involving balls, Soccer was probably the one I sucked at the least. Although, if I had ever been called ruthless, it wasn't because I excelled at playing the game, but because I ruthlessly ate the floor. Central defender, huh? I nodded. He didn't need to know the truth. Aaron dipped his head, his voice dropping too. Are you trying to impress me with sports lingo, Catalina? The way he had said my name was new. I couldn't explain how, but it had been different from any other time he had voiced those four syllables, and it sent shivers dancing down my arms. It's sexy, but don't ever feel like you need to impress me. I already am. My lips parted. I thought my breath had hitched too. Sexy. Had he really said that out loud? My eyes searched his face for any trace of sarcasm or evidence that it had been a joke, but before I could find anything, a commotion broke behind us. Turning, I discovered the newcomer responsible for it. The moment I got a glimpse of the head of dark blonde hair I knew or had known so well, a heavy weight dropped to the pit of my stomach. My ex was here, Daniel, or at least an older version of the man I remembered. Back when we had dated, he could have been mistaken for a guy my age, but that had changed. In the time since we'd last seen each other, 
The way he looked had caught up with his years, and he had aged well. Time had treated him kindly. The Daniel who was striding in my direction was an attractive 40-year-old, a man who moved with the confidence that only someone who stood in front of a class filled with college students every day would have. Although he always had that confidence, hadn't he? Wasn't that exactly what had led to crush on my professor in the first place? It was during that very first lecture I attended. He walked in, cleared his throat, and flashed that dimple. It didn't take more than that. I had been a goner. A lame, pathetic goner, crushing on her physics professor. Or so I had thought. But then, by some magical turn of events, he had reciprocated my attention. He did more than that. And I had believed we had something real, something lasting, just as Gonzalo and Isabel did. And then everything had blown up in my face. Not our faces, no. Daniel had been spared the nightmare. Is that Daniel? Aaron's low, hushed question returned me back to the present. I turned to him briefly, not finding my words, so I just nodded. My attention jumped back to where my ex was, and as I watched how he hugged and clapped my brother's back, I felt Aaron stepping closer to me. I didn't move. I was rooted to the floor. Aaron closed some more of the distance between us, positioning himself to my side, right behind me. And I was shocked at the warmth that his body radiated on my back and how his proximity quashed some of my uneasiness. It reassured me. He did. And I didn't understand how or why, but I didn't have the time to pick that apart. Not with Daniel and everybody else there. So I just held on to it. I stood there and watched how the best man started the round of greeting everyone with kisses and hugs. Around the group he went, and I swore there was something suspended in the air as he did so. As if every single person around me was holding their breath until the moment Daniel reached me. Hating how the atmosphere seemed to thicken with every pair of eyes that turned to me, I reminded myself that I had already been expecting that kind of reaction. Everybody knew what had happened between Daniel and me, how ugly it got, and how hard it was for me. And most of them had pitied me back then. I knew most still did in this moment, and some always would. Daniel took one last step toward me, causing a churning sensation to twist my stomach in knots. Lena. It had been ages since I had heard my name from Daniel's mouth. It brought everything right back. The good moments we had shared, and there had been really amazing moments. All that joy that came hand in hand with a first love you foolishly thought was going to last forever. But also all the pain at having that turned into an ocean of hurt. Because sure, Daniel had been the one to break my heart, but the real damage had been done by everybody else. By everyone who had learned of our relationship and tarnished it with stupid and poisonous rumors that, no, not the time to think of that. Daniel placed a hand on my upper arm and planted a kiss on my cheek. If it hadn't been for Aaron's warm palm, which had somehow landed on the small of my back, I would have stumbled backwards. That's how off guard that friendly kiss had caught me. My gaze roamed around the group, confirming that every person present had their eyeballs turned to us. Daniel seemed oblivious to all the gawking, smiling at me like we were old friends being reunited after years of not seeing each other, which was the exact opposite of how I felt. He looked me up and down. Dios Lina, cuánto tiempo. Mírate. Estás. Daniel, I cut him off. This is Aaron. I blurted out, pulling away from him and nestling myself a step further into my fake boyfriend and personal human-sized shield. Daniel's furrowed eyebrows signaled his confusion, probably because I had switched to English more than because I was introducing him to someone I was supposedly dating. Hi, I'm her boyfriend, Aaron said politely, stretching his hand in front of him. Su novio, he clarified in Spanish for Daniel's sake which was completely unnecessary and kind of cocky, and in some parallel reality, it would have pulled a snicker out of me. But my lips remained pressed into a tense line. It's nice to meet you, Danielle. My ex and sister's fiancé's brother stared at Aaron for a brief moment, and then broke into a wary but amiable smile. Sí, claro. Nice to meet you, Aaron. Danielle finally took Aaron's hand and shook it. I'm an old friend of Lena's. Something pulled tight in my stomach at Daniel's definition of what we had once been. As soon as both men unclasped their hands, 
Daniel returned his attention to me, and Aaron's palm returned to my back. How have you been, Lena? You look so different. Daniel's smile widened. Different but good. You look amazing, actually. His eyes kept assessing me, as if he couldn't believe that it was me. And I wasn't really sure how I felt about that, so I forced myself to smile in return. Thanks, Daniel. I have been fine, busy with work and life. That's right, my ex nodded his head. You are living the life in New York City. I always knew you had the potential to do great things, to get very far in your career. He had been my professor for a whole year before we started properly dating. And during that time, I had been a highly motivated student, an overachiever. Things had changed after that. And you did. Thanks, I muttered, my mind filing away all kinds of complaints. It's not that big of a deal. Aaron cleared his throat lightly. It is, he said softly, so much so that I thought he had said it just for me. Then he kept going. Lena leads a considerably large team of people in one of the most successful engineering consulting companies in New York. That is, by all standards, a big deal. Wow, Daniel smiled tightly. That's amazing, Lena, it is. His lips turned somewhat more relaxed. Congratulations. I muttered my thanks, still feeling flushed over Aaron's words. There was a long and awkward moment of silence, and then Daniel's eyes flashed quickly between Aaron and me. So this is him, huh? The American boyfriend. My head reared back, shocked by Daniel's word choice. With my shoulders tensing, my mouth opened with the intention of asking what that had been. But I felt Aaron's hand trailing up my back, stopping at the nook between my shoulder and my neck. His thumb brushed the skin there very gently. That touch, that thumb caressing the side of my neck, almost made me forget about who was in front of me and what he had said or if he had talked at all. His fingers swiped right and left one more time, making a shiver run down my spine. Closing my eyes briefly, I pulled myself back into the conversation and decided to ignore Danielle's last comment. Congratulations on the engagement. I made my lips tug upwards. I'm very happy for you, Danielle. Danielle's eyes, which had been somewhere where Aaron's palm was, met mine. He nodded and flashed that dimple I had been so familiar with in the past. Thank you, Lena. I'm extremely grateful she said yes. It's not that easy to deal with me sometimes. I get lost in my head a lot when I'm working, he said, slipping his hands in his pockets. Well, <laughs> no need to explain that to you. You know that already. Yes, I did. Everybody here knew I did, too. He hadn't needed to point that out, not after downgrading our past to old friends. My fake boyfriend's palm spread and shifted down my shoulder, his fingers trailing down my arm and reaching my hand. It was so distracting the way he touched me, and yet he managed to keep me grounded all at once. Every time my head had threatened to roam away, Aaron had pulled me right back before my feet could lift off the floor. Those gentle brushes against my skin had that power, I realized. And judging by the way my voice came out when I spoke next, breathy, weak, they also came at a price. Well, I wish you two the best. And despite myself, I meant that. Will she be joining us today? Aaron's fingers wrapped around mine, awakening in me something that urged me to turn around to look at him. I suppressed it, keeping my gaze on Daniel. Unfortunately, Marta won't be able to make it. A last minute work thing. She's also a professor and she was called to a conference to cover for a colleague. Daniel shrugged his shoulders, and I made a note to talk to my sister later. I was under the impression the bride would know if someone had canceled. It's all good, though. Daniel's eyes jumped to Aaron's hand one more time, his expression distracting. Attending a wedding alone is not all that dramatic. Plus, I wouldn't want to make it about me. My ex pinned me with a look. And was that accusation that I saw in his eyes? I, I trilled off, second-guessing myself. My cheeks burned, and I couldn't do much else but gape. Then why waste more time talking about it? Aaron managed to flatten his voice, about enough to sound bored. But I knew better. I'm excited to see what comes next. He surprised me by saying. Then his fingers squeezed mine. Lena was telling me that Gabby saved the best for last. Right, baby? He leaned and brushed his lips over my shoulder very softly. 
impossibly light, but it made my body come alive. Right, I breathed out, urging the shock out of my expression. God, I could still feel the imprint of his lips on my shoulder, the touch somehow spreading out across my skin. Oh, and what's that? Daniel asked, or at least I guessed he had because my mind was somewhere else. Aaron kissed me on my shoulder. The temperature of my whole body had probably risen a couple or ten degrees. It's good. This is what couples do. They kiss each other on multiple body parts, like shoulders. The soccer match will be starting in a few minutes, I think. I heard Aaron explain. Lena has promised me to show me all her moves. I won't lie, I'm equal parts intrigued and terrified. Trying to look the part, I leaned my head on Aaron's chest, and I almost slipped to the floor when I felt him brush another kiss on my hair. Yeah, I said, my breath getting stuck somewhere in my throat. Ruthless Lena is about to make an appearance. Aaron chuckled, and I felt his chest vibrating under my temple. The hand that wasn't holding mine came to rest on my hip, sending electrical shocks through all nerve endings in my body. Breathe, Lena. He's supposed to act like this. I forced myself to remain still when in reality, I wanted to do everything else but that. Like forgetting about Daniel and asking Aaron what in the world he was doing. Why he had kissed my shoulder or the top of my head. Could he please do that again just so I could check if my reaction had been a one-time occurrence or if that was the way my body reacted to his touch? Daniel's mouth opened and closed as he was probably feeling uncomfortable at our display of affection. Of fake affection, I reminded myself. My ex and former professor looked up, some place where Aaron's head towered over mine. Something flashed across his face too quickly for me to grasp its meaning. Then he nodded and directed a small smile at him. Not really understanding what had just gone down before the two men, I finally allowed myself to look up at Aaron. And nothing just one of his blank expressions in place. Someone called Daniel's name in the distance. My head fell just in time to watch my ex walk away, all the way to where Gonzalo was standing. He took his place beside his brother. Still feeling the weird tension in the air, I drew a shallow breath. Ugh, that had been really awkward. I felt like I wanted to shake myself so I could get rid of the yucky sensation that stuck to my skin but that would have rid me of all the tingles I was still feeling, too. That would also mean that I had to disentangle myself from Aaron's arm and chest and body, and I didn't know if I wanted to do that. You do, dumbass. This is not real. And I needed to remember that before I did something really stupid. If the chaos around me was anything to go by, I'd say we had a little situation on our hands. No me lo puedo creer, my cousin cried in the middle of a less than perfect circle of people, throwing her arms in the air like the world was coming to an end. No podemos jugar así. Se cancela todo. Esto es un desastre. No, 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 no. She grabbed a few of the t-shirts from the open box at her feet and hurled them at the floor. Whoa. Esos malnacidos. Cálmate, prima, Isabel interrupted, telling her to calm down. ¿Qué importa? Son solo unas camisetas. Our cousin gasped and then hissed something really nasty at my sister, who barked right back at her. Aaron leaned to his side and then lowered his voice. What's going on? Should we run? I stifled a snicker. I didn't want to anger Gabby anymore. She was either about to cry or turn full-on She-Hulk, and no matter what, we'd have to deal with the fallout. There's been a mix-up with the t-shirts for the soccer match, I sighed. Apparently, they sent the ones for the team groom in the smallest size instead of the largest. Can't we play with what we're wearing? The poor soul that was my fake boyfriend asked. Gabby's head turned toward us. ¿Qué ha dicho? She screeched. Nada. I held my hands in the air. Then I turned to Aaron. Keep your voice down. Didn't you see how she'd gotten when my cousin Matias asked why she hadn't thought of handing out the shirts earlier today? Or when Adrian said it would have been smart to double-check the sizes before today? Aaron's lips pursed. Exactly. Good thing my sister intercepted her before she got to them. They're tough guys, but it would have been a carnage either way. I shook my head. You are tough too, but I need you in one piece, okay? I stopped myself, realizing what I had said. We are expected to dance at the wedding. I'm not going anywhere. 
Aaron said from my side. I can survive your cousin. I could put us both into safety, too. Just say the word. I averted my eyes and glanced in Gabby's direction. A red-faced Isabel was trying to jerk the box out of Gabby's grip, and my cousin was tugging at it quite violently if I had to pick a word. My sister yelped, and then she stepped back and brought both hands to her head. No, 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 no. She walked to the center of the circle, waving her hands in the air. We will play the soccer match. That's it, she announced, and then turned to Gabby. I am the bride, and you guys are obligated to do as I say. I snorted at that, which earned me an extremely threatening glance from my sister. I stiffened. Jesus, this wedding would be the end of all of us. My sister turned to our cousin. Gabby, no es el fin del mundo. It's not the end of the world, she told our cousin. You, she turned to me again, for my next wedding we are sipping margaritas. I bit back a laugh, but yep, I wholeheartedly agreed. All right, it's summer, the sun is shining, and I just had the best idea. She paused dramatically, looking around the circle of people. Team groom, you will play. Shirtless. Her arms rose in the air. Nobody spoke. Come on, gentlemen, Isabel's tone hardened. It's always the ladies undressing and showing some skin. This time, it's up to you to show off those wedding bodies. More silence. Isabel glanced at her groom, who, just like everybody else, was still chewing on her suggestion. She widened her eyes and swirled her fingers in the air, instructing Gonzalo to snap out of it. Do something. My future brother-in-law perked up. Ah! The groom shed his shirt, revealing his chest in all his dark-haired glory. He threw up his arms. Well said, cariño, he roared. Come on, gentlemen, shirt's off. My sister rewarded her fiancé with a holler and some enthusiastic clapping. Daniel, as the best man, took off his shirt next, almost reluctantly from the way he shook his head. My gaze involuntarily took him in. It wasn't a shock, seeing how despite not being anywhere close to being buff, which he had never been, he was still in really good shape. And yet, I felt nothing not stirring anywhere in my body. The group's amusement grew as more of Team Groom's members followed Gonzalo's and Daniel's lead. Well, nobody present was really complaining, probably fearing my sister's reaction, who, at this point, was cheering at every newfound shirtless man. Even Gabby's frustration at losing her grip of the group's control decreased as the atmosphere turned lighter. That was until Daniel opened his mouth and brought down the fun atmosphere. What about you, American boy? Daniel pointed at the still fully clothed man standing beside me. Are you sitting this one out? American boy? My eyes widened. He had just called my boyfriend fake boyfriend, I corrected myself. Had my ex just called my fake boyfriend a boy? Sure, Daniel was about eight or nine years older than Aaron, but calling him a boy? My head swiveled in Aaron's direction just in time to see his reaction. His jaw relaxed, the start of a smile playing on his lips. Then he didn't hesitate. Calmly, scarily so, my fake boyfriend leveled Daniel with a look that would make anybody run for the hills. The look that had earned him his reputation back at work. It was one he brandished as a warning sign, and it meant trouble, serious business. Holding my breath, I watched Aaron's fingers reach for the hem of his shirt. Oh, my God, he's gonna do it. My fake boyfriend and future boss is undressing before my eyes. He pulled it up, and with one swift motion, worthy of one of those perfume ads where everything except the compelling and otherworldly model in the frame blurred into the background, Aaron peeled his shirt off. I blinked. Madre de Dios. Aaron was, he was, fuck. He was gorgeous. No, he was more than just that. Aaron was a freaking sight to behold. And his unbelievable, out-of-this-world, ad-worthy upper body was so flawless that it made me want to weep. I was a shallow, shallow woman, but I didn't care. As my gaze gobbled Aaron in all his shirtlessness, I felt the air being punched out of my lungs. I thought I had always been impressed, almost fascinated, if I was being completely honest, by his height and size. But if there was something more impressive, more fascinating than that, 
It was his height and size, decked with hard muscles of all sizes and types. Jesus Christ, were his abs sculpted in stone? My stupid, hungry eyes traveled from his broad shoulders to his chiseled chest and then kept going down, taking in slabs of abs that my imagination would never have been able to fabricate in such perfection. And how his strong arms looked bare, corded with powerful muscles. I would never have been able to imagine that either. Frankly, I almost wanted to poke the man to check if it was all real. Those boring dress shirts did him no justice. That casual outfit he had worn to the flight hadn't either. Not even the tux he had worn to the fundraiser did his body any justice. He was too beautiful. Yeah, I was ogling at that point, and I didn't really give a damn, not this time. This was a historical moment. I had a flawless, shirtless Aaron standing in front of me, probably for the first and only time ever, and I wanted to commit this image to memory. Even if it haunted me for the rest of my life, I'd live with it. Loud cheering and clapping broke through the vacuum I had been sucked in. Blinking, I realized Aaron's eyes were on me. Our gazes met. There was something intent and hungry behind the deep ocean blue, something barely controlled. That, or I was seeing my own emotions reflected and looking back at me. Cheeks flushed, I was completely and utterly unprepared for what the half-naked man in front of me did next. Aaron's eyes twinkled under the Spanish sun. One corner of his lips curled, gifting me with a full-fledged smirk. And then he winked. A single, quick, playful wink. That was all it took for my insides to melt into a puddle, brain, chest, lower belly, and everything in between liquefied and gathered at my feet. Nope, I hadn't been unprepared for that. I had been completely defenseless. Aaron placed his hands on his hips, looking somewhat satisfied, and returned his gaze ahead to where Team Groom was gathering to start the soccer match, as if he hadn't just made parts of my body dissolve into a goo I didn't know what to do with. That flawless, shirtless, blue-eyed bastard throwing me off balance like that. I had been so caught up in all that that I hadn't noticed Daniel's apprehensive gaze. It bounced a couple of times between Aaron and me before finally settling on the man he thought I was dating. Not for long, though. A moment after that, Daniel turned, clapped Gonzalo's back, and started toward the improvised soccer game. Before joining the rest of the guys, Aaron stepped close to me, stopping only when the point of our sneakers touched. He leaned in, his mouth dangerously close to my ear, as if he were about to tell me a secret just meant for me. My throat bobbed. What do you think? He asked, his words tickling the shell of my ear. You are okay? I mumbled like an idiot. I heard his chuckle. Thank you, I think. But I wasn't asking about that. Oh. I'll take the compliment, though, for now. What? What did you mean, then? I think that so far we're doing a good job. What do you think? Oh, so he meant that. The charade, of course. Yes, that made more sense. I nodded my head. We make a good team, Catalina. And there it was, my name again, voiced in that way that was all new. I cleared my throat, trying to ignore the fact that my face was about a palm from his flawless and bare pectoral. We do, I murmured. Aaron lowered his voice. I had no idea we would walk into that. He cocked his head. Caught me off guard, but it's okay. I'm starting to understand. Confusion swirled me. There was nothing to understand. Granted, there was a part I hadn't told Aaron, which wasn't the smartest way to go about it, but that remained in the past. It didn't affect our goal here. Just keep doing what you're doing, I told him, swallowing the lump stuck in my throat. Focus on pretending you're crazy about me, all right? I heard him, hmm. It was a low and short-lived sound, but it was enough to make me step back so I could look at his face. His eyes held that determined edge I knew so well. Trust me, I am focusing only on that. Before I could say anything else, Aaron started jogging back. And remember, he called from a distance, all is fair in love and war, bollito. Almost everybody around turned their eyes on me. My gaze met my sister's, and she was grinning so widely that I was scared her mouth would inevitably be hurting on her wedding day. 
Reluctantly, I smiled back at the onlookers, pretending I was cool and chill and not trying to gather my wits. Oh, he's so silly, I told them. No need to remind me, cosita mia, I called back to Aaron. But Aaron had already shot off, running after the rest of his team, leaving me standing there, watching how all the polished muscles on his back danced with each stride he took, and wondering what the hell that was supposed to mean. My eyes narrowed. All is fair in love and war. It was in a way, I guessed. What I had trouble making sense of was, how did that apply when love was fake, and adversaries were left with no choice but to join forces? Chapter 17 Against all odds, we were close to the end of the soccer match, and both teams were tied. One would think that having to play against a group of shirtless dudes was disconcerting, but I was related to a big chunk of them. I had already seen everything there was to see about one of them, Daniel, and that of the two remaining men, one was about to marry my sister, so that reduced my distractions considerably. My main and only source being just one one that I usually did a pretty good job of ignoring when we were in our real-world roles. Contrary to the roles we were currently playing, where I, as the girlfriend, was allowed to gawk, and where Aaron, as the boyfriend, was apparently allowed to look like a man shooting a Sports Illustrated cover. Because that was exactly how a sweaty, shirtless Aaron looked, running across the green field after the ball. And that was exactly where my two very shallow and very stupid eyes had been all the time following him around like two dumb bugs irremediably drawn by an irresistible light. And just like the bug, my eyes had no self-preservation instinct. By the end of the day, the images would be burned into my retinas, and there would be no way I'd ever be able to get rid of them. Hell, I already felt a little like a charred insect. Sweat was running down my back, and my skin was on fire from being under the sun. On top of that, my hunger had turned into starvation. And no matter how hard I tried to stay focused on the game, my attention always shifted to Aaron's long legs, striding from one point to the next, to how the muscles across his torso strained and relaxed as he moved, to the little drops traveling down his chest, across those glorious pecs, to how my blood seemed to simmer and swirl every time our gazes met. So yeah, I felt icky and bothered and hot in no particular order. And yet, somehow, Team Bride had still scored as many goals as the guys. Baffling, really, but what did I know? I had been too busy ogling my flawless, glistening fake boyfriend. Gonzalo's voice boomed across the field, all the way to where I was. Vamos! They cannot win this! He accompanied each of his words with an aggressive clap. Five minutes! We've got five minutes, guys! We need to win this shit! As the men regrouped on their side of the field, I noticed how Daniel approached Gonzalo and Aaron, gesturing his hands and pointing at our goal. Madre mia, Isabel said from her position as our goalie, a few steps behind me. I think they're making strategic changes. This doesn't look good, hermanita. As I took in the men's motions and consequent change in positions, my sister's suspicions were confirmed. We are screwed, Isa, I assessed without turning to her. They're switching Aaron to the front. They're using him as a striker. Mierda. Clark Kent is going to be the one attacking? My sister came to my side and narrowed her eyes in the direction of our opponents. Quick, take off your shirt too. That will distract him. I scoffed. What? No. But Lena, I'm not taking my shirt off. What the hell are you talking about? But your boobies will distract your boyfriend. They won't trust me. Realizing what I'd said was not exactly girlfriend-like, I explained, he's already seen all there is to see, so forget it. Then dance or wiggle, do whatever rocks his boat. I crossed my arms over my chest. No. Fine, then we're going down. Not without a fight, I assured her, and then brought my hands to my mouth and proceeded to rally the rest of the team. Vamos, chicas, todavía podemos ganar. My words of encouragement were naive. There was no way we could still win the match, not with Aaron striking, and certainly not if I flashed him, like Isabel had suggested. Turning back to my sister, I pointed a finger at her. Remember this moment when the losers, which no doubt will be us, are dancing for everyone tonight. 
Next time, if you want to bet and jeopardize my rep, pick quiz night, not stupid soccer. Now let's try to finish this with as much dignity as we can. As I faced the other team, all the guys clicked into action. My gaze focused on the ball, passing from one player to the next, all of them, leaving every team bride member helplessly behind. Soon enough, I was witnessing how the ball landed at Aaron's feet, who, for his hulking size, moved with incredible agility and skill. For someone who had never played soccer before, he had gotten the hang of it pretty damn fast. Aaron's looming figure approached me swiftly, eating away the distance, way too quickly for my brain to order my limbs to kick into action. Mierda. In an attempt to stop him in any way I could think that didn't involve getting naked, I launched myself in his direction with the purpose of intercepting the ball, or him. Anything would do. Unfortunately, that intent landed nowhere near where I'd expected. Just when I was about to reach him, my foot caught in a little bump on the grass, causing me to trip and be catapulted forward. So much for ending this with dignity. As I braced myself for a painful landing, my eyelids shut involuntarily. I was swallowed by darkness, counting the seconds and milliseconds left for the upcoming crush against the grass. Three, two, one. Nothing. Impact never ensued. One moment I had been flying, eyes closed, and about to face plant on the floor, and the next, I was somehow suspended in time. No, I was suspended in the air. Not understanding how, I blinked my eyes open, just as a hump was punched out of my lips. My midsection landed against something hard. Then I was greeted by the sight of glistening smooth skin, a flawless back. My gaze trailed down, taking in a tight backside and sports shorts, followed by a pair of muscled calves. Understanding sank in as I realized I was hanging off someone, particularly off someone's shoulder, Aaron's shoulder to be 100% exact. What in the... Everybody seemed to be on board, if the clapping and cheering around us were any indication. Ignoring the little commotion behind us, Aaron rearranged me on his broad shoulder, gripping my waist gently but firmly. A complaint rose and died in my throat as he shot off, running. Aaron, I screeched with urgency. He was running with me, hanging off him like a goddamn human-sized potato sack. With every stride, the symmetric and strained strings of muscles on his back moved. His backside, too, distracting me. Damn it, Lena, no, focus. Aaron, I repeated, being ignored again. What are you doing? My speech was interrupted with each bounce of his body, with each stump of his long legs guiding the ball in my sister's direction. Aaron Blackford, he chuckled. Then he patted the back of my thigh. I couldn't let my girlfriend fall to the floor now, could I? The bastard said calmly, not sounding one bit out of breath. Aaron, I howled, I swear to Lucifer. He bounced a little extra hard, cutting my words. His hold on my waist tightened sending a wave of awareness down my legs. His other palm held the back of my thigh still, his fingers spread across my skin. God, everything I felt under me was hard and warm. Damn it. I couldn't believe it. But I was mad and, 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 shit. I was a little turned on by the display of strength. The last thought had barely registered when Aaron's grip on my waist shifted, securing me with his whole arm, I could feel his biceps against my side. My blood swirled, and it had nothing to do with being upside down. Brace yourself, girlfriend. I'm going to win this thing and put some food in you before you eat my head off. There's no stopping that from happening, boyfriend. Wishing I could know how close Aaron was from delivering the killing goal, I twisted my body upward as much as I could. Behind us, phones were out, recording the whole damn thing. Oh, Lord. Please don't let this end up on TikTok. One last bounce, and chaos erupted as Aaron's strides came to a stop. Put me down! I punctuated my words by attacking his back with my weak fists. Judging by his lack of reaction, I doubted he was even feeling it. Hey, he turned around, giving me a view of my sister, who was still under the goal. She might have just been scored against, but she was smiling. Aaron continued. I knew you were bossy, but I didn't know you were this violent. You haven't seen anything, I gritted through clenched teeth, 
while he remained casually standing there, unaffected by the weight of the woman he had tossed over his shoulder. His chest shook under my hips and thighs. Was he laughing? The nerve of him. The situation called for extreme measures. So with all the skill I could gather, I stretched down until my hand reached his backside and pinched his butt. Yep, I, Lina Martin, had just pinched Aaron Blackford's butt. And I regretted it immediately. One, because it was Aaron's butt cheek I had pinched. And how could I ever come back from doing something like that when I had to see his face at work every working day of every week and he'd soon become my boss? And two, because it had been so smooth and firm that I wanted to do it a second time just to be sure that an ass that hard was real. I wanted to double check if a butt could really have that many muscles. And that, together with reason one, made me question my sanity. As that spun in my head, I realized that Aaron had noticed my unfriendly pinch. I knew because he had instantly frozen. My fake boyfriend's body, which was still underneath my hips, stomach, and legs, had gone very, very still from the moment my fingers came into contact with his ass. Tempted to pinch him again, to check if he was breathing, or if I had shocked him as much as I had myself, I waited. With astonishing care, his hands moved to my waist. Aaron lifted me from his shoulder, positioning my front against his chest, still holding me so my feet wouldn't touch the grass. Our heads were at the same level, our gazes irremediably meeting. His face was this unreadable blank mask again, as if I had pinched all emotion out of it. I realized I preferred playful Aaron to the one who hid whatever he was feeling. But that moved into the background as I recounted the non-existent space between our bodies from our chests down. I was feeling a little lightheaded, so my arms braced themselves on Aaron's shoulders, our eyes never breaking contact. I didn't think either of us blinked either. Aaron rearranged my body in his arms, and with a change of position, I could feel the swaying of his chest against mine. I could feel the sweat on his skin under my hands and arms, too. But above all, I was enraptured by those blue eyes that gleamed like diamonds under the punishing sunlight. My breath got stuck in my throat, not going anywhere. Just like I was. Never in a hundred years would I have imagined myself in this position. Being held by a shirtless Aaron and not wanting to run as far and fast away as I could. But shockingly, I wanted to do the exact opposite. I wanted to take my time inspecting every inch of sweaty, bare skin I could see. I wanted to stay right where I was, perhaps maybe even let him carry me everywhere for the rest of the day. And that admission scared me. No, it terrified me. Or it should have, because in that precise moment, I couldn't find it in me to care for anything besides the wild beating of my heart thumping directly against Aaron's skin. When Aaron finally spoke, his voice had a breathless texture. You pinched my ass, Catalina. I had, and I was sorry, sort of, which didn't excuse the shameless, outright joyful grin that broke out on my face. I barely recognized myself in that moment, barely understood the need to smile that big and make him pay me back with one of his own. Perhaps a laugh, too. I plead the fifth, I managed to say through my ridiculously silly smile still held in his arms. Plus, if by any chance someone might have pinched your butt, you might have totally deserved it. Oh, yeah? The corner of his lips twitched. Almost there. Yep, 100% well-deserved. Even if I'd saved that hypothetical person from a boisterous fall? Aaron's eyes wrinkled with the smile I was looking for, his lips remaining mostly flat. Still. Boisterous, I was merely going to brush the floor, very delicately, mind you. You are a ridiculous, impossible woman, you know that? I knew, and I was ready to admit it. But then Aaron went ahead and gave me that grin I had been craving. His lips split and his mouth gave way to a handsome smile that changed his face completely. One that I had seen only once before and that made my heart go all crazy in my chest. My eyes probably twinkled, too. He was right. I was ridiculous. This whole thing was so very ridiculous. Hey, guys, Danielle's voice came from somewhere nearby, tearing through the moment and causing the little happy cloud I had been in to vanish. 
Food is on the table, and we're all about to start. Come on. As I heard what I assumed were Daniel's footsteps walking away, I knew my grin had extinguished. Had that moment we had shared been all for Daniel and everybody else's sake? Probably. No, most certainly. That was what couples did. Playful touches, wide smiles, heated glances. And that made me feel a little dumb, made his smile worth a little less, and made mine a very foolish one. I guessed it was a good thing that Aaron's handsome grin had disappeared too, although even with Daniel there, his gaze had never left mine. And it didn't either when his arms shifted the hold on my waist and slid me down his body. Or so I told myself, because as I went down, my eyelids must have fluttered, making it hard for me to see much as I was pressed against each hard, plain, bulge, and slab there was in Aaron's chest. My legs landed on the ground without much confidence. Dizzy from the overwhelming sensation dancing down my body, I was grateful for Aaron's hands remaining on my waist. Once he seemed sure I wouldn't topple down, he let go of me, but not without tugging a little strand of hair that had come out of my ponytail first. My heart proceeded to do the toppling down in that moment. Even more so when his head dipped slowly. Not bad for a Greek god, huh? His voice was not nearly as playful as a few moments ago, right before Daniel had burst my bubble. But Aaron accompanied that with a wink. That drew a tiny little smile out of me, and I had to shake my head to hide it. Who is this man who goes around throwing winks and smiles at me? My future boss, that's who. And wasn't that reason enough to start thinking about having a one-on-one -on -one with that flutter in my chest? The fact that this whole thing was a charade was reason enough already. But he'd soon be promoted to head of the division, my division, and I had to remember that. Come on, he said when I remained quiet. I told you I'd put some food in you, and I am a man of my word. Yes, he was, and I shouldn't forget that either. Aaron had promised he'd play the role of my boyfriend and that he'd do it wonderfully. And so far, he'd done an excellent job. That he was starting to convince me that he was a different man from the one I had known in New York. Chapter 18 Stopping myself from crawling under the table was becoming a real hardship. But if Isabel kept up with the Aaron and Lena questioning for a little longer, I'd have no other choice but to do exactly that. Otherwise, my last resort would be to knock down the bride with one of the metallic trays containing the variety of pinchos we were snacking on. It would be a waste of food. And it was her bachelorette slash bachelor party, but it'd be the only way. She was a resilient woman. She'd recover in time for the wedding. We stood in one of the most frequented bars, Cidrerias of my hometown surrounded by the characteristically loud chatter of people and sour smell of spilled sidra, the regional apple cider. These were establishments that one could find in every corner of any city or town in this region of the north of Spain. People gathered around in groups of all sizes and ages. Some stood around tall tables, just like we, bride, groom, best man, Aaron and I were doing. Others had been seated to have dinner, and some were leaning on the bar, chatting animatedly with the waiters. Willing my lungs to take a slow, deep, and calming breath, I tried to order my thoughts so I could dodge the last one of Isabel's questions. Come on, there has to be more to the story of how you two met. Isabel's eyes shone with curiosity, bouncing from me to my very stoic fake boyfriend, who stood close enough to my side to steal a fair chunk of my focus. You are playing really hard to get, Lena. That's the whole story, I promise. Sighing, I averted my eyes to my hands, which were lying on the smooth surface of the table. My fingers were busy playing with my empty glass. Aaron started working for Intec, and that's how we met. What else is there you want to know? I want the details you haven't told me. I could tell my sister was about to start whining in that annoying and persistent way that had never once failed to break people and make them give her whatever it was she wanted. I had been there myself, many times. She tilted her head. Hey, if you guys experienced lust at first sight and started hooking up and then dating, it's okay. Nothing to be ashamed of. Plus, it would explain that bed-breaking rumor going around. My lips parted and my eyes widened. Chato works faster than I thought, I muttered. 
I sensed Aaron shifting by my side, closing the small distance between our arms. But I didn't turn to look at him as my sister continued. I'm not Mama, Lina. You can tell me. My sister batted her eyelashes, and I heard how Gonzalo cleared his throat. Or share with the group, fine, whatever. She rolled her eyes at her fiancé. Come on, we are listening. Did you guys hook up first? And if so, how many times? Daniel, who had been oddly quiet for someone who was supposed to be having a good time, sighed noisily. I don't think there's any need to share that with the group. My gaze swiveled in his direction, finding him with a deadpan expression. Thanks, Danny, Isabel gritted out between her teeth. But I'll let my sister decide if she wants to share her sexcapades with the table. Oh, Lord, did she just call it sexcapades? At the change in Isabel's tone, Gonzalo wrapped his arm around her shoulders and tugged her against his side. I watched Isabel's body relax immediately, letting go of what I knew were years of contained animosity toward her fiancé's brother. Sighing silently, I felt a pang of guilt slice across my chest. It was unprecedented, and I had no reason to feel responsible for the situation. But at the same time, it was hard not to let some of the weight fall on my own shoulders. In an ideal world, the best man wouldn't be my ex. In that same world, I wouldn't have panicked when learning that he was engaged while I seemed to be stuck in time and alone, and I wouldn't have felt the need to lie to my family and tangle myself into the web of deception I had woven. Perhaps in that ideal world, the man by my side would be there because he loved me and not because I had struck a deal with him. But those scenarios were hypothetical and therefore unreal, unattainable, and each of them painted a picture that was far from the truth. In the real world, there was a consequence to every decision I made, to every choice that I ever took, a perfect world where life happened neatly and ideally didn't exist. Life was messy and often hard. It did not wait for anybody to be ready or to expect the bumps on the road. You had to grab onto the wheel and steer your way back to your lane. And that was all I had done. That was what brought me to where I was, for better or for worse. It was unfortunate that the one man with whom Gonzalo shared DNA was not only my ex, but also the man who had been the other half of the relationship that was the catalyst for me leaving everything I had once called home. But I had made the choice to date him, my university professor, the man who would introduce my sister to the love of her life. Because life wasn't ideal. It turned and bent. It spun you out for a minute and swung you right back in the next. Contrary to what most believed, when I had applied for the program abroad that had taken me to New York, a year after everything had blown up in my face, I hadn't been escaping Daniel. I had been escaping the situation that my relationship with him had thrust me in. Granted, in the process, he had also broken my heart. And that was what everybody saw, the scolded, heartbroken runaway. But the damage went beyond a simple breakup. After that, I went through the worst year of my life. I almost quit uni and threw away my education, my future. All because people, those I had considered friends at some point, spun disgusting lies about me. And it hadn't only scarred me, it had also impacted my family. For one, that sadness that everybody had regarded me with stuck to me across time. And the very few times I had come back home, single, it had thickened until solidifying into something that I carried with me. Even my parents, in a way. I could tell they were scared I'd never bounce back from it, which was stupid. I was over Daniel. My singlehood had nothing to do with that. I simply struggled to trust somebody enough to give myself completely. I managed to keep myself one or two feet away from anything that had the potential to hurt me. And that always ended one of two ways. I either walked away, or I was the one who was walked away from. But at least, I did come out of it wholly. As for Isabel, she had gone from loving Daniel for giving her Gonzalo to threatening the best man's balls, repeatedly. And while she turned into my fiercest protector and cheerleader, the breakup never shook the foundation of her own relationship, which was evidence of how much they adored and loved each other. Besides, over the years, she had come to accept that even if Danielle had been at fault for a part, 
He hadn't done anything besides being willing to break some unspoken rule about dating a former student. Society had done the rest. Which didn't give me, or Isabel or Daniel, the right to force Gonzalo to pick a side, something that Isabel had come to terms with. Eventually, in her own way. There were no sexcapades, Isa. I shook my head lightly, trying to shove all those thoughts and memories away. Not even one? Come on, you guys work together, and I saw you during the soccer match. You, it was a very boring and uneventful meeting, I interrupted her. Get your mind out of the gutter. Isabel's mouth opened, and I was left with no choice but to elbow my fake boyfriend. Maybe Aaron's confirmation would appease her? Correct, Aaron said, and I could hear the amusement in his voice. No sexcapades took place. I watched my sister's lips clip closed. Unfortunately, he added. My own mouth was the one clamping down then, or it fell open and to the floor I didn't know. Don't look at him, don't look shocked. This is all part of the deception. Focusing on my sister, I ignored Aaron's last comment and smiled, hopefully naturally. Isabel reached for the bottle of sidra and poured a culine in my glass, filling only the bottom of it, exactly how tradition stated sidra had to be served. Once she had served me a culin, Isabel proceeded to do the same with Aaron's glass. You are not telling me something. Her eyes narrowed to thin slits as she pushed our drinks in our direction. Then she leveled me with a look. I can see it in your eyes. Drink. I didn't think she was bluffing. Lying wasn't something I was particularly good at, and my sister had the sibling ability to see right through me. My palms started sweating. My sister was on to something. And I needed to start talking, give her anything. I drowned the contents of my glass in one single gulp, exactly how tradition specified to. Fine, okay, I placed my empty glass on the table. All right, so the day Aaron and I met, I started, my eyes unconsciously jumping to Aaron's face and finding him looking at me with a new kind of interest. I returned my gaze to Isabel. It was a cold and dark November 22nd. I stopped myself, feeling the need to explain why I remembered the date so accurately. I remember because it was the day of my birthday, not because... I stopped myself, then I shook my head. I had barely started and I was doing an awful job already. This is why I should never, ever lie. Anyway, it was November. Aaron's hand brushed my back very softly. The touch unsettled me at first, but then it magically instilled confidence in me just how he had done earlier that day. How he managed to do that, I didn't know. But when he moved his fingers over the fabric of my thin blouse, right above my shoulder blades, I felt a little less like a fraud. But that isn't important, I guess, I continued, and I had to clear my voice slightly because it had come out a little shaky. When I first met Aaron, it was the day he was introduced as a new team leader by our boss. Aaron's touch turned loose and airy, and then it stopped altogether trying to keep my head on the story and away from the dainty trail of goosebumps he'd left on my skin. I continued. He entered through that door, all cold confidence and determination, looking larger than life with those long legs and broad shoulders, and I swear, everybody in that meeting room fell into silence. I could immediately tell he'd be that kind of man everybody respected, for lack of a better word, without more than a word or two being spoken. Just by the way he looked around, assessing the situation as if he were looking for possible threats and coming up with a way to eliminate them before they could manifest. And even then, everyone seemed to be charmed by the new guy. I remembered perfectly how everyone had first gaped at the handsome and stern new addition and then silently nodded in appreciation and awe, me included at first. I'd never admit it, but back then, I had gotten as far as thinking I could let that deep voice of his lure me to sleep every night and I'd be content for the rest of my days. So yeah, every single one of my colleagues is pretty much enraptured. Not me, though. I wasn't fooled that easily. All throughout Jeff's and Aaron's speeches, I kept thinking about how nervous he must have been. I kept noticing his shoulders inching higher and his gaze growing unsure, as if he were holding himself from bolting out that door. So I came to the conclusion that he wasn't as standoffish as he looked, standing there. He couldn't be. It was just nerves. 
One couldn't possibly give off that vibe on purpose. It was his first day, and that was some intimidating shit. I thought he just needed a little push in the right direction, a little friendly welcome to fall into place. And then I proceeded to do a very dumb and impulsive thing, just as I always managed to do. And I couldn't have been any more wrong. I chuckled bitterly. Maybe Aaron wasn't nervous, I wouldn't know. But he didn't need any kind of push. He was not looking for friends, and he certainly was aware of what impression he was making. I returned back to the present in that moment, and I was greeted by three pairs of confused eyes. My throat dried out. I mean, that obviously changed eventually, I added quickly in a less than convincing tone. Because we are super in love, <laughs> so yay! Throwing my arms in the air, I cheered, trying my best to get the control back. But the gesture landed nowhere near where I'd wanted it to. Isabel's face fell slightly, and right before her frown could fully form, Aaron surprised me by coming to my rescue. Catalina isn't wrong. That day I was a little nervous, he confessed, and my head swirled in his direction. Aaron's gaze was on my sister which was good because we were in desperate need of some damage control that required all his attention and charm, but also because I didn't want him to see my expression as I watched him. The trip down memory lane had left me a little too raw to hide how I really felt about that day. I didn't have any plans or hopes of making friends, not during the first meeting and not any day after, he continued. Well, that wasn't a shock to me not after almost two years of enduring the consequences of that position. And I was plenty obvious about it. The last thing I wanted was someone getting the wrong idea and thinking I was there for anything that wasn't doing the best job I could. And in my book, that is not compatible with telling jokes and exchanging family tales. That day, though, Lena showed up in my office, a little after 5 p.m. He looked down at his hands, and his eyelids sheltered the blue in his eyes for just a heartbeat. For a reason I couldn't explain, my heart raced in my chest at the memory. Embarrassment. It had to be the physical reaction at reliving that embarrassing moment through Aaron's words. Her cheeks were flushed, and there were some snowflakes still clinging in her hair and coat. She was carrying a gift bag with a ridiculous pattern of tiny party hats printed on it. As I took her in, I was certain that she'd gotten the wrong office, that she couldn't possibly be there carrying some kind of gift for me. Maybe she was looking for the guy who had sat there before me. I watched his throat work as his words held his audience's attention. And I was going to tell her, but I didn't stand a chance. She started babbling some nonsense about how cold New York was in winter and how irritating people turned when it snowed, how chaotic instead of peaceful the city actually was. As if it's my fault that New Yorkers hate the snow, she said. It's like the cold numbs their brains and they turn stupid. Aaron smiled sheepishly. Very briefly, one moment there, and the next gone. And I kept staring at his profile, eating up his words, and how they sent me right back to that day. At that point, my heart banged against my chest with growing urgency, as if it were a wild thing, asking to be let out, begging to ask all the questions taking shape in my head, and threatening to do it itself if I didn't. She placed the bag on my desk, and then told me to open it. But the cold must have numbed my brain too, because instead of doing that, I kept gawking at it, petrified and intrigued, staring at it and not having the slightest clue as to what to do with it. He had done that, and his reaction had made me panic and jump into crisis control Lena, which had been my second mistake that day. When I didn't reach for it, she shoved her hand into the bag and pulled the contents out herself. Aaron chuckled, but he wasn't laughing, because the curt noise was almost sad. I wasn't laughing either. I was too busy chewing on the fact that he remembered everything, all of it, in detail. My chest filled with more questions. It was a mug, and it had a joke printed on it. It said, engineers don't cry. They build bridges and get over it. Someone laughed then, Isabel or perhaps Gonzalo, I wasn't sure. With all that crazy banging, my heart had somehow moved up my throat and to my temples so it was hard to focus on anything besides its beating and Aaron's voice. And you know what I did? He continued, bitterness filling his tone. Instead of laughing like I wanted to, instead of looking up at her and saying something funny that would hopefully make her give me one of those bright smiles I had somehow already seen her give so freely in the short day I had been around her, 
I pushed it all down and set the mug on my desk. Then I thanked her and asked her if there was anything else she needed. I knew I shouldn't feel embarrassed, but I was, just as much as I had been back then, if not more so. It had been such a silly thing to do, and I had felt so tiny and dumb after he brushed it away so easily. Closing my eyes, I heard him continue. I pretty much kicked her out of my office after she went out of her way and got me a gift. Aaron's voice got low and harsh. A fucking welcome gift. I opened my eyes just in time to watch him turn his head in my direction. Our gazes met. Just like the big jerk I had advertised myself to be, I ran her out. And to this day, I regret it every time it crosses my mind. Every time I look at her. He didn't even blink as he talked, looking straight into my eyes. And I didn't think I did either. I didn't think I was even breathing. All the time I wasted so foolishly. All the time I could have had with her. If I hadn't been leaning on the tall table of the sidreria, I would have fallen to the floor. My legs weren't able to support my weight any longer. My body had somehow numbed. Aaron looked at me. No, he looked into me. And in return, he let me do the same. I couldn't know how, but I swore in that moment he was laying bare a little piece of himself in front of me. He was trying to tell me something I didn't think I had the ability to process. Or was he? Was he begging me to remember that this was all a farce? Or was he begging me to remember that even if it was, his words still held part of the truth? But that couldn't make any sense, could it? No, nothing did. Not me wondering and not whatever I thought I had heard in his words or seen in his eyes. Certainly not the way my heart had broken free and turned into a wrecking ball, demolishing everything it found on its way and leaving nothing more than a trail of shambles behind. And what happened next? A familiar voice asked. Then, Aaron answered, and his hand rose, the backs of his fingers brushing my cheek. I acted like a fool, an idiot, depending on who you ask, for a little longer. My eyelids hid my eyes, breaking off the contact. I could feel my blood pumping through my body, the imprint of the ghost of his touch right beneath my cheekbone. And eventually, I somehow managed to make her give me the time of day. I talked her into believing that she needed me. Then I showed her, proved to her, that she did. My eyes were still closed. I didn't trust myself to open them. I didn't want to see Aaron. His face, his lips, the serious line of his jaw. I didn't want to see if there were any secrets in the depths of the ocean in his eyes. I was terrified of not finding a single thing there, of finding something, everything, anything. I was simply terrified, confused. Then someone started clapping, and I heard the unmistakable voice of my sister. You, she said when I blinked open my eyes. Isabel's voice sounded shaky with emotion and anger all at once. Not that I cared at that moment. I was looking into Aaron's eyes again, and he hadn't lifted his gaze off me. What is happening? What are we doing? My sister continued talking. That was so beautiful, Aaron. And you, Catalina Martín Fernández. She used our last two names, which meant trouble. You are no sister of mine any longer. I can't believe you kept all that from me. You made me talk about sexcapades and lust when the truth is so much better than all that superficial crap. The truth, that little word soured my stomach. Good thing your boyfriend has better sense. You are so lucky he's here. Aaron kept his eyes on me when he said, See, it's a very good thing I'm here. That sent my heart into doing another cartwheel. Oh, Aaron, I heard my sister exhale shakily, and I could tell she was about to cry or kick my ass. It could be either one of those. You have no idea how happy this makes me. It's the best wedding gift I could ever get. Seeing my little sister finally... <laughs> Her voice wobbled. After all this time, it's just a hiccup. Oh, man, why am I crying when I want to kick her ass? It must, it must be. She hiccuped again. Oh, dear Lord. Tearing my gaze off Aaron, I reluctantly turned to my sister. She was full on bawling, and she looked pissed off, too. 
It must be all this wedding pressure, I thought she mumbled. Daniel, who I had completely forgotten about, said something under his breath and reached for the bottle of sidra. It was empty, so he placed it back on the table and bolted in the direction of the bar. Ven aquí, tonta. Gonzalo pulled my sister into his arms, tucking her head under his chin. Then he mouthed over her head, more alcohol. Yep, only that would save the night if the bride was weeping, especially when it was over a story that wasn't true. Because it couldn't be. It was all a lie, a deception. Aaron had played with the truth, just how I asked him to do. He had adorned it, altered it, to fit this charade we were starring in. It was nothing more than that. We were still the same Aaron and Lena who had left New York. And on that note, Aaron would still be promoted to my boss. Did you hear that, stupid and delusional heart? No more weird business. Where Aaron Blackford was concerned, it was all an act. By the time we rolled into the next spot, the club, and giving that name to the modest and scrubby bar that doubled as a club at midnight was a stretch, I was 99% sure I might have crossed the tipsy border and walked right into drunkland. The remaining 1% was divided. With all that sidra pumping through my veins, it was hard to discern if the way I felt had everything to do with the alcohol or if it was partly due to the man who had been watching over me like a hawk. Aaron had stopped drinking at some point between Isabel's Waterfalls show and the arrival of the rest of the bachelorette and bachelor party to the sidreria, which I wasn't sure was a good thing. He was completely sober, and that meant, tomorrow, he'd recall every single detail of the night. And that wasn't good. Not when every time he touched me, my body came openly alive, and then I proceeded to melt to the floor. And definitely not when every time he dipped his head to ask me if I was doing okay, or if I was having fun, my heart decided that my chest wasn't roomy enough and plunged itself to the pit of my stomach. As for the rest, well, I was mostly preoccupied with the way the loud music was filling my ears and spreading all the way to my hips and feet as we navigated the crowded and dark interior. Moving forward into the sea of bodies with the rest of the party in tow, or not because chances were we had lost them, I was unexpectedly shoved back a couple of staggering steps. Aaron, who had been walking very close behind me, intercepted me. His arm came around my waist, and his palm landed on my hip. In one swift motion, he had me secured against him. Just like I had experienced about 120 times that night, all my nerve endings were instantly charged with electricity the moment my back came into contact with his front. Every inch of my skin that was flushed against him heated, even through the thin fabric of my blouse and his button-down. His long, strong fingers squeezed my hip. Turning my head to look up at his face, I didn't care that my lips had parted and that my eyes probably looked hazy and a little clouded. Just how I felt. But then again, it wasn't like I could conceal it. For whatever reason, the alcohol in my system or Aaron's closeness, I simply couldn't hide it. So instead, for the first time, I let myself enjoy it. Let my whole focus be on him, on all the points where our bodies touched, and on the way he looked down at me. I focused on Aaron, and on the way he was holding me against him as we blocked the way further inside the bar. Keeping our gazes locked over my shoulder, I allowed my back to relax into him, and something danced in the blue of his eyes. I thought he was going to smile, but his mouth pressed into its serious line. You got me, I said over the blaring music. My savior, always coming to my rescue, Mr. Kent. A part of me knew that was mostly the alcohol talking. But Aaron didn't answer. His lips remained sealed as I watched his throat work. Someone behind him called us. Or perhaps it had come from the opposite side of the overcrowded bar. I didn't know, and I didn't care. I was going to tell Aaron to ignore it, but then he somehow tugged me into his side, wrapping a large hand around mine at the same time. I liked that, far too much, so I didn't complain. Aaron guided me through the place as if he were the one who had spent countless nights here when he was younger. The bar was every bit as gloomy and packed with swirling bodies as I remembered. The music still boomed too loudly, and the floors were sticky with spilled drinks. I loved it. And I loved that Aaron was here with me tonight, too. 
I loved that he protected me from those who accidentally or drunkenly pushed and shoved. I loved many, many things right then, and I had the need to tell him. Stopping, I turned around and went on my tiptoes, hopefully going somewhere near Aaron's ear and not his armpit or something, because that would be really embarrassing. Don't you love this place? I do. It's nothing like New York's fancy schmancy clubs, huh? Aaron leaned down, his lips hovering over the shell of my ear. It's very authentic. He paused, but he didn't retrieve his mouth from that spot. A shiver crawled down my back. At first, I was a little weary, I'm not gonna lie. I felt the corners of my lips tugging up. Yeah, the place was definitely not Aaron style. But now, he continued, and his lips brushed the sensitive area below my ear, making me melt and come to life all at once. Now I think I could stay here until the sun comes up, maybe even a little longer. My lips parted, but as I was ready to speak, someone pushed me and the words were ripped off my tongue. I was shoved further into Aaron's body, this time front to front, and I immediately felt against me all the hard planes and lean muscles I had witnessed shining under the sun that morning. Something beneath my skin quickened, almost like a zap. My body urged me to obliterate the last inch of space between us. It was crazy how much I wanted to do that. I felt the urgency in my blood, as if my heart were pumping pure madness throughout my body, making me reckless so much so that my arms lifted of their own accord, my hands linking behind Aaron's neck. I watched his eyes widen for just a heartbeat, and then something simmered and flared in his gaze. The blue blaze wiped clean the surprise, replacing it with something that looked a lot like hunger. Everybody else around us was dancing to a beat that my hazy mind seemed to remember from something. It was Latin. It was decadent and fun, and what summer nights in Spain were usually made of. Without really knowing how, my hips started moving. Aaron's hands shifted to my waist, and we were dancing. The memory of doing that with him not so long ago blindsided me for an instant. How ironic it was that we'd found ourselves in the same situation so soon after, and that we seemed like completely different people. It didn't make sense. But I didn't care. Not tonight. My fingers played with the short strands of hair at Aaron's nape as our hips swayed to the Latin beat. So soft, his hair was so very soft, just how I had imagined. I pulled a little on the strands, not knowing why. In answer, Aaron's fingers tightened on my waist, causing my blood to swirl and heat, gathering in all kinds of interesting places. Without being able to stop myself, I went up on my tiptoes again, not needing an excuse to examine his face closer. He wasn't frowning or smiling, but there was something about his features that made him look different. Unbound. Yes, that was it. There wasn't a trace at all of that restraint I was so used to seeing in him. And to me, that made him look as handsome as he had ever looked. Maybe I should tell him. My lips parted with the words, and I watched his gaze dip to them. The look in his eyes released a flock of butterflies low in my belly. Aaron, I said, but I was distracted by the way he was looking at me. I didn't think I was dancing anymore. What was I going to say? Do you trust me, Catalina? He asked me. Yes. The answer flashed across my mind, but I didn't voice it. There was something that had intercepted the three-letter words, something I was vaguely aware I needed to remember. Aaron's fingers spread, and his thumbs trailed across the fabric of my blouse. One of them slipped beneath the hem. The simple contact sent a wave of pure awareness across my skin. You don't, not yet, he said against my ear. And then his lips hovered above my cheek, causing my breath to hitch. But you will trust me. I'll make sure of it. I, I didn't think I understood that. Not then and probably not anytime soon. But what did that matter when his mouth was so close to mine? when his lips were dancing across my jaw, barely making contact, which only drove me crazy. If I moved, if I just tilted my head and... A squeal and a hand landing on my arm burst whatever thought had formed in my head. And the next thing I knew, I was being dragged away from Aaron. Another loud screech hinted at who was behind me pulling at my arm. Lina, nuestra canción! 
my sister yelled over the music, stopping us both at a narrow opening, where there was some space. Our song? My ears took the song blasting through the speakers as my brain worked out the situation slowly. It was impossible not to recognize the beat. How could I not when that infamous video of my sister and me dancing to this very same song had been played over and over at family gatherings and Christmases for the last 20 years? Both the music and the choreography were ingrained in my brain forever. Yo Quiero Bailar by Sonia y Selena was playing, and that only meant one thing. Time to pay up, Gonzalo cheered. That was followed by everyone else making as much space as they could around Isabel and me as the rest of Team Bride assembled behind us to deliver the payout for losing the wedding cup. My body came alive with a familiar beat. You'll pay for this, Bridezilla, I yelled over the music as we looked at each other, readying our positions to start the infamous choreography. Me? She yelled back as we moved our butts in sync. You'll thank me later. We swirled with our arms up and then shimmied our way down. What do you mean? I demanded as we bumped our hips, following through with the stupid dance. I was aware of the rest of our improvised array of backing dancers from Team Bride somewhere behind us. They were replicating our moves as well as they could. To their credit, I didn't think my sister's or my drunken attempts were that easy to imitate. What I mean is, Isabel said as we came closer again faced each other and high-fived over our heads. Then, we started lowering our bodies to the floor with the beat of the song, making our way down in a way that was supposed to be seductive and probably ended up being unnaturally clumsy. If your boyfriend's smoldering eyes are any indication, you are so going to get extra laid tonight. Her words had barely entered my ears and registered when I almost landed on my ass. My head shot to the side, taking in our audience and immediately landing on a very particular set of eyes. Smoldering eyes, as Isabel had just put it. And as my body went through the motions, relying on only muscle memory, I couldn't tear my gaze away from that pair of piercing blue eyes. I executed the routine almost absently, not able to look anywhere else, magnetized by those two blue spots that seemed to be ignited with light. And while I could blame the alcohol running through my bloodstream, I couldn't figure out what his excuse was. He ate up every ridiculous and silly motion as if he were contemplating something that was more than a routine created by a pair of teenagers a bunch of years ago. He looked at me as if I was more than a grown-ass woman executing a goofy and wacky dance, like he couldn't get enough. Just as if he were about to part the crowd and close the distance between us so he could drink in even the smallest of my motions. I had never been looked at that way. Not ever. When the song came to an end and transitioned into the next hit from a decade ago, whatever was passing between Aaron and me turned low in my stomach. With urgency. So much that it made me dizzy and flustered and about to crawl out of my skin. The memory of my body flush against his flickered through my mind. That had only happened a few minutes ago. My heart raced in my chest as I tried to gather myself to control my breath. Sweat dripping down my back and arms, an overwhelming sensation made its way across my whole body. I needed fresh air. That always helped. I'm going outside for a second, I told Isabel as I wrapped her in a quick hug. My sister nodded, distracted by the song playing, which happened to be her new favorite tune in the world. I veered for the door, not daring to look back at Aaron. I couldn't. I just couldn't. I needed to order my thoughts. Once I made my way through the sea of dancing bodies, I stepped outside. The night was warm and humid, and I welcomed the breeze from the sea hitting my skin. The relief was instant but short-lived. Now, my legs seemed to weigh about a hundred pounds each. But I'd take that over everything I had been feeling back inside. I also regretted every drink I had had tonight. Maybe with a clearer mind, I'd be able to understand whatever the hell was going on particularly why my heart seemed to be plotting against me. Letting myself fall onto the side of the road, I sat so I could rest my legs. This was a pedestrian area, and only resident cars were allowed to drive through. Given the time, almost three in the morning, chances of being run over were low. So I took my time, 
trying to appease whatever was still making my skin flush and tingle. Eyes shut and elbows on my knees, I focused on the muffled music coming out of the bar. The door behind me opened and closed quickly after. I knew he was there before he said anything. He didn't need to. I was attuned to him, it seemed. To this quiet man whose presence always spoke to me far louder than his words. Not turning back, I listened to his heavy footsteps as he walked to where I was, sitting on the lukewarm pavement of the sidewalk. Aaron let his body fall into place right beside me. His long legs stretched ahead, taking possibly two times the space mine did. A bottle of water fell softly on my lap. You'll probably want to drink that, Aaron said. The overwhelming sensation that had pushed me to walk outside had not dissipated yet, hammering my thoughts. He nudged my leg with his knee, encouraging me. I regarded the bottle still on my lap. I was so freaking exhausted all of a sudden, and my arms felt too heavy to reach for it and open it. My whole body felt like that, and Aaron was sitting so close, all big and warm, so inviting for me to lean my head on his arm and close my eyes for just a minute. Just one really short nap. No sleeping, baby, please. Aaron dragged the bottle from where he had placed it, opened it, and shoved it back in my hand. Drink up, he said softly. Another nudge of his leg. What a beautiful leg that was. He probably had more muscles on his quadriceps alone than I had on my whole body. Bringing the bottle to my lips, I took a big gulp of water as I continued my perusal. That is a very good-looking right thigh, I thought, as I returned the bottle to my lap. A little chuckle had me glancing at the man responsible for it. His lips bent in a lopsided smile, distracting me. Thank you, he said, his smile stretching. Nobody has ever complimented that particular part of my leg. I frowned. Did I say that out loud? Ah, oh, hell. Looking at him, still in silence, I opted to drink some more water. My brain was clearly dehydrated if I was going around voicing whatever crossed my mind. Feeling better? Aaron asked from my side. Not yet, I gave him a wobbly smile. But thank you. His frown made an appearance, wrinkling at his forehead. I'll take you back to the apartment, come on. The legs I had been so busy admiring flexed, ready to push his body upward. No, wait. My hand landed on that very good looking and, oh, really hard thigh, stopping him. Not yet, please. Can we stay here for just a little while? Aaron's blue eyes seemed to assess something, probably my state. But his big body stayed put beside me. Thanks. My gaze fell back on his stretched legs again. There's something I need to tell you. A confession. I didn't look back at him, but I sensed him tense. I googled you, just once. But I did. Aaron seemed to ponder that for a moment. But he didn't comment on it. Instead, he snatched the bottle of water from my grip, opened it, and indicated to me to drink some more. I complied and downed the rest of the contents. Then he retrieved the empty bottle, and I thought I heard him mutter something, but I wasn't sure. I found lots of stuff, you know. That's why I only allowed myself to Google you one single time, I admitted with a sheepish smile. I was scared of finding something that would change what I thought of you. And did you? Yes and no. Had what I found changed the image I had of Aaron? I didn't think I could answer that. I probably scrolled down photos upon photos of you until Google had nothing else to show me. That's a lot of scrolling. I guess, I shrugged my shoulders. Do you want to hear about what I found? He didn't answer, so I told him anyway. There was this one image of you in the middle of the field. Your back was to the camera, and you had your golden helmet hanging off your hand. I couldn't see more than your back, but I swear I could tell what your face looked like. I could picture in my head how your eyebrows were wrinkled on your forehead and how your jaw was bunched up. The way you do when you are upset, but you don't want to show you are. Aaron had gone quiet, so I stole a glance at him. He was looking at me, and there was something that looked a lot like shock in his expression. But I was no filter Lena tonight, and I didn't seem to care about talking or revealing too much. Then there were the articles, I went on, 
There were more than a few, and they all praised you as a player, as an NFL promise. And then it all stopped. It was as if you had dropped off the face of the earth. Aaron's eyes looked vacant, as if you were no longer there with me, sitting on the sidewalk in the Spanish town that had seen me grow up. I continued, not because I wanted to press him for details, but because I somehow couldn't stop from explaining myself. I don't think there are many football promises who hang the helmet for the not-so-glamorous life we lead as engineers for a medium-sized technology company. I didn't know much about how college football worked, but the little I had read during my Googling session told me I wasn't wrong. Ever since you told me about it, I have been wondering what could have possibly led you to make such a decision? An injury? Burnout? How does someone jump from one side to the other? I brushed my fingers across his forearm. I thought it would startle him, but it didn't. Instead, his other hand wrapped around mine, and then he placed our interlaced fingers on his thigh. It's okay if you don't want to talk about it, I squeezed his hand. It really was okay, but that didn't mean I didn't feel somehow disappointed. If you don't want to tell me. Aaron didn't say anything for a long moment. I used that time to come to terms with the fact that he'd never open up to me. Not that I'd blame him. I hadn't been completely honest with him about my past either. But as much as I tried to tell myself otherwise, the falling sensation in my chest made it hard to ignore how I really felt. I wanted to know. I wanted to unearth and learn everything about his past, because I knew deep inside me that it was the key to finally understanding the man he was today. And him not letting me in only reminded me that I wasn't different from anybody else. Catalina he finally said, and he followed that with a deep and tired sigh. I want to tell you. I'd gladly tell you everything about me. My heart decided to resume all those shenanigans I had been dealing with that night. He'll tell me everything about him. But you are barely standing on your own feet. You are in no condition to stay with me for a complete conversation. I'll stay with you, I said very quickly. I'm not that drunk. I will listen, I promise. Even though I was feeling slightly better, the likelihood was that I'd fall on my face if I moved too fast. But that wouldn't stop me. I can prove it. Look. My legs pushed my body up, propelling me in a rather robbly way. But that didn't matter. I'd prove to Aaron I was completely fine. I wasn't going to let the chance slip through my slightly intoxicated fingers or legs. A pair of big hands cut my trajectory, holding me by the waist. Easy there. Let's keep the standing to a minimum, he said, as he effortlessly returned me to my former position, right beside him, perhaps a little closer to his body, which I wouldn't complain about. Do you want to know that badly? Yes, I want to know everything, I confessed, following No Filter Lina's lead again. A humorless laugh left him. I never planned for this to happen this way. My hazy brain didn't really understand that, but before I could ask, he continued. I always played football. That was all I knew for almost two decades. My dad was sort of a big deal in the coaching and management world back home in Washington. Aaron shook his head, those disheveled short locks almost flickering under the soft light of the street. He knew how to spot potential, had done it a million times. He was known for it. So when he realized I had the raw talent he talked about so much, it was as if all those years of his career had been preparing him for that, for having a son he could mold into the perfect player from the very beginning. He coached you since you were a kid, I murmured. Aaron flexed his legs and leaned his elbows on his knees. More than that, he turned me into his own personal project. He had this kid with potential for becoming everything he had dreamed of right at home. He had the tools and the experience to make that possible. There was no room for failure. He worked hard on turning me into this flawless football machine, which he had carefully assembled together since the moment my legs were strong enough to run after a ball and my hands were large enough to hold one. Aaron paused. He was facing the gloomy street in front of us, and I could see how his profile turned hard. We both worked on that, and for the longest time, I thrived on it. I found myself shifting closer to him until my arm and shoulder were completely flush against him. How did that change? I asked, letting my body lean a little on Aaron's side. When did you stop enjoying playing? He looked at me out of the corner of his eye, 
something softening in his expression. That photo you mentioned earlier? He asked, and then he faced away from me, staring into the empty street in front of us. That was the last game I ever played. Aaron paused, and I could tell he needed a moment to gather himself from the way his voice had sobered. That happened exactly one year after my mom passed away. My heart squeezed in my chest, and I felt this urge to wrap my body around him, so I could shield him from the pain in his voice. But I limited myself to grabbing his warm hand and slipping my fingers between his. Aaron brought our interlaced hands to his lap. In that moment, as I stood there, watching the crowd and my teammates celebrate a victory I couldn't bring myself to care about, I decided I'd pull out from the draft. And I did. That must have hurt so much, I told him, my thumb caressing the warm skin on the back of his hand. All of it, losing your mom and letting go of something you had worked all your life toward? It did, yeah. His head dipped, and I watched him look at our intertwined hands. My dad couldn't understand it. He wouldn't even try. A bitter chuckle left him. My football career had turned into the perfect escape following mom's diagnosis. Instead of that consolidating our father and son relationship, it turned us into coach and player instead. Nothing more than that. More loss. My heart broke for Aaron. I squeezed his hand and then very slowly leaned my head on his arm. He continued. He said I was throwing away my life, my future, that I would fail, that if I drop an opportunity that would change my life, he didn't want to have anything to do with me. So I graduated and left Seattle. Aaron still held my hand in his lap. His fingers had tightened around mine as he talked. I kept the side of my head on him as I felt my other hand fly to his forearm. It was the only way I could express how sorry I was for what he had gone through without engulfing him in a tight hug I wasn't sure I'd be able to let go of, at least not for the rest of the night. It must have been so hard growing up, limited by someone else's idea of what you should and should not be. He absently played with my fingers, the soft caresses of his skin against mine, causing tingles to crawl up my arm. I realize that now in hindsight. I never noticed it while it happened. It was just how things were. I was given a set of goals and I simply went with it he explained, his thumb trailing up my wrist. I was never unhappy, at least not until I realized that perhaps I wasn't completely happy either. And now, are you completely happy now, Aaron? Those soft brushes of his fingers against mine came to a stop, and he didn't hesitate when he answered. Completely? Not yet. But I'm working my fucking hardest on getting there. Chapter 19 For anyone witnessing my foolish attempts at reaching the bedroom, it would have been pretty obvious that I was about to faceplant on the floor. And they wouldn't be wrong. It was a wonder I was able to move at all, considering my feet barely lifted off the ground with all the dragging they had been doing. Ironically, and contrary to the story my body told, I didn't think I had ever felt more awake than I did as I crossed the threshold of that door. My head was working at full speed, processing everything Aaron had told me about his past. I kept spinning and turning even the tiniest pieces of information until I was completely sure I had them pinned down securely so they wouldn't flee my memory. Never mind that my legs wobbled with every step I took and exhaustion throbbed through my body. Aaron's confession because it had felt like he was unveiling something he had kept guarded and locked away from sight, had created a little riot in my head. And my chest, definitely my chest too. The organ that resided there had constricted and squeezed, and I was still trying to come to terms with the fact that I wasn't supposed to feel that way, or to act on it. A part of me missed being drunk or tipsy enough not to care, but after all the water Aaron had insisted on me gulping down, and the fact that I hadn't touched a drink after we went back inside the infamous bar, I didn't have the luxury of that excuse anymore. It was past five in the morning, and the effect of the alcohol had faded to a very low buzz that indicated tomorrow wasn't going to be much fun. I didn't realize I had been standing in the middle of the bedroom, staring into empty space, until Aaron closed the door behind me. When I turned, my gaze immediately fell on the glass of water in his hand. 
I watched him walk to the nightstand, where I had placed a few of my things and set the glass there. That for me? I knew the answer, but the small gesture turned something inside of me to mush, just like every time he had watched after me tonight. It just didn't feel all that small anymore. If you keep taking care of me this fiercely, it's going to be really hard to go back to real life. Perhaps I shouldn't have said that, shouldn't have phrased it that way. But after everything that had happened tonight, the careful grip I tried to maintain around Aaron seemed to be loosening. Aaron nodded, his expression turning somewhat more serious, but he didn't comment on what I had said. Instead, he unbuttoned the top of his shirt and then changed his mind and started fumbling with the wristband of his watch. Feeling my legs wobble for all the wrong reasons, I walked to the edge of the bed and sat on top of the simple and silky comforter. Stopping my body from melting into it right away, I exhaled tiredly, releasing some of the tension in my shoulders. But before I could completely relax, my spine stiffened with a realization. The bed. We would be sharing this very same bed tonight. That fact had somehow fled my mind until now. And its return did strange things to my belly. Things that were not strange in a funny way, but in a rather exciting way. Things that heated my skin. Well, if I was feeling this way, and we hadn't even gotten into bed yet, I couldn't even begin to imagine what would happen when I found myself tucked under the same comforter as Aaron. His large body and my much smaller one sharing and crowding the modest space the mattress offered. And I, oh shit. In an attempt to distract myself, I occupied my hands, taking the flats off my hurting feet. Once I was done with that, I rubbed my temples, telling myself to chill the heck out because this was okay. We were adults, about to share a bed. So? How bad is it? Aaron asked from where he stood, still at the other end of the bed. I chuckled, but it came closer to the sound that someone who was choking would make. Well, I cleared my throat. I feel like I was run over by a stampede of very angry and very heavy antelopes that were in a rush to get somewhere. Aaron appeared in my field of vision, coming to a stop in front of me. Are you referencing Mufasa's death? My fingers stopped working, hovering above my temples. You like The Lion King? Of course. Any other Disney movies? I was tempting my luck here. Aaron's expression remained serious. All of them. Shit. Even Frozen, Tangled, The Princess Frog? I asked, and he nodded. I love animated movies. They take my mind off things. He dipped his hands in the pockets of his jeans. Disney, Pixar. I'm a big fan. This was too much. First he'd opened up about his childhood earlier today, and now this. I wanted to ask how and why, but there was a more pressing issue. What's your favorite? Please don't say the one that will send my heart into cardiac arrest. Please don't say it. Up. Fuck. He had said it. My heart struggled there for a moment, and that little spot that had been softening throughout the night got a little bigger. Oh. The word breathily left my lips. It was all I managed. My eyes closed, and my fingers resumed massaging my temples, although maybe I should have been massaging my chest. That bad, huh? He seemed to be gauging something when I looked back at him, my sobriety most likely. Don't worry, I waved my hand. I'm okay, I'm not drunk by now. I promise I won't puke all over you tonight. That didn't earn me much of an answer, making me cringe over my choice of words. Without further comment, Aaron disappeared into the tiny and sweet bathroom, leaving me to deal with my awkwardness and thoughts, which mainly centered around Aaron, watching animation movies in the privacy of his home, particularly Up, and perhaps finding a kindred spirit in Carl, and the damn bed again. I stood up slowly. My gaze followed the geometric pattern that crisscrossed the comforter, all the way to where the pillows lay. Our heads will be there only a few inches apart. Everything I was feeling was slowly replaced by a weird mix of anticipation and something new. I needed to keep my cool. It was just a bed. We were two adults who could sleep next to each other. We were friends now. No, I didn't think we were. 
but we were not just colleagues either. Even forgetting about the fact that he'd soon be my boss, I didn't think we only qualified as two people who worked together, argued on a regular basis, and struggled to tolerate each other more than ten minutes. Our deal, this love deception game we were playing, had pushed us out of that meticulously labeled area we had been in, shoved us right into a completely new and unchartered territory. And now, we were more than whatever we had been. We were... We were about to share a bed. That was the only thing I knew for sure. That, and the fact that I needed to stop overthinking it. What I needed to be was... Unaffected. Yeah. If we were going to share a bed, I needed to stop behaving like it was a big deal. Even if it was. Because it mother-freaking was. Aaron had been showing me just how much with his soft but unwinding touches and these little pieces of himself that were just as provoking. What had Rosie once told me? Set your goal free into the universe. Visualize it. That was exactly what I needed to do. So I visualized myself as impassive, unconcerned, unimpressed. I was a block of ice in the middle of a blizzard. I'd stand solidly, immovable, and cold and calm. Yeah. Walking to the closet with that in mind, I pulled out my pijamas, which consisted of shorts and an old t-shirt with science rocks in bold yellow letters. A part of me regretted not putting more thought into it now that the room arrangement situation had changed. Another, much smaller part, thought that Aaron would appreciate the message in the shirt, that maybe he would give me one of those lopsided smirks that... No, those were not thoughts a block of ice would have. Aaron walked out of the bathroom in silence, still dressed in his button-down, which now had two new undone buttons, which, I reminded myself, did not affect me, and headed directly to his side of the closet. Returning the silence, I slipped into the bathroom so I could change and wash up. Once done with that and clad in my jammies, I filled my lungs with a deep and hopefully energizing breath and returned to the bedroom. I didn't know what I had expected to find, but I was surely not prepared for the sight of Aaron in only a pair of sleeping pants. They hung low on his hips, so low that I could see the waistband of his underwear, and they were a dark shade of gray that complemented his skin. My gaze trailed up, and there it was, that glorious chest that I had witnessed shining under the sun with droplets of sweat that, Jesus, no, 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 I need to stop gawking, eating him with my eyes, as if I had never seen a naked chest before. It couldn't be healthy, good for my mental health. Turning away from him a little too briskly, I fumbled with my discarded clothes. Out of the corner of my eye, I watched him slip on a short-sleeved shirt. Good, that was definitely good. Cover those chiseled pecs and abs, stupidly flawless man who loves up. I opened the drawer of the narrow dresser and stared into it, realizing I didn't need anything from there. I closed it again. I threw open one of the wardrobe doors and realized the same damn thing. Cursing under my breath at my evident show of stupidity, I sensed Aaron move behind me. My hands twisted the clothes I was holding into a ball. A soft brush on the back of my arm derailed my inner pep talk immediately lighting on fire my attempts to convince myself I was cool and unaffected. What's wrong? He skimmed those fingers up and down the back of my arm. You are fidgeting. Nothing is wrong, I'm okay. I lied, and I heard my own voice shake. I'm cool. I so wasn't. Aaron flickered his fingers one last time across my skin as I remained with my back to him. It felt like he was waiting for something. And when the silence that followed my comment stretched, he sighed. I'll sleep on the floor. His voice had sounded all wrong, so I finally turned to face him. He was walking away, so I reached for his arm, wrapping my slender fingers around his wrist. I could feel his pulse against my skin. Don't, I whispered. I told you you don't have to. We will sleep on the bed, both of us. I swallowed the lump that had formed in my throat. That's not what I'm worried about. And that wasn't a complete lie. I knew that Aaron would gladly sleep with half his body hanging off the bed if I so much as looked slightly uncomfortable. Hell, he'd sleep on the floor if I let him. I'm just, 
I shook my head, not knowing how to finish that statement, not daring to. It's not you in bed with me that I'm scared of, I wanted to tell him. It's me and everything that's going on inside my head and that stupid organ in the center of my chest. That's what I'm scared of. It's me and what I could possibly let myself do that I'm terrified of. It's this whole charade we've been executing that is messing with everything I thought I knew. It hadn't even been a day since we landed in Spain, and I felt like everything between Aaron and me had changed more in 20 hours than it ever had in almost two years. How could that be possible? Tell me what's going on inside your head. You can trust me. He lifted his free hand and cupped my face in his palm. Let me show you that you can trust me. Oh, God. I wanted to let him do that. Badly. But it felt like jumping off a cliff. Bold. Too reckless. It petrified me. Meeting his gaze, I realized I could drown in the blue of his eyes if I allowed myself to which only fueled my fear. Long gone was the block of ice I had preached about a handful of minutes ago. That simple gesture, his warm hand cupping my cheek, melted me to the ground, dissolved me into nothing more than water. He had that power over me. I don't know how, I leaned my face into his palm, just for a heartbeat. That was all I allowed myself. Then, Aaron's touch was gone and the forgotten clothes that I still held under one arm were snagged out of my grip. He placed them somewhere else, the floor, the dresser, the bed. I didn't know, and I didn't care. Not when a very particular emotion had solidified in his gaze. Determination. Deep in my gut, I knew he was going to show me that I could trust him. That perhaps I could jump and it would be okay. That maybe he wouldn't let me drown like I felt I would. Something settled in the air around us. Something thick and sultry changed the atmosphere in the small room. Close your eyes, he requested, although it hadn't been a question, not really. It didn't matter because my eyelids fell immediately shut. For the first time in my life, I did exactly as Aaron had said without putting up a fight. Not a single bone in my body was willing to do anything else but follow his directions, letting him show me whatever he was after taking the weight of answering his question off my hands. Eyes closed, I felt him stepping closer, his proximity like a warm blanket I wanted to wrap myself in. With each lingering moment that passed, where I waited, every other sense gradually heightened. I could hear my heavy breathing, feel my chest heaving up and down, sense the way my blood was being pumped through my body, reaching my temples with growing intensity. I could feel the warmth radiating off Aaron's large body in waves that seemed to be in perfect sync with my heartbeat. And as his silence crowded the space between us, I kept waiting. In the darkness that had swallowed me, I anticipated his words, his touch, his next move like I had never anticipated anything in my life. Like I was ready to come out of my skin if he didn't follow up that first command hating and relishing in every second that separated me from whatever was going to come next. Once, I told you I was patient. Aaron's breath fell on my temple, sending a rush of sensation along the back of my neck. That I wasn't scared to work hard for what I wanted. Closer. He was much closer than I'd thought, his proximity warming my skin, even though not a part of our bodies touched. I could change that. I only needed to lift my hand, and I would be brushing those lips that were so close to my ear with my fingers. Or I could push him away and end this torture. But then he continued. I might not have been completely honest. I did neither of those two things. My hand didn't reach out or push him away. Instead, I let the anticipation simmer in my blood. I let him take that choice away from me. And just as if he could read me like an open book, he did exactly that. His lips finally brushed the skin right beneath my ear, triggering an outbreak of shivers that ran down my body, not sparing a single inch of flesh. It's becoming really hard to make myself wait. Another pass of his lips over the same patch of skin. You are very close to driving me out of my mind. A humorless chuckle left his lips then, 
the soft puff of air caressing and tickling my skin too. I sensed him come a step closer, and my heart raced. But I am a man of my word. My breath hitched in my throat when his lips came into contact with my neck once more, that time remaining there a heartbeat longer. Aaron's fingers trailed up my arm, reaching the other side of my neck and cupping my face, just how he had done earlier. Do you want me to step away? His thumb grazed my jaw slowly. My lips parted, and all I managed was a weak shake of my head. An approving, hmm, left Aaron. That sound alone did crazy, dangerous things to my belly. You want my touch, then? I did. Oh, God, did I ever, but... Good. His fingers trickled down my throat, reaching my neckline of my sleeping T-shirt, liquefying every rational thought. But there was a warning in my head somewhere, something I should be remembering. Aaron, I whispered. The contact of his skin against mine was so gentle, so impossibly delicate, and yet it had the power to make me lose my mind, to ignite something in me, just how we had proven ever since the fundraiser. Aaron, I repeated. His fingers halted, lifting off my skin right above my collarbone. I felt the loss of his touch immediately. What are we doing? I asked, sounding desperate to my own ears. I released all the air in my lungs very slowly, grieving the way I had felt a heartbeat ago. But this was important. I had to say something to feel safer, to make sense of this. Otherwise, I'd sink under my own weight. I knew I would. Is this still pretending? I swallowed. I hated my own words, but I couldn't stop myself. Is this just for practice? A loud voice in my head yelled at me to shut up, not to ruin the moment and to let myself take as much as Aaron was willing to give me. But the truth was that I was terrified. Deep in my bones, I was shaking. Beneath all the ways my body kept reacting to every touch and word and craving, more and more, all the ones to come. There festered fear. I felt Aaron sigh on my skin, and I was tempted to reach out and latch on to him before he stepped away. I had probably ruined everything. But he didn't. Would that make you feel better? I'll pretend a little longer if that's what you need. Yes. The word left my lips in a rush. I knew I'd come to regret saying that probably sooner than later. This was a dangerous game, but in that moment the only thing that seemed to matter was the safe bubble I had created around us, the lifeline I had begged him to throw me and I was holding on to for dear life. If I inspected Aaron's words too closely, I'd open my eyes, my brain would start functioning again, and our mouths would be busy talking. His lips fell on my skin once more, resuming where they had stopped. His mouth skimmed along my jaw, and my heart seemed to come back alive in my chest, making me realize I hadn't really noticed how it had ceased to beat without his touch. I don't think I'm able to deny you a single thing if you ask, Catalina. He followed that with one open-mouthed kiss against the side of my neck, almost ripping a whimper out of me. My eyelids must have fluttered because Aaron said, No, don't open them yet. And I didn't. I couldn't. Aaron was in absolute control of my body now. Good girl. Keep them closed. He brushed another open-mouthed kiss as a reward. We'll play this game a little longer. My stomach plummeted to my feet in response. For practice purposes, he said. And the hand that was cupping my head started trailing down, down, down over my clothes, stopping on my waist and leaving a burning path behind. It sent my head spinning. I can show you exactly what it would be like. I felt him fisting the fabric of my shirt, as if he was stopping himself from doing more, then releasing it and returning his palm to my waist. If you were really mine, I do this all the time. His long fingers draped around my hip and pushed me against him from the waist down. Hot. He felt so hot and hard, branding my skin, even with layers of fabric separating us. If you were mine. You'd crave this. He then closed the rest of the distance that separated us very slowly, 
bringing our bodies flush together with such softness and at such a painful pace that I praised and cursed him at the same time. You'd welcome this. You would want it. And wasn't I doing all those things? Before I could delve into that, Aaron's large body shifted, and my back was against a hard surface. My hand traveled across it absently. The wardrobe. He was caging me against what felt like the wardrobe door. And I didn't know how we had ended up there. Not really. But he was pressing deliciously into me, sheltering me from the world around us, like the human-sized shield he had shown me he could be for me. Rooting me to the ground and sending my senses flying all at once. So I didn't care. Instead, my body craved more contact. It throbbed for more. If I were yours, I would not be capable of functioning without touching you. His words made something in my chest constrict. I couldn't go a few minutes without doing this, he added, squeezing my waist with his hand and slipping his thumb below my sleeping shirt, robbing me of the following breath. Or something like this. Aaron stepped further into me, pressing his hips against mine. A helpless whimper left me. The runaway thumb that had snuck below the fabric of my shirt trailed a few inches up my side, rumpling my shirt on its way. A very shaky exhale escaped my lips. I couldn't do much more than that, hardly breathing, barely surviving until the next touch. Every nerve in my body felt like it was about to be lit on fire. My blood boiled, burning every vessel and organ in its path. Everything burned. I thought a new whimper had escaped me, because I was rewarded with another open-mouthed kiss, this time on my temple. Then Aaron's lips traveled down the side of my face, the air leaving them warm and enticing. His mouth stopped at my eyelids, still shut, and he held his lips above them for a second. It wasn't a kiss. It was more of a feather-light touch. And God, that soft brush of his lips alone was so sweet, so fucking tender, that it made me want to weep. He continued, stopping at my nose and repeating the soft caresses. Then he did it to my right cheek, my left cheek, my chin. Aaron left soft kisses everywhere he stopped, turning me inside out. Pure, unfiltered need pulsated through my body with every inch of skin his lips traveled over. And when they reached the corner of my mouth, I felt like I would detonate like a bomb if he didn't touch me there too, if he didn't brush his lips over mine and kiss me. I felt the large and masculine body that pressed against me sigh his lips hovering above mine. Breaking my restraint, my hand lifted and landed on his upper arm, which I discovered was braced against the wardrobe surface right next to my head. Barely able to take hold of his flexed biceps, I wrapped my fingers as well as I could around the hot and tense skin. Everything strained and tightened under my touch, and I wondered if he was holding himself back, holding back from wrapping both arms around me and lifting me in the air perhaps pressing me harder into his body, or doing more than just leaving feather-light kisses and soft brushes of his fingers. Unsure if what he needed was my encouragement, I increased the pressure of my hold on his arm. My nails dug into his skin. A deep and throaty sound left Aaron's mouth, landing right between my legs, just where all the ever-growing need had gathered. I latched onto his arm harder, my body arching into him unconsciously, barely able to contain myself any longer. I was very close to begging, and I would if I had to. In response, Aaron came a little closer, pressed against me a little harder. I could feel him throbbing against my belly. Lena. My name left his lips like a soft prayer, or a warning I wasn't sure. I'm going to kiss you. His words fell on my lips, close, so close. So. I was left with no option but to increase the pressure of my fingers around his arm so I wouldn't dissolve right there, to slip away and disappear before I could touch him, and I wanted to so badly. His neck, his lips, his jaw, the little wrinkle between his brows, everything. I wanted to slip my fingers through his raven hair and run them down his chest all the way to his thick thighs. I wanted Aaron to deliver his promise. I wanted him to kiss me. Another brief touch of his lips, this time against mine. Soft, full, sweet, 
just like honey running down my mouth. I wanted, no, I needed more. Please, air. A door slamming shut somewhere in the apartment startled the plea out of my lips. Aaron's mouth pulled back from mine before I even properly tasted him, my eyes falling back open. I was welcomed by the image of a man on the brink of losing control. His gaze was hazy, clouded by the same need that was pumping through my bloodstream. Aaron's forehead fell on mine. I watched his chest heave, hauling air in and out of his lungs with effort, just like mine was doing. And we remained in silence for a long moment, surrounded by only the sound of our wild and unrestrained breathing. You called me Lena. Out of everything that had just happened, that was what my foggy brain decided to go with. You never do. You only have once before. Still resting on my forehead, Aaron's head shook against mine, very briefly. Then a breathy laugh reached my ears. It made me smile. But that part of my brain that was supposed to work out all the rational reasoning came back to life, wiping that smile off my face. Holy shit, we almost kissed. Aaron had warned me he'd kiss me, and then he almost had. The man whose arms and body were currently caging me against a wardrobe had tortured me with those fingertips, his mouth, and then he had almost kissed me. Right after, he called me Lena. But, oh my God, I whispered. What the hell was that noise? Aaron lifted his head slightly, just enough for me to be able to watch how his eyes moved across my face, bouncing from every spot he had brushed his lips over to the next, as if he couldn't decide where to set camp. Eventually stopping at my lips, something that looked a lot like pain flashed across his expression. Your cousin, I hope. Chado. Of course, that made sense. Aaron sobered up slowly, his expression eventually going back to normal. I'll go check, he announced before ripping himself off me. My body grieved the loss almost immediately, feeling cold and unbalanced without him. Willing my legs to remain strong, I limited myself to following Aaron's march to the door, feeling numb all over the place. He looked back at me right before he opened it. Catalina? There it was again, not Lena. Catalina. I'm glad I didn't kiss you. Something halted in my chest. Why? The word was nothing more than a shaky whisper. Because when I finally take those lips in mine, it'll be the furthest thing from pretending. I will not be showing you what it would be like if you were mine. I'll show you what it is. And I sure as hell won't be showing you how good I could make you feel if you called me yours. You'll already know that I am. He paused, and I swore I could see the restraint in his posture, as if he was stopping himself from pouncing and returning us to our former position, right against the hard surface of the wardrobe door. When I finally kiss you, there won't be any doubt in your mind that it is real. Chapter 20 The moment my eyes popped open to the glorious darkness that only a country where blinds were religiously installed could provide, I knew I wasn't in my bed. For one, I was used to waking up to bright beams of sunlight flooding my studio apartment. Then there was the surface beneath me. It felt different, softer and bouncier than the one my body was accustomed to. Same went for the pillow where my head rested, too flat and low. But what really screamed at me, that this wasn't my bed, that I wasn't in my apartment in bed Brooklyn, was the dead weight currently resting on my waist. It was heavy and warm and felt a lot like an oversized limb that surely couldn't belong to me. The drumming occurring in almost every corner of my head was probably not helping me get any clarity on what was responsible for that vice around my body, or why I wasn't in the comfort of my room rolling on a mattress that had made it worth punching a hole in my bank account. Blinking a few times as I brushed some of the sleepy locks of hair off my face, my eyes adjusted to the darkness. My gaze searched for whatever was behind the weight on my midsection. An arm, just as I had suspected. It was dusted with dark hair and corded with muscles. So, it wasn't mine. My eyes followed that muscular and long limb all the way up until reaching the very masculine shoulder it was attached to. 
a shoulder that led to a strong neck that ended in a head that... Mierda. The owner of all those body parts I had been studying in the darkness shifted. I froze. That robust and heavy arm that was latched to my waist moved slightly. His hand partially slipped under my shirt. All five fingers splayed on my skin. My breath got stuck somewhere between my throat and mouth. Do not fucking move, Catalina, I ordered myself. But it was hard when those fingers felt so hot against my skin, causing my whole body to tingle. Only a few inches separated me from Aaron. Aaron, last night. A series of F-bombs were dropped, blasting across my mind as blurry images flashed through my head. No, 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 no. Those fingers brushed my skin again, and a deep and throaty noise left the man sleeping beside me. A dream. All those images had to have been a dream because we couldn't have almost kissed. That was completely crazy. That was... At the fastest pace known to man, all the events from last night solidified. They tumbled down memory lane, flashing behind my eyes and making me recall every last one of them. Each and every one of those images, snippets, memories, replayed in my mind in painfully slow motion. All the sidra. Aaron's fabricated story about how we had started dating. The way his eyes had been locked on me all through the night. Us dancing in the middle of a dark club, with sticky floors, lost among the sea of bodies. My freak out. Aaron sitting with me on the sidewalk, taking care of me. Telling me about himself. Opening up and laying out a piece of himself for me. Him pressing me against the wardrobe. My body coming alive being lit on fire with all those feather-light brushes of his lips and fingers. Lena, Aaron had called me Lena, right before he brushed his lips over mine. We had almost kissed. No, I had almost begged Aaron to kiss me, and I would have done more than just that. When I finally kiss you, there won't be any doubt in your mind that it is real. He had said that before going to check if what had burst our bubble of madness was chattel and I had lain on the bed and passed out immediately. Fuck, fuck, mierda, joder. I needed to get out of this bed. I needed time to think, to process, away from Aaron, before I did something stupid or reckless, something like almost kissing him. A low groan climbed up my throat, and I had no other choice but to muffle it with my hand. The sudden motion made the mattress bounce under me. Shit. Aaron stretched beside me. Don't wake up, please. Please, universe. God, anyone. I just need a couple of minutes to gather myself before I have to face him. I felt Aaron's body settle back, his breathing remaining deep and constant. Returning my hand back to my sides, very fucking slowly, I thanked the universe for listening to me this one time and promised I'd make up for it. I'd go to church with Abuela next time I came home, I swore. I was being a complete chicken, but I wanted a few minutes to myself, just so I could appease everything that kept darting through my mind, to make peace with it and move on like nothing had ever happened. Also, to hunt down a painkiller and kill the throbbing in my head. Coffee would be good, too. And the first step was getting the hell out of this bed, from under the arm I had desperately been gripping for dear life only a few hours ago as fast and as quietly as I possibly could before Aaron's eyes opened and found me losing my shit. Lifting Aaron's heavy limb as delicately and slowly as I could, I rolled to the side, right to the edge of the bed, and then I deposited his muscular body part back onto the comforter. Aaron moved, turning on his back and lifting that arm that had been on top of me so it rested behind his head. That position caused his biceps to flex and look all big and electable and Jesus Christ, Catalina. Pulling my eyes off the man on the bed, I moved through the room on my tiptoes. I made my way out and closed the door behind me. My head fell against the wooden surface and my eyes closed. Vaya, vaya, mira quien ha amanecido. A high-pitched voice welcomed me from outside the kitchen. Buenos dias, prima. The blood in my body froze. I couldn't catch a freaking break. My lips curled into a forced smile. Hola, Charo. Buenos dias. 
I greeted her, straightening my back and trying to look the furthest from someone who had just snuck out of a room. I walked into the kitchen, keeping my steps breezy and casual, passing my cousin as she stood rooted to the white tiles, studying my every move. I proceeded to open cabinets and drawers, looking for the coffee beans so I could at least caffeinate my brain before Chato started the questioning. Or Aaron woke up and I had to face him. He dejado una cafetería preparada, Chato chimed behind me. She had prepared coffee for me. That could only mean one thing. She was up to something. Esta ahí mujer en la encimera. Coffee was on the countertop. With my back still to her, I muttered my thanks and proceeded to pour some black goodness into a mug. Much to the displeasure of my hungover head, but not any surprise, she continued with her monologue before I could even take the first sip. ¿Hay suficiente para ti y para tu novio? There was enough coffee for me and my boyfriend, she told me. Imagino que no tardará en despertarse, ¿no? Oye, si quieres ir a llamarle para que no se enfríe el café, Chato went on. If she was trying to get me to go and fetch Aaron so the coffee she had prepared wouldn't get cold, she had another thing coming. The coffee would spontaneously turn into ice cubes before I willingly went back inside that room. Menuda sensación ha causado en la familia. Tu madre no podría parar de... And then she proceeded to tell me about when and how and what had been said about my fake boyfriend, Aaron, in the mere 24 hours he'd been in the country. Which had been a lot, considering the short amount of time. That was exactly why having Chato sharing accommodations with us was so dangerous. She had no social filters of any kind and no regard for privacy. I was genuinely shocked she wasn't thrusting herself into our room and plundering my fake boyfriend out of bed so she could continue her perusal. Chato's chatter kept filling the kitchen as I nodded my head absently. Y justo como le dije a tu madre, llegará un día en el que Lina tendrá que superar lo de Daniel. Just how I told your mom, one day Lina will have to get over Daniel. Si no, se va a quedar para vestir santos y... Jesus, my cousin had just used that Spanish expression I hated so much the one I had heard directed at me more than once, always muttered or whispered, or just like she had done, loud and clear. Se va a quedar para vestir santos, which literally translated as something about dressing saints and meant that I'd stay single and dedicate my life to God for the rest of my life. Feeling completely defenseless, standing all alone with my cousin, I couldn't decide if sleepy Aaron was a blessing or a curse anymore. Yesterday, when he had been with me, facing Charo, my sister, Daniel, and everybody else, it had been unexpectedly easier than it was now on my own. I realize now that as much as I had brought him to Spain with that particular purpose, I had never truly expected that it would work, or that we'd become a team, that he'd instill strength in me, even if I'd use it to lie to my family, or that he'd make me feel like I wasn't alone in this. And the scariest, most terrifying part was that all that was starting to bleed through the lines that defined our deal in a little over a day. The proof was last night. We had almost kissed. We had done more than just that, more than practicing or pretending. Crazy. It was crazy. But it was also true. I was honest enough to admit that to myself. But that didn't mean I was brave enough to acknowledge it out loud. I was still the coward who had walk of shame her way out of that room like her ass was on fire before I was forced to have a conversation. And I'd do that again. Aaron would soon become my boss, and that would change everything. Having him here in Spain in my home country attending my sister's wedding as my fake date was already dangerous. It was reason enough for me to shake in my boots at the prospect of someone at work finding out. It didn't have anything to do with a weird company policy or with me having a pet peeve. I had already been involved with someone where a supervisory relationship between us had existed, where I had not been the one in the position of authority. And where had that led me? To being the only one having to deal with the dirty and poisonous tongues that hadn't thought twice before stigmatizing me and everything I had worked so hard for? Just for what? For a few laughs? For pointing a few fingers? for bringing me down so they'd feel a little better? History could repeat itself, and this time, I would be the one to blame. 
it would be me who had tripped over the same stone for a second time. This time, I'd be jeopardizing my career too. Not just the credibility of my work, my reputation as a woman, or my social life. And it would be all on me. Taking another sip of coffee from my mug, I tried to shove all that aside. Whatever I thought was going on between Aaron and me would have to not go. Anywhere. Because it couldn't. It wouldn't. And it was all a lie anyway. As if the devil was being summoned by Charo, who kept talking about him, or by me, who kept thinking about him one way or the other, Aaron materialized in the kitchen. His eyes immediately found me, as if I were the only thing between these four walls. My mug froze midair, my lips parted, and my gaze was hungry to take all of him in. But how could I not? The simple tea that covered his broad chest did nothing to hide a body I now knew had been carefully cultivated to perfection for years, decades. Those loose pajama pants I had seen hanging low on his hips last night still did so, enticing me, making me think of how he had pressed those hips into me with painfully delicious softness. But it was the look on his face that started, no, rekindled, the fluttering sensation in the pit of my stomach. His features were seemingly snug with sleep, relaxed, and his hair was adorably ruffled. But his eyes? Well, there wasn't a trace of sleep there. They told a whole different story. One I had the strong suspicion was extremely similar to the one bubbling in mine. And that only encouraged the flutter to take flight and spread to the rest of my body. Averting my gaze before all this gawking and daydreaming damaged my brain, I forced my lungs to take the oxygen my body seemed to need in that moment. Ay, Chato's screech made me flinch. Mira quien es aquí. Good morning, Aaron. We were just talking about you. Peeking at Aaron, I saw his eyes widen and then quickly return to its normal size. Good morning, he said into the room, looking still startled. It was cute. No, it was actually shocking that he had not spotted Chato's bright red hair like a beacon in the distance. I hope everything you guys were saying was good. He accompanied that with a teeny tiny lopsided smile. Of course, of course, Chato waved a hand in the air. We have been waiting for you to wake up. I bet Lena was missing you. My back stiffened, and Aaron's head whirled slowly in my direction. Damn it, Chato. My lips curled in a tight smile that I hid with my mug. My cousin continued. There is fresh coffee. Would you like some? Do you take it black? Would you like some milk with it? Perhaps sugar too? Brown or white? Or maybe you don't like coffee? Lena hasn't said anything, so I assumed you would have some. Unless you don't, of course. I won't force you to drink it. Aaron blinked, looking a little lost. You should get yourself a cup, I muttered. My fake boyfriend cleared his throat and walked in the direction of the coffee pot. I, I think I'll serve myself a cup. Thank you, Charo. Charo's answer was a satisfied grin. Aaron poured himself some coffee, and before the man even finished filling his mug, Charo was at it again. So, did you have fun yesterday, parejita? My cousin sang that last word, parejita, little couple. I rolled my eyes. I wish I could have made it, but I'm not young and wild anymore. Not like you guys. I hope the bed in your room is still standing after seeing how the other one ended up. Although I guess if that had happened, I would have definitely noticed. The walls are very thin. She followed that with a wink. In the periphery of my vision, I watched Aaron wince. Couldn't blame him. I winced too. Anyway, my cousin continued. You guys got home really late last night. I heard the front door closing. Yes, we did. I'm sorry about that, Chato. My gaze followed Aaron as he walked decidedly across the few feet that separated us, finally settling on one of the three high stools placed around the narrow breakfast bar, right beside where I had sat down myself. I know, don't worry about it, I heard my cousin say as I kept my eyes on my fake boyfriend's movements. It did not bother me. I was actually happy to know you had made it back safely. Aaron scooted his stool closer to mine, and his scent hit me like a freaking moving truck plunging me back to last night, when it had completely engulfed me. My eyelashes fluttered, and I had to avert my gaze. Oh, okay, good, that's good, I absently told my cousin, feeling my cheeks flush. And I wake up a few times during the night anyway. I'm a light sleeper. 
Chato's voice kept fading in the background as the knowledge of having Aaron's body within reach sank in. So if you ever hear weird noises at night, it's just me walking around the apartment, she chuckled. With a little bit of luck, I won't accidentally walk in on you naked or something. Naked. Aaron, naked. My mind seemed to short-circuit the moment it ventured into that mental image, pushing me off my stool as if my ass were on fire. Space, air, I needed something, anything. Not being able to go very far, considering the dimensions of the functional kitchen, I opened a couple of cabinets, making sure my back was to Aaron until all that blood that had somehow risen to my face returned to its original place. I fanned myself with one of the cabinet doors. Good, good, better. Needing an excuse for my very unclassy getaway from the stool, I snatched a package of chocolate chip cookies. So, tell me everything, Aaron, I heard Chato say behind me as I ripped open the cardboard. What do you think of our little hometown? I'm sure it's very different from New York. We don't have skyscrapers or any of that, but there are plenty of places to visit. Nature, beautiful beaches. The coast is really amazing. Lots of stuff to do. She paused, and I extracted one of the cookies from the package. How many days will you guys stay, by the way? I heard that you were only here for the wedding. That's such a shame. You should book a holiday and just... The doorbell rang, interrupting Chato. Oh, I'll get that, my cousin announced quickly and then slipped out of the kitchen. My eyes narrowed. While I was busy wondering if we were expecting anybody, it took me by surprise when an arm, which I was starting to get very acquainted with at this rate, snaked around my waist and pulled me backwards. My ass landed on something hard and hot, immediately molding into the space. Aaron's lap. His breath caressed the shell of my ear. You didn't say good morning. My back straightened as I remembered my lame runaway moment. You almost made me drop a cookie, Mr. Robot. It was so weird, so strange calling him that, like I had done so many times in the past, as if that belonged to a whole different life, to two different people. Aaron chuckled, and it tickled my neck. I wouldn't dare. I know better than that. His arm tightened around me and I had to restrain myself from wrapping my hands around it. What are you doing? I whispered loudly. Chato would come back in any second. I was feeling lonely, he admitted, lowering his voice and making my mind fly with everything he wasn't saying. Stupid. I need to stop being stupid. And if I'm going to sit through this one-sided interrogation, the least you can do is keep me company. Plus, you owe me a conversation. I was right there, my voice came out strangled, and Chato is not here now. He hummed, and that noise traveled straight to my lower belly. She will be back, though, and you know I like to be extra prepared. I did. I knew him pretty damn well, I realized. And just like that, with that thought floating around my mind, Chato's head popped up in my field of vision. Her eyes widened, and then her face broke into a ridiculously large smile. Jesus. She clapped her hands. Oh, look at you too. Ay, Dios mío. You are adorable. Aaron's chest grumbled with a laugh, and I felt it in my back. See? He whispered in my ear. No, I didn't see shit, frankly. It was hard to focus on anything being swaddled in Aaron's lap. My mouth opened, but all words died when a second head popped up in the kitchen. Chato turned in the direction of the second head topped with the same bright shade of red. No ves, mamá, te lo dije. Tia Carmen, I mumbled. ¿Qué haces aquí? What was Charo's mother doing here? The woman who was an older and rounder version of my cousin pointed a finger at me. Menira saludarte, tonta. She was here to say hi. I doubted it. She'd see me at the wedding tomorrow. My eyes turned to Charo, who had guilt written all over her face. She busied herself with something on the counter. Aaron moved underneath me, his legs flexing and his hand holding my waist securely, just as if, whoa. He stood up. We haven't met before, he told my aunt. Then he stepped forward, somehow keeping my body in his delicate but skilled hold. I don't want you running for the closest exit, he whispered in my ear. What the? Soy Aaron, encantado he said louder for my aunt, while keeping me tucked to him. 
so he was going to carry me around in his arms until I talked to him. About last night. About our almost kiss. My head swiveled back, eyes narrowed. No, 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 Tia Carmen called, stopping Aaron's advances in her direction. You can sit back down, cariño. No need for formalities. We are all family. Aaron obeyed, placing us both back on the stool immediately. Chato, who had been hovering around the kitchen during the exchange with my aunt, placed a tray on the breakfast bar. It contained fruits, cereals, nuts, a plate with all different kinds of cheese and embutido, and a few slices of bread, too. My eyes widened as I wondered how and when had that arrived at the apartment. I got a few groceries yesterday, my cousin explained. Cocking a brow, I zeroed in on her. That meant planning. Have you tried some jamón, Aaron? She asked, ignoring my glance. I have. It's delicious, but... The Carmen leaned on the table. Do you like chorizo, too? This one is really good. Here, my cousin said, not waiting for his answer and serving him a few slices of both Spanish delicacies on a small plate. She placed it in front of him. Try it. I always buy the best kind. My fake boyfriend thanked her, probably staring at the plate and wondering if they actually listened when people talked. Taking pity on him, I patted his forearm, which was still around my waist. ¿Y qué intenciones tiene este chico con nuestra linita? Tia Carmen asked my cousin as she snatched a slice of bread off the tray. What intentions does he have with our little Lina? My jaw fell to the floor. Charo seemed to think about it for a moment. No lo sé, mamá. Her eyes zeroed in on a man behind me, or rather, beneath me. Aaron, what are your intentions with Lina? You are not just fooling around, are you? What do you think about marriage? Because Lina is about to turn 30 and... Charo, I interrupted her. Ya basta, I hissed. And I'm only 28, Jesus. Aaron chuckled behind me. Marriage is one of my favorite institutions. My jaw hit the floor. I've always wanted to get married. My breath hitched, my mouth still hanging open. Have a bunch of kids, a dog too. Swallowing hard, I tried my best to conceal my pure shock. I tried to take a hold of my mind, which had wandered away with dangerous rose-tainted images born of Aaron's words. Fake, he's only saying what every family wants to hear. And then he really went for it. We love dogs, don't we, Bollito? Managing to pick up my jaw from the floor, I answered with a weak, yeah. Then I shook my head and somehow recovered. That's why we'll have a bunch of them, instead of kids. His chuckle tickled my ear. But there's plenty of time to talk about that, I gritted out with a fake smile. Ay, que bien, dogs, babies, true love, just in time before you are a little too old. Chato clapped, and I shot her a look. Mujer, no te pongas así. Don't be like that, she said. Did you try that jamón, Aaron? If you ever get married and move to Spain, you'll have all the jamón you'd ever want. Move to Spain? Jesus, what did she want? To make me lose my shit? My cousin continued. You see, Lena had to leave to America all those years ago because of everything that happened, and... Charo, I cut her off, my breathing growing heavy. Déjalo ya, por favor. I begged her to drop it. The doorbell rang again, and I muttered a not-so-quiet curse under my breath. Oh, they are here, my cousin announced. What? Who? Then she proceeded to link her arm with her mother's, and they slipped out of the kitchen together. Aaron's hand squeezed my arm gently, and I released all the air in my lungs. I was on edge after that, and I was going to ignore, no, forget, his comment about marriage and kids and dogs because it was completely irrelevant. And I did, as soon as his fingers trailed down to my waist. The touch, the caress, so feather-like, so brief, but so very powerful that created a riot of shivers to spread across my whole body. Relax, he said in my ear. His fingers started moving in circles over the skin of my wrist. The brush of his fingers was lazy, calming. That's it, he whispered as his fingers kept flicking over my skin. My shoulders gradually relaxed until my back settled completely against his front. Aaron's chin rested on the top of my head, and then he said, We've got this. I wanted to believe him, 
to believe that we could fake date our way through this improvised family reunion today and then tomorrow. But as I finally surrendered and let my body fall into his, it felt like way more than just that. I realized a part of me didn't want to believe in just that, because it felt right to be in this kitchen, sitting on his lap, while he brushed his fingers over the sensitive skin of my wrist as we endured my family's inappropriate antics. We felt like a we, Aaron and I. And when it was my mother's head coming into view, followed by my abuela, my tia, and Charo, that realization solidified somewhere in the middle of my chest, like a brick or a block of cement, heavy, firm, and really hard to ignore. But it was when Aaron briefly peeled himself off me, just long enough to introduce himself to my abuela, that I felt the brick click into place, inserting itself like a Tetris piece in a nook that had been waiting to be filled. And by the time he returned his arm to my waist and my body to his lap, just after he looked down and smiled that smile just for me, I knew with certainty that I'd never be able to get that damn brick out of there. It was there to stay. Chapter 21 Surprisingly, everything was going smoothly. So far, no awkward or embarrassing moments had made me regret all my life choices, and no one had dropped any inappropriate questions that made me want to open a hole in the ground and plunge myself in. With a little luck, I would even be able to get through this one dinner unscathed, and I really thought I would. I hoped this sense of contentment humming satisfactorily under my skin wasn't a byproduct of the food I had devoured, because that was what a Spanish feast could do to you. It could cloud your judgment. We were all sitting at a round table on the terrace of a restaurant that faced the sea. The sun was setting on the horizon, about to reach the thin line where the ocean and the sky met, and the only sound filling the air around us, besides the low chatter, was the crashing of the waves against the rocks lining the coast. To put it in a simple way, it was perfect. The soft touch of a hand on my arm sent a handful of shivers rolling down my spine. Cold, a deep voice I had come to anticipate in ways that made my breath hitch asked close to my ear. Shaking my head, I faced him. Only a few inches separated us, our lips. No, I'm fine. I wasn't fine. I had learned that when Aaron came this close, I was everything but fine. Just full. <laughs> I might have overdone it. No place for dessert. My eyebrows bunched at the audacity. Don't be ridiculous, Osito. I always save space for dessert. Always. Aaron's lips curled up, and his smile reached the corners of his eyes, transforming his whole face. Wow, we. I hadn't been prepared for it if the butterflies in my stomach were any indication. Lena, Aaron, more wine? My dad asked from the other side of the table. My parents had insisted we order wine even if the wedding was tomorrow, where alcohol would certainly flow in rivers of sidra, wine, cava, and whatnot. Nobody had tried to complain, not even Isabel or Gonzalo, whose faces displayed the repercussions of our almost all-nighter. But in the land of wine, one simply didn't go to dinner and not order a bottle. No thanks, I think I'm going to save myself for tomorrow, I answered, removing my glass from my dad's reach. The bottle had already been hovering mid-air. Unlike me, Aaron was too slow. So before he could muster his answer, my dad was already refilling his glass. You snooze, you lose, I whispered, leaning in his direction. That bright smile that had taken over his face returned, throwing me off my game in the blink of an eye. And then the arm that had been around the back of my seat stretched, and he playfully pinched my side. I jumped in my seat, almost knocking a few glasses off the table. Aaron's other hand reached for his wine, bringing it to his lips. Don't be cute, he said over his glass, pinning me with a look that made me shift in my chair. Then he dipped his head and lowered his voice. Next time, I'll do more than just pinch you. His lips finally met the glass, taking a sip. Keeping my eyes on his lips for a few intense seconds, I was sure something had just popped in the vicinity of my female reproductive parts. Cheeks flushed, I swiveled my head, searching for any evidence that someone at the table had heard that. 
My abuela was still busy cleaning her plate off. Gonzalo and Isabel seemed to pass out from exhaustion, and most likely a food coma by the time we reached dessert. My parents chit-chatted animatedly with a waiter I hadn't even realized was standing at our table. And Daniel, who had come alone because his and Gonzalo's parents were arriving early tomorrow, was looking down at his phone like it held the secrets of the universe. That day, weeks ago, when I had untruthfully declared that I was dating a man after being told that Daniel was engaged and happier than ever, I had done it in panic after picturing a scene almost identical to the one we'd found ourselves in, except that the chair next to me would have been empty or occupied by someone like my abuela or Daniel's fiancé, knowing my luck. Or hey, maybe it would have been that escort I had briefly considered hiring. But either way, it would have been someone who didn't make my heart race with nothing more than a look or my belly tumble with one of those smiles that I was beginning to covet just for myself. So as I looked in Daniel's direction, I realized a few things. First and foremost, my gut reaction to lie and thrust myself and Aaron into this ludicrous plan had been perhaps a little excessive. Then there was the fact that despite being excessive, having Aaron with me had made everything easier in a way that I would never have fathomed. And last, and I struggled with wrapping my head around this, there was a considerable part of me, one that I was trying really hard to ignore but failing to do so, that didn't regret any of it. And that was extremely dumb of me, because the man I found myself flushing around and not regretting having by my side would soon become my boss. So Aaron, my mother said, returning me back to the present, Isabel explained how you two met and started dating. Her eyes sparkled, and I bet it had more to do with the wine. That story you told them last night in the Cidreria? It sounded so romantic, just like one of those movies we watch on the Netflix. Of course, my mother would veer the conversation in that direction. It's just Netflix, Mama, I muttered, playing with my hands on the table. And yeah, a proper office romance, just like in the movies, right? Only this one is real, Aaron said. Real. His words came rushing back into my mind. I talked her into believing that she needed me. Then I showed her, proved to her that she did. My heart tumbled down my chest. So how much do you two actually work together? My mother's gaze was directed at Aaron, an inquisitive smile on her lips that told me she was dying to know everything there was to know. We both lead different teams, and we don't work on the same projects, but we see each other often, he sent me a side glance. And if we don't, I make sure we do. I try to catch her on her break, steal a glance or two in the hallways, pass by her office without having an excuse, anything that will put me in her head for just a few moments a day. I dipped my head, staring at my empty plate. Was that true? Aaron had had a way of popping up out of thin air. But had that been intentional, even if it was to get on my nerves? I was beginning to struggle with something as simple as telling apart what was real from what wasn't. Everything that left Aaron's mouth was based on reality. Us working together, us knowing each other for almost two years. And then it had an element of deceit, us dating, being in love. But everything else, everything that somehow lay between those two sides, all those ornaments he hung off both truth and deceit, belonged to a gray area I did not know how to define. Que maravilloso, my mom beamed. Then she translated what Aaron had said for Abuela, and the old woman I owed my slightly frizzy hair to beamed too. Honestly, Abuela had been charmed by Aaron since the moment he had greeted her with two kisses and told her how proud she must be of her granddaughter, which, in turn, had turned me into a beaming idiot too. You know. My dad chipped in. Not everyone is able to handle Arlena. She has the biggest heart in the family, but she can be a little. He trailed off, one of his eyebrows rising on his forehead. Ay, what's the word in English? My dad paused, his lips puckered with frustration. She can be a total dork, suggested Isabel, who had just very conveniently come back from the dead. Oye, I exclaimed. At the same time, my dad answered, no, not that one. He scratched the side of his head. Short, offered Gonzalo, clumsy. My head whipped in his direction. Aaron hummed, 
ridiculously stubborn. Not bothering to turn to him, I rammed my elbow into his side. He gently grabbed my arm and laced our fingers together, placing them on top of the table. I stared at our linked hands. All outrage immediately vanished. Then Aaron dipped his head and told me in a low voice, I didn't want to be left out. I looked over at him and found yet another one of those smiles that made me weak in the knees. Something fluttered low in my belly. Gracias a all of you, I murmured. My dad kept searching his mind for whatever word it was that he couldn't remember. It isn't any of those words. Just let me think. Daniel cleared his throat, finally taking part in the conversation. What if you tell us the word in Spanish and we can translate it, Javier, he suggested. My mom nodded her head. Claro, usa el Google, Javier. Use the Google, Javier. Papa, I told him with a sigh. Just let it go. Firecracker, he blurted out. Our Lena is a little firecracker. All right, that was actually not that bad. So she can be too much to handle, often. Oh, I deflated a little in my chair, my hand remaining in Aaron's. She's always chattering like she has too much to say and not enough time to do so, or laughing like she doesn't care she'll wake up half the world that's sleeping. She can also be a little defiant, and God knows she is as stubborn as they come. But that's all fire, passion. That's what makes her our Lina, our little terremoto, our little earthquake. My dad's eyes started shining under the light of the few lamps that had switched on as we entered the night. Something in my chest constricted. And for a while there, it wasn't like that. All that lightness faded out. And seeing my daughter going through something like that wasn't easy. It broke our hearts. Then she left. And even if we knew it was what she wanted and needed to do, our hearts broke a little further. Tears were rushing down my eyes by then, the pressure behind them increasing with every word from my father, with every memory he unearthed. But that's in the past. She's here now, and she's okay. Happy, my mom reached out, taking my dad's hand in hers. Not able to hold myself any longer, I stood up on shaky legs and walked around the table. When I reached my dad, I wrapped him in a hug and kissed his cheek. Te quiero, papá. Then I did the same with my mother. A ti también, tonta. All the while, I held my tears in as if my life depended on it. I wouldn't cry. I refused to. Now stop it, okay, both of you. Save something for tomorrow. When I returned to my seat, I watched my hand reaching for Aaron's, as if it no longer conceived not being held in his. Absorbed by my own gesture, my heart flopped in my chest when his hand met mine midway, linking our fingers and bringing them to his mouth to brush his lips over the back of my hand. It was all so fast that by the time it was over and our linked hands rested on top of the table, I wouldn't have known it had really happened if not for the scorching imprint of his lips on my skin. My mother spoke next, returning my attention to her. It makes me so happy to have you home, cariño. Then her eyes landed on Aaron. To see you like this. Her smile widened, the sadness vanishing. A pang of guilt sliced my gut, followed by something sultry and dense, something that tasted like regret and hope. For a moment, I thought she wouldn't really bring you, Aaron. I even questioned if you were real. She chuckled, and I swore my lungs stopped working for a heartbeat. Her gaze met mine, a light smile on her face. Don't look at me like that. You've never talked about anyone you were seeing or brought anyone home from New York the few times you came back. And it was all so sudden. Honestly, hermanita, Isabel pitched in, sounding suspiciously interested. We thought you'd end up like one of those old ladies who dedicated their life to a bunch of cats. But instead of cats, it would have to be fish or like geckos because you're all allergic to cat fur. She snickered. We constantly talked about it in family gatherings. Thanks for the faith, I muttered, and then stuck my tongue out in my sister's direction. I couldn't believe they were saying that kind of stuff with someone they believed I was dating at the table. Or better yet, with someone they knew I had dated sitting right here. I'm lucky to have you. Aaron's fingers gripped mine a little tighter, and I felt mine returning the gesture. No, we did not talk about such things, my mother firmly denied, shooting her other daughter a look. 
Stop teasing your sister, Isabel. You are getting married tomorrow. Isabel frowned. What does that have to do with any? Mama sliced her hand through the air, dismissing my sibling. I snickered, watching her cross her arms over her chest. We never thought you'd end up alone, Lena, but we were terrified you would be lonely. She looked over at Aaron, her eyes softening. And knowing that you're not, that you have someone to lean on and to return home to, maybe someone to call home one day, makes me sleep a little better at night. The man beside me didn't hesitate when he spoke. I can promise you that much. His voice reached my skin like a caress, pushing my heart to a bang against my chest walls, wanting out as much as I didn't want to hear whatever was to come. She'll always have me. His thumb caressed the back of my hand. She doesn't know it yet, but she is stuck with me. I couldn't not look over at him. After that, I could not want to search his handsome face. At this point, it shouldn't have surprised me all that much. Aaron held that kind of power over me. So I did exactly that. I allowed myself to turn. His eyes had already been on me. Does he feel that pull too? That urge to search my face for whatever answers he thinks he'll find? Trying to get my heart under control, I peered into the ocean blue with trepidation, with anticipation too. And I found something utterly terrifying. Something that shouldn't, couldn't have been there, considering that this was supposed to be a farce, so therefore his statement was not true. But I struggled to deny what was in front of me, that those emotions were really there, radiating off his gaze. Raw honesty, conviction, faith, reliance, a pledge. All of that looked at me from Aaron's eyes, demanding to be acknowledged. As if he was making me the promise and not my mother as if what he had just proclaimed wasn't part of our game in deception. But I couldn't accept that. As much as my body shook with effort to restrain myself from wrapping my arms around his neck and begging him for answers, or to tell me exactly where in the gray area we found ourselves, I wouldn't allow myself to play with the questions spinning in my head and knotting together all my heartstrings. Because perhaps I didn't really want to hear any of the answers to questions like, had we gone from co-workers to deal associates to friends? Were we friends who vowed to be there for each other now? Friends who almost kissed and shared soft brushes of their lips? Was that promise really true, like his eyes pleaded with me to believe? Or was that nothing more than an ornament? And if it was, then why would he say something like that? Had he no disregard for my poor heart? Didn't he see that I was no longer able to discern one thing from the other? But if it wasn't a simple embellishment of the truth, an act, a tool in this farce, then what in the world was he doing? What were we doing? Not able to remain under everything that looked at me from Aaron's gaze anymore, or to process all the questions and doubts cramming my head, I straightened my legs with a brisk motion, and my hand let go of his. The chair underneath me screeched across the floor. I need to use the ladies' room, I rushed out snagging my gaze off Aaron. Then I walked as fast as I could without looking back. I did not turn, not once. Not even after I heard my sister say, So, now that she's gone, can we talk about me? I'm the bride, and I'm supposed to be the center of attention. I'm feeling neglected. Had my head not been a mess, I would have laughed, probably gone back and tugged at her hair for being a pompous, self-centered brat, but I was too busy running being a complete chicken shit again, which, at this rate, I'd probably master by the time the weekend was over. I went through the motions of washing my hands and splashing some water on my face while I thought about nothing and everything, feeling completely overwhelmed by my own stupidity. That was probably why when I exited the bathroom, I didn't realize there had been someone on the way until I was collapsing against a male chest with an oomph. Mierda, I muttered under my breath, going back a couple of steps. Lo siento mucho, I added right before noticing who was in front of me. Oh, Daniel. Brushing a few strands of hair off my face, I inwardly cringed. My ex didn't show any sign of feeling as awkward as I did. Are you okay? He asked me in Spanish. And now that it was just us and Aaron wasn't around, I answered in Spanish too. Yeah, I'm fine. It was nothing, just a little bump. Clearing my throat, 
I dusted off imaginary specks of dirt off my pleated skirt. And sorry again, it was really my fault. I was a little distracted. It's all good, Lena. That dimple in his cheek made an appearance. I stared at it, a little lost in thought. And to think that all those years ago, it was that dimple that had set everything into motion. Now, I couldn't even bring myself to feel the slightest hint of warmth when I looked at it. I think I shouldn't have come tonight, Daniel confessed out of the blue, returning me to the present. I nodded slowly, trying to come to terms with the odd sense of sympathy I suddenly felt toward him. He wasn't wrong. All throughout dinner, he'd been nothing but a ghost. No one had really addressed him, something I could understand considering our history, and he hadn't talked on his own. Putting myself in his shoes, I didn't think I would have accepted coming myself. No, coming was the right thing to do if you believed you had to be here. I clasped my hands together, keeping them from fumbling. You did it for Gonzalo, and that's very brave of you. He laughed with bitterness. I don't think anyone at the table would agree with you, except maybe Gonzalo, and he wouldn't use the word brave. His hands slipped into the pockets of his slacks. Again, he wasn't wrong about that either. My parents had always been polite, even if distant, but just for Gonzalo's sake, for Isabel's sake too. They knew how important Daniel was to him, and how without him, they wouldn't have Gonzalo in their lives, and they loved him to pieces. But I still didn't have a doubt that they'd never forgive Daniel for breaking my heart all that time ago, for having a part in what I had gone through. Listen, Daniel said before releasing a breath. I know it's probably too late for this, but... I wanted to tell you that I'm sorry. I don't think I ever did. No, he had never apologized. But I never meant for everything that went down to happen. I never even imagined it was a possibility. Of course he hadn't, and hadn't that been part of the problem? He dragged me along, and when things started looking ugly, he fled the ship, leaving me there to sink with it. And that had been exactly what I did. I had been pulled under the surface, and I'd had to fight my way up alone. His apology was long overdue. Perhaps it was even too late. But at least I was finally getting one. And that counted for something. It's water under the bridge, I told him. And I meant it. Even though a little part of me would always remember that he had been a big player in something that left a scar I'd always carry around. Don't worry about what my dad said, by the way. He's a little emotional. I waved my hand in front of us stopping myself the moment I realized I didn't owe Daniel a single thing. I shouldn't have been trying to make him feel better. I cleared my throat. You know how weddings bring out the best and the worst of us. I was living proof of that. My fake boyfriend, sitting at a table with my family, finally facing my newly engaged ex. Although the problem with coming back home for Isabel's wedding, single, dateless, had never been about seeing Daniel, it was about facing everyone else while doing that. It was the anticipation, the idea, of having every single person who had seen me grow up, fall in love, get my heart broken, lose a little part of myself for a while, and then flee to a different country. It was about facing a man who had clearly put his life back together when I hadn't. That was what had set this whole thing into motion, exactly what had made me push the panic button. And how stupid had that been? How dumb had it been to let something like that drive me to lie? to create and sell them this ridiculous and wholesome image of myself that I would thought would make me complete and happy in their eyes. I realize now, as I stood in front of the catalyst of this whole mess, that it had been very fucking stupid. I hope you mean that, Lena. This whole thing is better left in the past anyway. Daniel looked at the ground for a moment and then nodded his head. Are you happy now? With your life, with him? He tilted his head. You don't look completely happy. My throat dried, my eyes widening as I tried to process his words. Of course I am, I said, but it came out in a breathless way. Pure shock swirled in my body, mixing with stupid fear at being called out on a lie. I'm happy, Daniel, I repeated, those two emotions turning into something else, something that tasted a lot more bitter. Are you sure about that? He asked calmly in a confident and patronizing way that had me rearing my head back. He seems like a stand-up guy, this Aaron, although he looks a little dry, stuffy. Daniel continued, and my eyes fluttered closed for a fraction of a second.
a strong sense of protectiveness washing over me. But I guess he's good to you. He has been stuck to your side since the moment I met him, he chuckled. Not my style, this guard dog vibe, but I could understand the appeal. My lips parted, as I found it hard to believe the words Daniel was saying. But are you really happy, Lena? I know you, and this is not the carefree Lena you are. You have been on edge in the short time you've been here, and I'll be honest, I can't help but be concerned. Concerned? I blinked. Then I did it again, and again, and again. Had I been on edge? I could believe that. I had certainly felt that way more than once. But whether what he thought was true or not wasn't important. It was the fact that he believed he had any right to deny something I was telling him myself. Oblivious to my growing outrage, Daniel kept going. It could be coming back home. That must be a lot of pressure for you. Or maybe it's that Isabel is getting married and you aren't. A breath got stuck in my throat. Or maybe it's him. I don't know, but stop. I hissed. Something lit up inside of me, like a bonfire. I could even hear the flames crackling and sizzling, burning away the remains of my patience. Don't you dare do that, Daniel. His brows wrinkled together, his expression one of confusion. Do what? Do what? I repeated, my voice going up an octave. Closing my eyes, I tried my best to get back my composure. Do not pretend you care or that you even know me anymore. You have no right to judge or doubt my happiness. The pace at which my breath entered and left my lungs increased, my anger not receding. So stop throwing in my face whatever it is you think you know or see. You lost that right a long time ago. He shook his head, sighing loudly. I've always cared about you, Lena, and I always will. And that's why I'm worried about you, why I'm trying to have a conversation. You've always cared about me. You'll always care? Of course, he puffed out. You're like a little sister to me. We are about to become family. Something deep inside of me turned to ice, the marrow in my bones freezing, rooting me to the spot. I'm like a little sister to you now. His statement tasted like something tart in my mouth. You've got to be fucking kidding me, Daniel. His expression assembled into one that was meant to impose, to convey authority. I had been well acquainted with that face when I used to sit across from him in the classroom. Don't be like that, Lena. Like what? He tisked, bathing me in condescension. Don't be a child. We are both adults now. You can talk and act like one. Now? He had said now, opposed to what? To when we had dated? Had I been a child when we were together, Daniel? When you dated me? Made me feel special? Told me you loved me? I watched his jaw set into a tight line. Is that all that I was to you when you dropped me like a hot potato after you so much as sniffed a little trouble coming your way? I guess that would explain everything. Why I'm only getting an apology now that you deem me worthy of one, having finally turned into an adult. I took a step back, hearing my heart drumming in my ears as I watched him remain very still. You know what? I'm over this. Shaking my head, I laughed bitterly. I don't owe you a single thing, and you don't owe me anything either. You never cared about me, Daniel. Not enough, at least. Otherwise, you wouldn't have let them eat me alive. I swallowed pushing all those memories away as much as they banged and screamed, demanding to be let out. I really wish you wouldn't have said all of this. I really do, because these last few minutes have wiped out the little respect I had for you. Watching him as he stood in front of me, barely moving, I took another step back. His mouth fell open, but no words came out besides, Lena. It's okay, I told him. I don't expect anything from you. As I told you, it's water under the bridge now. His lips snapped closed, his shoulders falling in what I hoped was acceptance. But I can tell you this much, I am happy. And I was. Confused, too, if I was being honest. Yes, my heart was mixed up and disoriented, terrified on top of all of that. But there was a force that seemed to tear the shell of fear that covered that poor and beat-up organ, seeping through the cracks and wanting to obliterate all those doubts if I let it, promising safety and comfort. But that wasn't a conversation I owed to Daniel. I did to someone else. Someone I needed to make my way back to. I was about to turn on my heel and do exactly that when someone who always managed to put a smile on my face turned around the corner. 
What have you been doing here for so long, cariño? Abuela asked in Spanish, looking over at Daniel. Oh, I see now. She shot him a sideways glance and ignored him altogether. When she looked back at me, her lips were tugging up, mischief written all over her face. That boyfriend of yours is sitting at the table, looking like an abandoned puppy. She linked her arm with mine, and I felt a little lighter already. He ordered you dessert, you know, and he keeps staring at where you left like he's holding himself from coming to get you. My belly flopped. A fluttering sensation took over. He is? Abuela patted my arm. Of course he is, boba. She clicked her tongue, pulling us back to the restaurant. He didn't even ask for two spoons, so he knows that getting you to share is fruitless. She snickered, and I tried to ignore how the flutter was now spreading to my chest. He, he's pretty perfect, I murmured, surprising myself. Yes, she said without thinking much about it. That's why you shouldn't leave him sitting alone for so long. He's too beautiful for his own good. He was, for my own good, too. Do you think he will save me a dance tomorrow? <laughs> I think he will. I didn't have a doubt in my mind he would. Only if you ask nicely, abuela. She giggled, and I knew without a doubt that I'd probably have to fight my own grandmother over my fake boyfriend's attention. Then, the woman who had snuck chocolate after bedtime more than a million times guided us back to where the rest of the family was, chatting animatedly. Right before reaching the table, she lowered her voice. They didn't make men like that back in my day. Abuelo was handsome, but not like that. Although it wasn't his looks that won me over, she winked. You know what I mean. Abuela, I loud whispered. She patted my arm. Don't play coy with me. I'm old. I know better. Now go. A pair of blue eyes immediately found mine. They bounced to Abuela, and then somewhere behind me. Looking around, I noticed Daniel was a few steps behind us. After parting ways with my grandmother, I let my gaze fall back on my fake date as I made my way to him. I could see the unease edged in Aaron's handsome face. His jaw was clenched, and his forehead was bunched. When his gaze met mine once more, his eyes held questions and the protectiveness I had felt a few minutes ago when Daniel had mentioned his name. It was clear as a cloudless summer day. Aaron was worried. He was holding himself back from meeting me halfway and asking me what the hell had happened. He cared. He cared about me. And he'd shield me, hold me, or just stand by my side if I so much as open my mouth to ask. I knew. Hell, he would even if I didn't ask. Honest, genuine concern. Contrary to whatever Daniel had claimed. Letting myself fall delicately on my chair, I took a moment to plaster a calm smile on my face, a neutral expression. But my lips probably curled the wrong way, my features displaying everything still churning inside of me after my exchange with Daniel, because when I turned and faced Aaron, his eyes flared more intensely. I willed my lips to inch higher, and a muscle in his jaw twitched. My sister started chattering about something, what exactly I couldn't tell. My head was somewhere else. My hands were in my lap when I felt Aaron's palm fall against them. For the second time tonight, he interlaced our hands. Our fingers weaved together, each and every one of them. But this time, he kept our linked hands right where they were, on top of my thigh, as if he was trying to tell me that this way, with them below the table, hidden from everyone else, meant that this was just for us, not part of the charade. He squeezed my hand with purpose, his fingers tightening around mine, his palm warm against my skin. Just for us, it seemed to reassure me, to promise me. And like the biggest dummy in the universe, I found the greatest comfort in those five long fingers, in that warm palm. So I brought our joined hands closer to my belly, and I squeezed right back. There was something lodged right in between my ribs that felt a lot like a ticking bomb. I can hear the gears in your head spinning, Aaron said as he crossed the room in that pair of pajama pants, which was doing mad things to my belly again. Same went for the t-shirt. He was wearing the one he had slept in yesterday. At least he was wearing one. I didn't think I could take shirtless Aaron right now. I'm okay, I lied, my head throbbing with every replay of my conversation with Daniel. 
It had been on loop since we left the restaurant. Just going through everything I need to get done before the big day tomorrow. Which was what I should have been busy doing. Clad in my sleeping clothes too, I aligned the two pairs of heels, the ones I'd wear and the backup on the floor, right against the wall, meticulously leaving the same space between them. I stepped back, admiring my work. Nope. Unconvinced, I knelt and rearranged them. When I had something on my mind, I did one of two things. I compulsively ate or organized. And considering we had just had dinner and seeing the pile of neatly stacked clothes and perfectly in-line items displayed on the top of the dresser, it seemed that this one time, it was the latter. Out of the corner of my eye, I sensed Aaron plopping himself on the bed with an ease and finesse no one his size should have. There's smoke coming out of your ears. He rested his back on the headboard, and the wood complained under his weight. I reached for those shoes again, moving them an inch to the right. I don't think so, I said in a clipped tone. Then I moved the two pairs half an inch to the left. For that, I would need to be overthinking something, and I'm not doing that. Oh, but you are, he said from his position on the bed. Talk to me. I didn't bother answering him. Hearing his sigh, I kept my focus on my task. Maybe if they face the wall. Catalina, Aaron called. And the way he had said it made me turn around and face him. Come here. He patted the bed with his hand. Brows bunched, I sent him a look. Sit with me for a little while, and then you can go back to torturing those shoes into perfection, he told me with a sigh. Just for a few minutes. Then he placed his palm on the comforter again. When I didn't say anything or move, he added very softly, like it would break his heart if I didn't give him this one thing. Please? That please, that freaking please, and the way he had said it launched my legs forward. Before I knew what I was doing, my ass was on the bed right beside his hip. I knew what he wanted to talk about, the cocktail of emotions and memories and questions that had slowly been assembling in my head, the one I had brought back to the apartment, and that I knew if I so much as opened my mouth, it would burst and spill right out of me. But that meant completely confiding in Aaron, telling him about a part of my past that I didn't find any joy in revisiting giving him a key that would help him understand, know me better. And did I want to do that? Could I do it without wanting to tuck my head in his chest and look for comfort in him? I don't want to bore you with the melodramatics of my life, Aaron, I sighed, and I meant it. What I didn't tell him was that beneath all that there was only fear. You don't need to worry. In one smooth motion, Aaron picked me up and placed me between his open legs. Another sigh left my parted lips, but this one had nothing to do with exhaustion or whatever was brewing in my head. Anything that bothers you matters to me, and I want to hear about it, he said from his position behind me. Nothing about you is boring or doesn't interest me, ever. Understand? I felt myself nod and perhaps mutter a quiet, yes, too. My heart drummed too loudly in my ears to know. Aaron continued. If you want to talk about whatever happened, then we'll do that. His hands fell on my shoulders with a tenderness that disarmed me. Then he brushed my hair to the side, and his fingers traveled to the back of my neck. And if you don't, then we'll talk about something else. But I want you to relax just for a few minutes. He paused, and his thumb started massaging along the line of my spine. I had to hold back from whimpering like a stricken animal, only I wasn't in pain. Sound like a plan? Yes, I answered, incapable of not melting into his touch. There was a beat of silence, and Aaron's fingers trailed up the back of my neck, gently kneading the muscles there. Another sound rose in my throat, almost leaving my lips, but I held it in. What your dad said during dinner made me think of something my mom used to tell me when I was a little kid. Aaron's fingertips kept working my skin, easing more than the tension in my shoulders turning me into softened butter as I listened to his deep voice taking me out of my head, trusting me with yet another piece of himself. Back then, I didn't really understand or care about it. I didn't until I was older, and she was diagnosed, and the possibility of her leaving us became real. But she used to tell me how the moment I was born, 
She knew she had found her light in the dark, that one lighthouse that no matter what was always up, lighting up the night and signaling her way home. And as a kid, I thought that was either corny or very dramatic. A low and humorless chuckle left him. My heart broke all over again for him, hurting and begging me to turn around and give him any comfort I could. But I stayed put. You must miss her so much. I do, every day. When she passed and my nights got a little darker, I started to understand what she'd meant. That was a loss I hoped I wouldn't experience in a long time. But what your dad said, about you having this fire inside, that lightness and life, and how it dulled for a period of time. He paused, and I swore I heard him swallow. It just, he trailed off, as if he was scared of his next words. And Aaron never feared speaking his mind. Aaron was never scared. You are all that, Catalina. You are light and passion. Your laughter alone can lift my mood and effortlessly turn my day around in a matter of seconds, even when it's not aimed at me. You can light up entire rooms, Catalina. You hold that kind of power. And it's because of all the different things that make you who you are, each and every one of them, even the ones that drive me crazy in ways you can't imagine. You should never forget that. My heart skipped a beat, then another, and then one more, until no air was getting in or out, and I could tell my heart had stopped beating completely. For the longest moments, I remained suspended in time, thinking I'd never bounce back from this because my heart was not functioning anymore. But hey, if those were the parting words I had to leave this earth with, then I'd be happy. And when my heart resumed, I wasn't relieved. I simply couldn't be when it started thrashing against the cavity of my chest with a wildness I had never experienced. Some people claim that the most beautiful thing anyone had ever done for them was writing them a poem composing a song, or confessing their undying love in an epic gesture. But right then, as I was cocooned in Aaron's long legs, his fingers delicately massaging my neck simply because I'd looked tense, I realized I didn't need or want any of that. If I never got my epic declaration, I'd be fine, because his words were without a doubt in my mind the most beautiful thing I would ever hear said about me, to me, and for me. My body wanted to turn, screamed at my head to allow it. But I knew that if I did, whatever he saw on my face would change everything, every single fucking thing between us. I'd, damn it, this man, he kept showing me how perfect he was, kept unveiling all these beautiful parts of him that made me giddy and dizzy and hungry for more. But I still felt like I was standing on the edge of a cliff, looking down at an ocean that whirled in the same deep blue that colored his eyes. Would I dare jump? I fell in love with Danielle in my second year of college, I said without turning, not daring to free fall, not completely. I was 19. He was my physics professor. He was younger than any other member of the faculty, so he stood out, was popular among the body of students, the female section of it particularly. At first, it was a dumb crush. I'd anticipate his lectures. I'd maybe put a little extra care into what I wore and sit in the first row. But I wasn't the only one. Pretty much every other girl, and a few of the guys, had been charmed by the dimple in his cheek and the confidence with which he strolled across the room, even when his course was one of the hardest we'd ever had to study for. Aaron continued working the tension out of the muscles that corded along my neck and shoulders. He remained quiet, and it felt almost as if, except for his fingers, he had grown still, too. So I continued. Imagine my surprise when I started noticing that his gaze would rest on me for a moment, just a little longer than anybody else, or that his dimple would come out a little more often when it was me he was watching. My eyes closed as Aaron's hands drifted lower, traveling down my spine. Throughout that year, it all built up to a point where we would sneak a few innocent touches in between classes or during tutoring sessions. It was so exciting, exhilarating almost. He made me feel special, like I wasn't one more of the students pining for him. I heard my voice drifting lower, lost in the memory, so I tried to bring my tone back up. Anyway, we didn't start dating until the moment I was through the two semesters his course lasted, 
officially publicly dating, not on campus or anything like that, but we'd go out like any other couple. He introduced Gonzalo and Isabel, and they fell desperately in love in the span of a heated look. A real smile tugged my lips up at the thought of the moment Isabel and Gonzalo had locked eyes. It had seemed as if they had been waiting for that to happen, as if each had unknowingly been waiting for the other. Aaron's legs shifted, cocooning me further into his lap. Or perhaps it was me who kept bending into him. I didn't know, but I wouldn't complain or move away. And I was in love too. After one year of daydreaming about something I couldn't have, hoping for it, I was blinded by the joy at finally being able to have it, to call him mine. His fingers stopped briefly, as if they hesitated before their next move. Then they resumed and continued kneading at my shoulders. It lasted a few months. Then I heard the first whisper, the first ugly and poisonous rumor that blackened all that happiness. And after that one, many more followed. Whispers turned into loud gossip, which spread along the corridors on campus. There were Facebook posts, too, and threads on Twitter as well. Never directed at me, but about me, at least in the beginning. I brought my knees to my chest and hugged them. The whore who slept around with her professors, they said. Of course she's graduating with honors. That's how she aced physics when more than half the students fell through. She fucked him and she'll fuck her way through college. I heard Aaron's outward breath, felt it on the back of my neck, his fingers tensing and halting very briefly. It was all so hurtful. My voice sounded different, void and bitter, and it reminded me of Alina I didn't want to remember or ever be again. The things that were said about me quickly turned into pointed fingers and into disgusting photos that someone had photoshopped with my face, into really ugly stuff. Aaron's touch turned into mere brushes of his skin against mine, soothing me, moving me forward, telling me, I'm here, I got you. It was all turned into this despicable tale where I was the cunning, dirty woman who seduced professors for grades. All the hard work and the long nights I had studied were brought down simply because, I don't know, to this day, I don't know the reason or the motivation, jealousy, a laugh. But I know that if I had been one of my male classmates and Daniel had been a female professor, perhaps I wouldn't have gone through that. It would have been the professor. She would have been accused of being a cougar and the student would have gotten a few high fives. Instead, I was almost harassed into dropping out. I didn't want to attend any lectures. I didn't want to leave the house. I was still living with my parents because I could drive to campus from their house. And I didn't even want to talk to them. I deleted my profiles on all social media sites. I closed myself off from every single person in my life, even my sister, and even those few who had remained my friends. I focused on the soothing circles Aaron was drawing on my skin, grounding and rooting me to him and to the present. It was all too much. I just felt ashamed, worthless. I felt like everything I had done was worth nothing. Consequently, when my grades and performance sank, my average went down the drain, and I didn't even care anymore. A beat of silence that seemed to stretch too long made me realize Aaron hadn't spoken a word. I knew he wouldn't judge me, but I wondered what he thought, if the way he saw me had now changed. What did he do? He finally said his voice sounding rocky rough. What did Danielle do about everything that was being done to you? Well, things started looking a little bad for him. There was no rule that stopped him from dating a former student, but everything that was going down got to be too much for him. For him? He repeated, a new edge to his voice. Yeah, and so he broke things off, told me it was too complicated and relationships shouldn't be that hard or messy. Aaron's fingers halted, not moving any longer simply hovering above my skin. He thought that we weren't supposed to make each other trip and fall, and that the moment we did, then it didn't make sense to be together. And I, I think he was right. I guess he was. Aaron didn't say anything. Not a word left his lips. But I could tell there was something wrong with him. I could feel it in the way his breath had quickened, deepened, and the way his hands remained frozen above my shoulders. I often wonder how I managed to graduate, but I did. At some point after the breakup, I woke up, showed up to the exams, and passed. Then I somehow put together an application for an international master's program and left for the U.S. 
Aaron's palms resumed, very gently, but I felt them moving along my shoulder. Nothing like before, but at least he was touching me again, and I needed that more than I cared to admit. I wasn't escaping him, you know? Everybody thought I was, but I wasn't. Daniel had bruised my heart, but I wasn't running away from that. It was everything else. Everybody looked at me differently, like I had changed, or something had changed in the way they saw me. As if I were this broken thing now, dropped by Daniel, harassed, made fun of. Everybody whispered, oh, poor thing, how is she going to bounce back from this? They treated me as damaged goods. They still do. Every time I came back home alone, they look at me with pity. Every time I said I'm single, they nod and smile sadly. Shaking my head, I released all the air in my lungs. I hate it, Aaron. I could hear the emotion in my voice choking my words because I did hate it. That's why I came back as little as I did. But then I also hated how much I feared that a part of it was perhaps true. Why hadn't I been able to trust anybody with my heart otherwise? Everything that had happened hurt me, left a scar, but it didn't break me. I swallowed the lump in my throat, wanting to believe my own words. It didn't. A sound deep and husky and pained came from behind me. Before I knew what was happening, Aaron's arms came around my shoulders, and I was engulfed by him, wrapped into his chest, warm and hard and safe and a lot less alone, a lot more complete than I had been seconds before. Aaron buried his head in the nook of my neck from behind, and I felt the urge to comfort him. So I did. I'm not broken, Aaron, I told him in a whisper, although perhaps it was for my own reassurance. I can't be. You are not, he said on my skin, tightening his hold on me, bringing me close. And I know that even if something did break you, because that's life and no one is invincible, you'd still put the pieces back together and remain the brightest thing I'd ever seen. My hands went around the pair of arms wrapped around my shoulders, which pulled me into his chest, as if he were scared I'd go up and smoke if he didn't. And I hung on to him equally desperately, as if my next breath depended on it. We remained that way for a long time, and slowly, very slowly, our bodies relaxed into each other. They melted together. I focused on Aaron's breath, on the earnestness of the moment, on his heartbeat against my back, his strength, on all the things that he'd kept handing to me so freely, like they were nothing, like he was supposed to give them away and I was entitled to take them from him. Neither of us said anything as time stretched, our holds gradually loosening as we lost the battle to sleep. My eyelids eventually flutter shut, but right before darkness engulfed, I thought I heard Aaron whisper, you feel complete in my arms. You feel like my home. Chapter 22 What an idiot I had been. A big, dumb, foolish idiot. Earlier that morning when my alarm had gone off a little after dawn and I had slipped out of Aaron's warm embrace quietly, but not panic-ridden, I had immediately regretted agreeing to meet my sister hours before the wedding. So once I got everything packed and was ready to go, right before sneaking out the door without waking him up, even though I had learned by then that he too slept like the dead, I leaned very silently and brushed a soft kiss against his jaw. Because I didn't want to go, not really, and I was a weak, weak woman when it came to him. Just in case, I left Aaron a note, telling him that I'd see him in a few hours because I'd be getting ready with Isabel. Charo would be driving him to the wedding venue. Be strong and don't succumb, I wrote down. Then I signed it with, with love, Lena. My choice of words had my heart skipping a beat, but I promised myself it wasn't a big deal and left it there. Not more than an hour after leaving the apartment, I started to miss him. Like properly brooding and sighing and wondering what he was doing. So I texted him. Lena, did you get my note? to which he replied no more than a couple of minutes later. Aaron, yes, I am hiding in the bathroom. Charo was trying to sneak a photo of me with her phone. Martins are relentless creatures. That had me snorting so hard that the makeup artist ended up brushing eyeshadow all across my forehead. She tried to play it cool, but I could tell she was pissed. 
but none of that was the reason why I was pretty sure I was a big, dumb, foolish idiot. Somehow, somewhere between slipping into my velvety fawn heels and the graceful, airy, burgundy gown I was wearing, my head had started spinning questions, important ones. Will I be able to find Aaron in the crowd? And also, will he be okay? Will he get to the venue and find his seat? And the star of the show, maybe I won't see him until after the ceremony. What if I can't find him? So when I came to my place to the right of the bride on a glorious summer day, surrounded by arrangements of peonies and all shades of baby pink and pearly white, in front of the people who had seen us grow and turn into the women we were today, my head turned. My gaze effortlessly zeroed in on a pair of ocean blue eyes, and all those questions immediately died away. What a big, dumb, foolish idiot I had been to even question that my eyes wouldn't be drawn to Aaron Blackford in a matter of seconds. How in the world could they not? He was dazzling, standing under the sun in a navy blue suit. And when he smiled that wide and furtive grin that I was beginning to think was only for me, I swore he could have blinded me if I hadn't blinked. That smile, Aaron's smile, his handsome face, him completely and entirely, made my knees weak and my chest tight. That was exactly why, once the ceremony ended and Gonzalo made a show out of eating Isabel's face right then and there for everybody attending to see, I turned around on shaky legs. The crowd proceeded to throw rice and confetti as the bride and groom made their way down the aisle. And by the time they were jumping inside a yellow Volkswagen Beetle to drive to where they'd have a pre-dinner photo shoot, everybody started shuffling to the restaurant area. A quiet silence was left behind, except for the sound of my heart which was trying to stumble right out of my throat. Aaron waited by the exit, standing with his hands in his pockets of his navy pants and his jacket partly open, right where the rows of creamy chairs ended, a few tiny pieces of confetti stuck in his hair. His gaze stayed on me as I walked down that aisle, my legs feeling like I was walking on sand, heavy and clumsy. Only when I reached him did he take a step toward me, it was fast and rushed, as if he had been stopping himself from running to me and couldn't hold it any longer. I watched his throat work, his eyes swiping up and down and up again, eating up what was in front of them. You look like a dream. What a silly thing to tell me, when he was the one who couldn't be real. The one I couldn't believe was here making my chest full with things I didn't understand. I shook my head, trying to pull myself together enough to answer. You look amazing, Aaron. His gaze searched my face for a brief moment, and whatever he found made him smile. Again, that grin, only for me. What a lucky bitch I was. Aaron offered his arm, and I struggled not to launch myself at him right then and there. May I have the honor? He asked slowly. A deep belly laugh left my lips. Slowly, I took it. Now you are just pushing it. His palm fell on top of the one that was resting on the crook of his arm. What do you mean? Only romance heroes say stuff like that, and we are talking about the ones in a Jane Austen novel. Not even your run-of-the-mill romance hero would butter up a woman that much, I explained as we moved forward in the direction of the adjoining restaurant, where everybody else was, probably a glass of wine or two already in hand. In my book, having the most beautiful woman on my arm classifies as an honor. I hoped the foundation the makeup artist had had to apply for a second time covered the way my cheeks flushed. If the bride so much as gets wind of what you're saying, you'll be in so much trouble. I heard his chuckle, but he didn't retract his words. She'll kick you out of the wedding, and I will not be able to help you. You're too tall and big to sneak in unnoticed. And too damn handsome, too. But I kept that part to myself. Aaron chuckled again, the noise traveling down my spine and leaving a trail of shivers. I was finding it really hard to ignore how good his arm felt under my fingers or how right it was being tucked against his side. It was only when we were a few feet away from the open area where all the invitees were gathered that Aaron spoke. It would be worth it, you know. My head turned taking in his profile as he kept his gaze up front. For seeing you in that dress and having you enter any place on my arm, I'd endure pretty much anything. My lips parted, 
and had Aaron not been providing his support, I would have stumbled down to the floor, rolled the rest of the way, and probably stopped only when my back came against a chair or a table. Even your sister's rage. Then a flash went off right in our faces, snapping me out of my trance. Blinking away the bright white spots, I got a glimpse of a camera. Maravillosa, a high-peached voice I was well acquainted with screeched. What a beautiful couple you two make. My mouth snapped shut and then opened again. Not having my sight back completely, I kept blinking until a bright red mane started coming into focus. Charo. Oh, your babies are going to be the cutest things ever. I cursed under my breath and smiled tightly, while Aaron seemed surprisingly unconcerned. The dumbest mental image took me by surprise, one of Aaron holding a chubby, blue-eyed baby in his large arms. Stepping out of my cousin's trajectory and veering for the wine, I tried to recompose myself. And so it begins, I muttered under my breath. The day I had feared and dreaded for months. Only in that precise moment, with Aaron's arm under my fingers and his smile aimed at me, I came to realize that what frightened me was nothing I had ever come to expect. If I'd known that my sister had hired a kiss cam for the wedding reception, I would have claimed to be sick and hidden in the bathroom. Ironically, I wouldn't have to lie all that much. My dinner kept climbing up my throat every single time the tune announcing the start of the most painful 30 seconds of my life reached my ears. During that time, which stretched into a hellish eternity, the camera scanned the crowd seated at the round tables scattered across the lush green garden of the restaurant before coming to a stop on a couple and displaying their image, framed by a heart, on a conveniently installed projector. Every single time the camera so much as passed over my fake date and me, my heart ceased beating before resuming at breakneck speed. Apparently, the possibility of having my first kiss with Aaron displayed on a big screen in front of my whole family was going to give me a heart attack. And just as if my thoughts had somehow conjured it, the tritone tune announced the start of a new round of Will Lena die of nerves in anticipation tonight? Or will she lose her shit and commit camera murder? Oh, what a fun idea this was, Isabel, my mom hollered with excitement from across the table. My sister seemed to pride herself on it even more, if that were possible. I know. She smiled giddily. They'll even put all the film together, edit it, and send me a montage with all the kisses, she explained over the relentless tune of doom. One eye on the projector screen, I watched the camera hover on a table close by. I had to book an extra package for that, but it's totally worth it. The camera swiped over our table, displaying Aaron's and my face on the screen. My face blanched. My head somehow jerked, dropping a fork. I dipped after it too briskly and almost knocked over a glass. Cursing under my breath, I picked up the fork from under the table, resurfacing just in time to see the camera moving along. Close. That was close. Reaching for my wine, I actually considered sneaking out and putting an end to this. But that would be running, being a coward. Again, something I'd kept doing a lot of lately. The camera stops on you. You will kiss Aaron. I told myself as I downed the rest of my wine. A peck on the lips. It doesn't need to be a movie kiss, just a kiss. But my pep talk didn't help. It only made my chest tighter and my belly flutter. Peeking at the man that I'd probably have to kiss in a handful of seconds, I was surprised to see a muscle in his jaw jumping. Studying him more closely, I realized Aaron looked like New York Aaron again. Not like the relaxed and playful version I had shared these past days with. His gaze was set on the screen, and while his face gave nothing away, at least not to those who hadn't mastered the art of reading Aaron like I had, there was something about him that told me he wasn't as fine as he looked. Once more, the camera glided over us, putting our faces on the screen for a tense second, and moved on. My heart resumed. Before I could feel any kind of relief, it came right back, as if it were performing a dance especially choreographed for me, teasing my heartbeat until sending it into cardiac arrest. Little droplets of sweat formed on the nape of my neck. Aaron remained quiet by my side, steadfast, his eyes drilled into the screen. So much so that concern started seeping in. Ooh, 
The crowd hooted as the camera cruised across our table again, the speed decreasing gradually. Looking at Aaron, it was hard to notice much else besides him. I was barely aware of how the others on our table had come alive, clapping and whistling to the tune of the goddamn kiss cam. My eyes zeroed in on Aaron's lips, pressed firmly together, anxiety and anticipation. Yes, powerful and silky anticipation, built in the pit of my stomach. My gaze took in the whole of him, stoically sitting by my side. Amid the chaos around us, I still managed to catch the movement of his knee. It was vibrating up and down. The motion barely lasted more than a couple of seconds, but I had seen it. My gaze leaped back to his profile. Is Aaron nervous about kissing me? It can't be. Not after the way he had almost done that right after teasing and plummeting me to a point where I would have begged for his lips. Unaware of my eyes on him, his knee resumed its movement, the muscle on his jaw twitching again in sync. Oh my God, he is. Aaron was nervous. He was all jittery and high strung, and it was because of me. Because chances were he'd have to kiss me. Me. Something took flight right between my ribs. I couldn't believe how a man so confident, so composed, one who had made my body come alive and sing with nothing more than the softest of touches, could be fretting over having to kiss me. The flutter in my chest stirred, making me itch to reach. A loud cheer exploded around us, taking my attention off Aaron. People chanted, Que se besen, que se besen, kiss, kiss. My eyes leaped around desperately, my heart rising to my mouth. Everybody was looking in our direction. I'll do it, I'll kiss him. As I zeroed in on the screen, something lurched deep within me in response to what I saw. My dad reached for my mom's face and planted a kiss on her lips. It wasn't relief. What had pierced my body was disappointment, baffling, inexplicable disappointment at me not being the one framed by the silly string of hearts because my parents had been targeted by the kiss cam, not us. I felt Aaron move beside me. Turning in his direction, my gaze hopelessly fastened onto his lips again. His mouth, the speck of disappointment grew, obliterating everything else and turning it into something thick and heavy that promised a rich taste on my tongue, one that made my heart speed up. Want, I realized. What I felt was need. I wanted him. Needed him to gather me in his arms and kiss me like he had promised. Because when I finally take those lips in mine, it will be the furthest thing from pretending. That was what he had said. Then wasn't that what I was feeling inside? What threatened to spill out and turn my life around? The furthest thing from a lie? From pretending? It was. Consequences be damned, but it was. I was long past this deception scheme, and the ball of emotions that came with that realization collapsed down my chest, crumbling along the rest of my body and taking everything in its way with it. Real. What I was feeling had to be real. When I finally kiss you, there won't be any doubt in your mind that it is real. I wanted it to be real. Real, real, real. Aaron must have felt the shift in me, naturally, as he was the one person on earth who seemed to read me like he owned the only copy of The Handbook of Lena. His gaze sharpened, roaming across my face as I watched in awe how his lips parted. It was in that precise moment that I felt like something had finally clicked into place, unhinging everything I had been keeping on a short leash. I couldn't know how or why, didn't have the slightest idea, and wasn't that part of the mystery of life? Part of what made it breathtakingly exciting, unexpectedly beautiful? We couldn't control and tame emotions to our convenience. And what I felt for Aaron had turned into a wild beast that I mercilessly fell prey to. That was exactly why when Aaron quietly reached for my hand, took it in his, and stood up, I followed. Everything that had stopped me in the past few days was obliterated in the chaos that had built around us. We had to cross the space, sidestepping people who now danced animatedly, eluding relatives with red cheeks and ruffled hair who lunged in our direction, ignoring the music filling the outdoorsy space that called everybody to the improvised dance floor. But what did I care? Nothing mattered. 
except following this man wherever he took me. Like a glass, I had been filling up, droplet after droplet, slowly packing all these things he had given me, the softest, most provoking touches, precious smiles that were just for me, his strength, his faith in me, to the brim and heaping it with everything I had been feeling. I found myself on the verge of being toppled down, of helplessly spilling and revealing everything I had worked so hard on bottling up. We were somewhere outside still, perhaps on one of the sides of the patio of the restaurant. The music from the party reached my ears, muffled by the distance, and the only light illuminating this section of the garden came from a lonely lamp perched on the far edge of the building, leaving us almost in the dark. Aaron came to a stop, finally turning around and facing me. His jaw was clenched again, the rest of his features screwed securely together so they gave nothing away. But I knew. I knew. My feet slid on the gravel beneath him, telling me this couldn't be a frequented path for guests if my heels didn't seem to get a grip for more than a few seconds. Or perhaps it was just the way my body trembled that was making it so hard to keep my balance. Aaron took a step forward, his body angling toward mine deliciously crowding me and forcing me back to come against the coarse surface of the wall. Hi, I croaked, as if we were just seeing each other after a long time. And God, why did it feel so much like we were? Like I was finally here, finally coming home. I watched Aaron's throat work, and then he took a deep breath before he spoke. Hey. His palm came to rest on my jaw, cupping my face. Ask me what I'm thinking. My heart raced with the prospect of doing so, as I anticipated his answer with a trepidation I had never known. But it was better than him asking me the same question. What are you thinking, Aaron? A hum rose in his throat, the sound deep and husky. It shot straight to my chest. I'm thinking that you want me to kiss you. My blood swirled at his words, turning thicker. I do, I do. And I'm also thinking that if I don't do it soon, I might lose my goddamn mind. The palm that was cupping my face fell, and a finger trilled down the skin of my arm. I didn't speak. I didn't think I could. His gaze traveled down my throat, leaving a path of shivers on my skin. But I was serious when I said that when I finally took your lips, you'd know what it meant. He stepped closer, the tips of his shoes grazing mine our bodies almost touching. I braced my hands on his arms, not trusting myself anymore, seeing how much I was shaking, how I shivered. Do you know now, Catalina? His nose brushed my temple, making my breath hitch. Do you know what this means? Aaron's mouth flicked along my cheekbone, making my back arch, my shoulders coming flush against the wall behind me. My lips parted, my answer stuck somewhere in my throat. He released a shaky breath, his body tight with restraint. Answer me, please. His forehead came to rest against mine, and I watched his eyelashes hide that ocean I'd gladly drown in if he let me. Eyes closed, he inched closer, his lips almost coming against mine. Put me out of my misery, Catalina, he gritted out, cupping the back of my hand with trembling fingers. My heart, my poor heart, lost it at the desperation in his voice, at the unfiltered need I heard. Real, I finally breathed into his mouth. This is real. I repeated, needing to hear the words, feel the truth on my skin. Kiss me, Aaron, I told him breathlessly. Prove to me that it is. A growl, a deliriously low growl, left Aaron's throat. And before I could even process how the sound had seeped deep, deep inside of me, right into the marrow of my bones, Aaron's lips were on mine. He kissed me. Aaron was kissing me, as if he had been starving for an eternity. Just like a beast meant to devour me, his hard body coming against mine desperately seeking anything I'd give him. Our lips opened, ravaging each other's mouths, while his large palms roamed down my sides. Down, down, down they went, stopping below my waist. My hands flew to his chest, and I relished how hard it felt, how warm, how perfectly solid, and just for me.
My heart drummed against the walls of my own chest, and a sound climbed up my throat when I felt Aaron's heart do the same against my fingertips. The noise only fueled Aaron to press into me with his hips, to reward me with a wild sound of his own. His hands gripped my waist, bringing me even closer to him, making me feel the heat of his hardness on my belly and punching another moan out of me. Aaron, 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 my mind seemed to chant as my body went on sensory overload. His hands roamed over the fabric of my dress, coming around me, dragging down my back, all while his tongue danced against mine. Another press of his hips against mine made my body spin out of control and sent more and more heat to pull between my thighs. Aaron's lips left mine, revealing he was breathing as violently as I was. Without wasting a moment, his mouth landed on the soft spot between my jaw and neck. Looking up at the dark sky, I bared my throat for him. Another whimper left me, carried away by the breeze coming from the sea. That sound? Aaron breathed into my skin. That sound is driving me goddamn insane. Insanity. That was what this was, what was pumping in my veins. He kissed a path up to my throat, veering for my ear, leaving little nips that left my blood roaring, thundering across my body. My hands tore up his wide chest, reaching the nape of his neck, my fingers tangled in his hair, pulling at it softly when he nibbled at the skin below my earlobe. When he grazed his teeth over it, I pulled a little harder. Hold on to me, baby. In a swift move, Aaron picked me up from the floor, my legs going around him and my arms wrapping tighter around his neck. Somewhere in the back of my head, I worried about the fabric of the dress, about it not being airy or thin enough so it had let me feel him, Aaron, all of him. Every doubt fled my mind as he pushed against me once more. My back came harder against the wall, and I could feel his length nestled between my legs. Hot, he was so hot and hard. That's not enough. More, I implored. I wanted more, more, more. I'd shred the dress to pieces if I had to. As he rocked his hips in one firm motion that made me see the stars, his lips found mine again, muffling another of my moans. You are killing me, Catalina, he said against my lips. My hold on his neck tightened, trying to bring him even closer. More. I know, he gritted out, and with another motion of his hips, he positioned himself right against my crease, almost tipping me over the edge. Aaron pressed himself against me, the heat of his hardness furiously seeping through the layers of clothing between us. More, I begged again. I wasn't ashamed. I'd do it again and again and again. So demanding, a husky chuckle caressed my lips. If I snuck my hand under your dress, Aaron rasped against my mouth, rocking against me and throbbing between my legs. How wet would I find you, baby? He wouldn't believe just how much. I didn't think I'd ever been this turned on, this aroused, this recklessly desperate for more. Aaron grazed my lips with his, the touch barely enough to appease me. I'm not going to do that. His voice was husky, bathed in the need I felt washing over my body. Not now. Why? I breathed out. Because I wouldn't be able to help myself, he growled in my ears. He rocked his hips against me once more, pressing me harder against the coarse surface behind my back. And the first time I'm inside of you, it's not going to be a quick fuck against a wall. I whimpered at his words, at the loss of not having what he had just painted so clearly in my head. I'd give him anything to have him bury himself deep inside me. Perhaps that way, I wouldn't feel this void in the center of my chest. His forehead came to rest on top of mine again. Every motion came to a painful stop. I'd die a happy man if I could make you come right here and now, Aaron whispered, making me shiver. But anyone could walk by and see us, and that's a privilege I want for just myself. Sighing, I trailed my fingers through his hair and then around his neck until coming to cup his jaw. Slowly, I came to my senses. You are right. My lips puckered, pouting. Blue eyes that shone like they had never done before crinkled with a smile. Look at that, he said before kissing me, way too briefly and for me to be anywhere satisfied. 
I will get foolish, crazy ideas if you start agreeing with me so easily. That got my pout to fall just a smidgen, and perhaps a small smile peeked out. And just as I was considering puckering my lips again, remembering how hot and bothered I still was, his head dipped again, and he kissed the remainder of that pout off my face. Let's go. Your family is probably wondering where we are. He slowly dropped me to the floor. Then he brushed his fingers over a few strands of hair that had come out of place, the back of his hand grazing my cheek before he stepped back. Perfect, he said, looking me up and down. And the word traveled straight to the middle of my chest. He offered his hand, and I took it before it hovered in the air for a complete second. I was a needy woman, it seemed. And when it came to Aaron, I'd take from him as much as he was willing to give me. And then, perhaps, I'd beg for more. Chapter 23 Ignited. That was exactly how I felt. It was what Aaron had done to me. He had lit me up, unraveled something that I realize now had been humming beneath my skin for a long time. Everything rioting deep inside of me hadn't been shaped out of just a few moments or an impossibly loud physical connection. What caused this uprising had already been there, buried. I had kept it submerged under the weight of buts, fears, and doubts, pushed down by my own stubbornness, too. But now that it had burst out, resurfacing and streaming out of me, mixed with need and want, and something that was exhilaratingly and absolutely terrifying, I knew that I had reached a point of no return. I wouldn't be able to push it down, shove it aside, or ignore it any longer. And I didn't think I wanted to. Not after having a taste of what could be mine. And I wasn't talking just about Aaron's lips. For the first time since we landed in Spain, every touch, look, smile, or word was real. After that kiss, every time Aaron grazed my arm with the back of his hand, it was because he wanted to. Every time he brushed a kiss on my shoulder, it was because he wasn't capable of helping himself. And every time he gathered me close and whispered something in my ear, it wasn't because my family was looking and we had a role to play. It was because he wanted me to hear how beautiful he thought I looked and how lucky he felt to have me in his arms. We danced for hours, this time with nothing hanging over our heads, and I kissed that smile that was only for me. More than once. I simply couldn't help myself. Tonight, I had decided I'd stay in our bubble and deal with what awaited us in New York when we got there. Tonight was ours. Aaron closed the door of the room behind him, and I couldn't help but stare at him from my position at the end of the bed. We had just gotten to the apartment, and I had decided to give a rest to my wobbly legs and hurting feet while he fetched some water from the kitchen. One of his arms was behind his back, making me tilt my head with curiosity. He smiled when he revealed what was in his hand. I almost screamed at him to stop going after my poor, weak heart, because it wouldn't survive. A donut, glazed and filled with chocolate cream. They had served them as a snack late in the night, and I had probably eaten more than I should have. Aaron Blackford, I said, feeling as if something were being squashed in the vicinity of my heart. Did you smuggle donuts out of the wedding in your pocket? His smile had turned into a grin, a bashfully, unassumingly handsome grin, and my poor chest squeezed some more. I knew you'd be hungry. I am, I admitted, my voice sounding all wrong. Thank you. He strode across the room and placed the donut on a napkin on top of the dresser. I took the chance to tell my heart to chill the hell out before it was too late and we both went down. Aaron turned as if he knew I needed one more minute to gather myself. But instead of doing that, I gawked at his back, watched how he shed himself of his suit jacket and delicately placed it on the only chair in the room. Dangerous thoughts started piling up in my head, traveling to the bottom of my stomach. When Aaron finally faced me, just as he was undoing the knot of his tie, those dangerous, reckless thoughts were probably displaying all over my face. Our gazes connected, and an uncontrollable blush rose up my neck, reaching my cheeks. Ironic how I had been devouring his lips hours ago, and now a simple look turned me inside out. 
Restless and flushed, I averted my gaze and leaned, reaching for my right foot. My fingers were clumsy as they worked at the strap of the beautiful yet painful high-heeled shoe. Exhaling with frustration, I fumbled with a thin band tied around my ankle for an embarrassing amount of time. I sensed Aaron coming closer, right to where I was, sitting on the bed as I unsuccessfully tried to untie the clasps of my right heel. If he found my predicament funny or ridiculous, he didn't say. Instead, he knelt on the floor in front of me and placed his palm over my hands, bringing my attempts to a halt. Let me, he said, please. I did. I was beginning to understand that I'd let him do almost anything if he asked. Aaron's strong fingers unclasped the fine straps and slowly slipped the shoe off, killing me with a tenderness I would never, not in a lifetime, have enough of. His hand captured my foot, placing it on top of his thigh. Simply that gesture, the contact of my soul on his leg, had the power to undo me. And it did. It cracked me wide open as Aaron's fingers slid to my ankle, kneading and easing the tension away as they went, robbing me of my breath. Those hands, what those hands could do to me if the simplicity of what he was doing sent bolts of electricity up my leg straight to that neglected point low in my belly. The enemy that my own mind could sometimes be decided that this was a good moment to remind me that it had been a long time since I had been intimate with someone. And Aaron, well, one just needed to look at him to know that he probably had more experience than me. Anybody would. I had barely dated after Daniel and... Relax. A deep voice jerked me back to the moment. Aaron's fingers were still delicately rubbing my right ankle, softening the stiff muscles. I don't expect a single thing from you tonight, Catalina. He looked up at me. Our gazes met. There was only earnestness in the blue of his eyes. Earlier when I kissed you, I let myself get carried away. Came on a little too strong, and I apologize. My lips parted, but nothing came out. You have to say something, baby. You're very quiet, and that's starting to freak me out. Baby. That baby did things to me. I liked it. Far too much. You have nothing to apologize for. I tried really hard to swallow all those stupid insecurities. So don't apologize, please. I looked into his eyes. You were perfect. You really are. That last part left my lips as nothing more than a whisper. The blue in Aaron's eyes simmered, darkened with determination. It stayed that way for a moment that stretched and stretched until he cleared his throat and resumed his work. Turning to my other foot, he repeated the process, leaving the left stiletto where the other one rested on the floor. He massaged my left heel, his fingertips making their way up my ankle too. And only after he finished kneading the muscles and tendons there, he spoke. All set. Let's get you out of that dress, and you'll be ready for bed. And that was what did it. His unassuming words, the tenderness with which he had bared my feet, and the way he looked up at me from his position on the floor, as if his only goal here was making sure I was cared for. All of it broke something inside of me. I swore I even heard the cracking sound, slicing the silence in the room in two. No. His back straightened, his gaze rising until I level with me. Then tell me. His jaw hardened. Tell me what you want. Instead of voicing it, I reached out and placed my hand on the nape of his neck. I pulled, attempting to bring him closer, and Aaron let me allowing me to show him where I needed him. Our faces were mere inches away. My memory of the taste of his lips was almost too powerful for me to resist him any longer. Still on his knees, Aaron inched closer, placing his torso between my thighs and his hands on each of my sides, right next to my hips. What else? I could hear the need in his voice. I could almost taste it. Unable to stop myself, my fingertips pulled all the strands of raven hair at his neck. You, I told him with that tug, incapable to articulate a word. I need to hear you say it, he breathed into my lips, not closing the gap, still not sealing it. My other hand landed on his upper arm, and I noticed immediately how those toned muscles bunched beneath the fabric of his shirt, constrained, 
as if he was physically stopping himself from coming closer. Tell me what you want, he repeated, his voice almost breaking. You, I rasped out, a dam breaking. I want anything you're willing to give me. I needed him to inch closer, to eat the space between us and make it disappear, to come on top of me until the outlines of our bodies blurred. It's you I want. Never in my life had I imagined breathless words like mine would be the key to something so powerful. A growl escaped Aaron's body, his eyes turning feral. Hunger like I had never witnessed, not even earlier, when we had kissed, burrowed itself in Aaron's features, giving way to a pained expression. I'll give you the world, he said against my mouth. The moon, the fucking stars, anything you ask, it's yours. I'm yours. And then my world exploded. Aaron's mouth was against mine. Nothing soft about the branding contact. He parted my lips, his tongue plunging inside, while his hands slowly trailed up my back. He pulled me to him, leaving my ass resting on the edge of the bed. My legs went around his waist, a little too high to make the contact I craved the most, that I knew would make me see those stars he had just promised me. My head spun out of control the feel of his strong body between my thighs overwhelming, intoxicating, provoking. I wanted to stay right here forever, with Aaron on his knees and my body wrapped around him, with his lips against mine, his hands in my hair. No, I wanted more than that, but I needed all these clothes to go away first. Aaron pulled me closer into his chest, making my body turn, looking for the friction I ached for. Without breaking the kiss or his hold on my body, he stood up on strong legs, taking me up with him. Holding my legs around his waist, he positioned me exactly where I was coming out of my skin for him to be, sending a twirl of pleasure through every cell in my body at the maddening sensation of having his hardness nestled between my thighs. The warmth of his hands on my ass seeped through the clothing of my dress, the heat of his length throbbing against my center. Hot, so hot that my skin burned. In two strides, Aaron had me against the wall. He rocked against my center just once, and it ripped a pained whimper out of me. Tell me if you want me to stop. He gritted out against my lips, his body stiff and rock-like beneath my hands. Tell me what's okay for me to do. Pushing his hips into me to hold me against the wall and bringing to my sight a starry sky of delirium, he dragged his hands at my sides, stopping when he reached the swell of my breasts. His long fingers grazed the thin cloth covering them. Does this feel good, baby? He rasped. Nodding my head, I arched my back, pushing them against his hands, hands that didn't waste a second in accepting my offer. Aaron kneading my breasts leisurely, his thumb grazing over the fabric that covered my nipples. That urge of shredding my dress off my body returned with a vengeance, and I had to physically fight my hands from exposing my skin, so he'd touch me, not the stupid gown. Me, me, just me. As if he had just read my mind, Aaron's hands flew to my shoulders. He took hold of the straps of my dress, playing delicately with the fine material before asking, Can I bring these down? His watchfulness, his never-ending diligence at making sure I was comfortable kept tearing at something inside my chest, something I was afraid that once brought down wouldn't crystallize back as it had been ever again. Yes, I told him, hearing the urgency in my voice. Catching me completely off guard, instead of bringing the straps down, Aaron's hand slid to my waist, dislodging me from his body. He deposited me on the floor, and my fingertips drifted from his neck to his chest at the difference in height. Frowning at the loss, I looked up, Aaron's soft chuckle and radiant smile barely registered when those two large palms that rested on my hips turned me around, briskly. His hands fell flat on the wall. His breath caressed the back of my neck, launching a riot of shivers to gallop down my body. Strong fingers reached for the zipper of my dress, just above the small of my back. He brought it down, my underwear peeking out, if I recalled correctly how low that zipper went. I felt myself swallow, just as I heard a strangled sound leaving Aaron. His fingers slowly trailed up my spine, 
a flock of tingles taking flight. When he reached the straps at my shoulders, he pulled them down. The dress slid down my body and pulled on the floor, leaving me in nothing but my panties. And God, I had never been happier about wearing a dress with a built-in bra. Looking over my shoulder at him, I found a troubled expression marring his handsome face. Unconsciously, my body tried to turn, but Aaron's arms came around me. One hand landed on my stomach, while the other went to my hip. He pulled me into him, the heat of his whole body on my bare back, overrunning my senses. His chin dipped, falling on my shoulder. Give me a minute, he breathed into my ear. After a few seconds of neither of us moving an inch, just taking it all in, I felt his lips on my neck. I'm trying to take it slow, Lena. I swear I am, he continued, his hand drifting up my stomach. His thumb grazed the skin of my breast. But you are driving me right out of my mind. That fingertip brushed over my nipple, eliciting a deep moan out of me, earning me one of his in return. And the hand that rested on my hip slid down to my thigh, close to the edge of my panties, just a few inches from the point where all this heat running through my body gathered. I'm dying to learn every inch of skin on your body. He took my nipple between his index finger and thumb and pulled softly. I whimpered, demolished, devastated. To memorize you? His voice danced with the same desperation rushing down my belly. Do you want that? Yes. My voice sounded brittle, just as much as my sanity if he denied me. I need you to touch me. Aaron grumbled, his chest rumbling with the sound. My hands flew back, landing on his shoulders, and arching my body for his taking. His arm pulled me closer, my backside flush against him. He rocked his hips, and then his hand trilled up and down my thigh. Open for me, he demanded into my neck, while pushing my legs open with his knee from behind, widening my stance so it granted him easier access. Let's finally see how wet you are. His fingers snuck under the edge of my panties, grazing the hair and skin there, and making my legs wobble at the pleasure of the powerful contact. Aaron's hold on my hip tightened, pulling my back against his hard length, and I felt it pulsating against my skin, even through the fabric of his pants. Continuing his path, his fingers finally reached my wet folds, pressing for just an instant and then gliding down slowly. My lips parted as a moan climbed out of my body, I hadn't been this wet or turned on in my entire life. Fuck, Aaron's curse wasn't more than a rasp. Is this all for me? If I managed to whimper an affirmative reply, I couldn't know. I just guessed that whatever my answer had been, it satisfied Aaron. Because his fingers moved up and down my folds, coating everything in my pleasure, turning my blood into molten lava. If I slide my fingers inside your pussy, I'm going to lose control, he told me in a deep and inky voice, a warning, a promise. Is that something you're ready for? His thumb started circling my clit, almost bringing me to my knees. My back arched. Aaron, his voice lowered even further. That's not an answer, baby. His fingers increased their pace, making me lightheaded. Do you want me to get you off and hold you until you fall asleep? His other hand rose to my breast, teasing my nipple. Or do you want me to claim it with my cock? So commanding and yet so fucking thoughtful. Cherishing me, ravishing me, he was everything I needed, everything my body craved and my heart had been missing. For what I would soon learn was the last time tonight, I told him what he demanded to hear, the truth that I had kept under key deep inside. I'm ready, Aaron. I brought my hand to his, which was partly covered by my panties. Take me, all of me. I tightened my hold on him and pressed both our hands against my center. Claim me. Aaron didn't lose any time. One of his fingers slid inside me in one swift motion, a moan forming in the depths of my chest at the blissful invasion. God, it had been so long since nothing but my own fingers had been there. You are drenched, baby, all for me, Aaron kept thrusting inside 
adding a second finger and bringing bright little spots to the backs of my eyes. All of you, mine. Something started unraveling, cracking me wide open, tilting my body toward the edge. Aaron, this, this is too much. Panting, I was panting as I lost control over my body. It's not too much. This is what real feels like, he murmured against my neck as his other hand grazed one of my breasts. I was so close to toppling over. A million different sorts of sensations cascaded down my body, spreading from every point where Aaron was touching me, tattooing my skin. The way he thrust his fingers inside of me, or how he played with the tips of my breasts. The rocking of his hips against my backside, in sync with the plunging of his hand. It was all too much. Too much. That's it. I can feel your pussy gripping my fingers. His words pushed me a little closer to the edge, every single second of this blissful torture blinding me with more pleasure. Ride them, baby. Come on them. And I did. Oh, God, I did. I tipped over the edge. My head went spinning. My limbs were robbed of all strength. And while I moaned and whimpered senseless words mixed with Aaron's name, his fingers kept driving inside of me dragging it out, walking me through it until eventually, slowing down and coming to a stop over my still pulsating center. After what could have been a couple of seconds or a few minutes, Aaron extricated his fingers from me. Tipping my head to the side, I looked up because I wanted to see his face, his handsome face and ocean blue eyes. I found him gazing down at me with a smile that was new. It was one that I had never seen one mixed with hunger and need and something else, something more powerful than all that. As I eyed him, probably with a spent and blissful look on my face, I watched how he lifted the fingers that had been inside of me moments ago and introduced them into his mouth. His eyes closed and his face contorted into an expression I would never forget. An expression that would be branded in my mind for the rest of my goddamn life and that would haunt me in the wet dreams I'd start having now. Aaron grunted, opening his eyes back and finding mine. I could come just with your taste, with you in my arms like this. So primal, so basic, so hot. I couldn't begin to articulate an answer, to move. He must have seen that because one of his arms went below my legs and the other around my back. Picking me up from the floor, he carried me to the bed and placed me on top of the velvety linen. Aaron stood to one side of the bed, his fingers flying at the buttons of his shirt. One of them unclasped, his chest peeking out of the fabric. My hands itched to touch him. That was what tore through my absorption. I wouldn't let him get that away from me. I wanted the privilege of undressing him. Crawling across the bed as my gaze zeroed in on that next button, I made my way to him, straightening on my knees when I reached him. I want to do this. My hands replaced his, taking infinite pleasure in every little button that came undone under my fingers. One by one, I worked down his torso, feeling how Aaron's chest swayed up and down, his breath coming in and out heavily. When I was done, I shed him of his shirt, discarding it on the floor. If I had thought his chest was flawless the day I had seen it for the first time, now, with everything else, with every powerful emotion humming under my skin, it was simply heavenly. My palms landed on that taut skin, and I was catapulted straight into heaven. My fingertips memorized every mount and valley, every inch of skin that seemed to have been sculpted in stone. Tight, smooth, glorious. All of him for me. Grazing my nails down his chest, I reached his stomach. Aaron shivered under my touch. Not satisfied, I slid my fingers further down, following the thin line of dark hair. Enthralled, my gaze devoured every one of my emotions. God, there wasn't enough time in a lifetime for me to get tired of this sight, of him under my hands. Reaching the button of his pants, I looked up, just in time to watch Aaron's jaw bunching the blue in his eyes glazing. My fingertips brushed lower, feeling him thick and hot through the dark fabric of his suit. He grunted, pushing his hips up into my hands. 
My knees wobbled under my weight, my head lighter as I grazed my palm over him. Aaron's head dipped, his lips falling on my temple, brushing a kiss there. His hands came up and landed on top of mine. Fumbling with the button together, we undid it. Next was the zipper, and I hesitated, froze. Even if I felt like I would implode if I didn't bring that zipper down, I hesitated. My fingers shook with the thought, we're doing this, and fuck, this feels like more than sex. It feels like so much more. What's wrong, baby? Aaron whispered against my temples. Looking up, I searched his face. How could I tell him that all my bravado had somehow died, that my hands shook with need, but that I realized I didn't really know what I was doing, what we were doing? Aaron released a breath, his jaw setting with decision. Something clicked behind his eyes. He took both my hands in his and placed them above his chest. My heart is beating a million miles an hour, too. Do you feel that? I nodded my head, some of my fear dissipating. Then he brought my hands against his hard length. Do you feel this too, Lena? Do you feel how hard I am in my pants? He punctuated both his questions by thrusting his hips into my palms. I exhaled through my nose at the throbbing contact. Yes, it's all because of you. It's you who makes my cock this hard. And it's you who makes my heart want to break out of my chest with a brief touch or a simple look. But it's nothing to be scared of. We are in this together, remember? His words fueled something inside of me, unearthing the need from beneath my sudden insecurities, my doubts, my fears. I dipped my head, placing a kiss above his heart. We are. Then my hand moved over the fabric of his pants, palming his length very slowly. Aaron groaned, and I felt his lips falling on my temple again. He placed an encouraging kiss there. Take me out. I obliged. I was at his mercy. I'd do anything if he asked. So I unzipped his pants, zeroing in on the bulge contained in his boxers. Following his demand, I slid down both his pants and underwear, just enough so his length sprang free. My fingers circled him, giving him one single stroke. A strangled sound emerged from Aaron's body. Jesus, that feels so good. Stroking him once again, I relished in the feel of his cock between my fingers, smooth and hard, throbbing under my touch. I wondered how it'd feel under my tongue. Following my hasty impulse, I leaned down, hearing Aaron's gasp at my sudden change in position. I placed my lips on his shaft, circling him then with my mouth, making contact with my tongue. God, all the blood in my body pulled down in my center my need pulsating and piercing every one of my senses. Taking hold of my hair, Aaron pulled delicately. Baby. He tugged at my hair again. This time his hips reared back, just enough to make me stop. I want this, I do, but I'm not going to come in your mouth tonight. Moving his hands to my shoulders, he pulled me up. In a deliriously swift move, he had me on my back. In another one, he got rid of his pants and boxers. Aaron is naked. Every single thing about him was solid and delectable, big, powerful, perfect, and all for me. My breath hitched at the thought. Hungry blue eyes, which I would gladly get lost in, swiped up and down my body as I lay on the bed, just as I wanted to learn by heart the lines delineating his flexed arms and chest memorize that jutting thickness that had me licking my lips, commit to memory those powerful thighs that had always driven me crazy. I wanted to tattoo all of it in my mind, keep it forever. Aaron walked to his toiletry bag, which rested atop the small dresser in front of the bed, and grabbed a foil package. Walking up to the bed, he let the condom fall on top of the covers right beside me. I followed all his movements, enthralled, unable to move myself. Looking down at me with burning intensity, Aaron brought his hand to his length and pumped his hardness. One hard pump. I don't know how I'm going to take this slow, he rasped, giving his cock another rough and hard thrust with his fist. Then don't, 
I begged, eating up the image before me, stopping myself from pouncing on him. Don't take it slow. I want all of you, all around me, inside of me, everywhere. Before my own words registered, Aaron was on top of me, his mouth devouring mine, devouring me, his hips between my open legs, which I had wrapped around his waist, his pulsating thickness nestled against me. These need to come off now, Aaron grated in my ear as his fingers fumbled with the flimsy fabric of my panties. Next thing I knew, they were on the floor, and Aaron was settled between my thighs once more, nothing between us, right where I needed him, where he seemed to belong. He went on his knees, granting me the view of his large and hard body. The pace of my breath increased, the blood swirled. Reaching for the condom, he ripped open the foil and rolled it down his length, his eyes remaining on mine. You are the most beautiful thing I've ever seen lying right there, all for me. His gaze softened, reaching into my heart and pulling something out, leaving a little hole behind, one that I wasn't sure I'd ever be able to fill again. Aaron bent down, his lips falling somewhere beside my hips, grazing the skin all the way to the junction of my thighs. He placed a kiss there, then another, and another one. He grunted and then dipped lower, as if he couldn't stop himself, his tongue delving into my center. The contact was brief, but it sent my senses flying, a moan breaking out of me. Pleasure erupted out of that point, spreading out like electricity, snapping every nerve ending in my body. Aaron's reaction was immediate, his whole body coming alive, bustling. His lips made their way up my body, leaving a trail of charring kisses, brushing soft kisses along my jaw, neck, and shoulders. And when his weight finally settled over me, I could only reach for his face with my hands. Bringing him to my mouth, I kissed him, slowly but intently, leaving both of us panting. Aaron, I whispered between heavy breaths, is this real? I couldn't believe it. It felt like a dream, like I would wake up at any moment. Aaron looked into my eyes, probably peeking into a place deep within me, one that I didn't have access to myself. But in return, he granted me that access himself. Everything we felt, all that had been buried and denied, surfaced, bared. We were stripped of all pretenses before the other, exposed. This is as real as it gets, as anything will ever be. He brushed a kiss against the corner of my lips. His words, the raw openness in the blue of his gaze, and the heat of his body, the way it wrapped around me, all of it made my heart burst, made every cell in my body shake violently and blow up into a million fragments. Aaron must have felt the same, because our bodies emerged from the fog and went into a frenzy. His fingers and tongue outlined my body, lips, neck, collarbone, breasts. Everything burned under Aaron's lips. His hips rocked against my core, pushing his length between my legs, the tip sliding down with every sway of his body until reaching my entrance. When he lifted his mouth from my seared skin, his gaze returned to my eyes, asking permission without words. Yes, yes, I accompanied my answer with a push of my hips into him. Please. I breathed, pushing again, feeling how his cock slid inside me just a sliver. Not enough. Placing a kiss on my collarbone, Aaron finally pressed into me. One slow and deep thrust, filling me completely and sending my head, my body, my soul to a whole new galaxy. God, I whimpered, blissfully full. Aaron's grunt fell against my temple. Oh, fuck, baby. His hips rocked, retreating and sliding back in with more force now, eliciting a cry of pleasure from me. His mouth nuzzled my neck. That sound, Catalina. He thrust in again. It's going to be my end. Another one followed. My hands flew to his hair, pulling it with my fingers, goading him to lose the remains of his restraint. And he did. With another grunt, Aaron thrust into me harder, pushing my whole body up. I moaned, certain I'd drown in the waves of pleasure rocking my body. Grab onto the headboard, Aaron growled, taking hold of my wrists and bringing them up himself. 
I obeyed, closing my fists around the bars, hoping they'd resist our attack. I need this, I whimpered, need more. Aaron rocked into me as he braced himself on the headboard. His pace gave away all remnants of control. You need me, he grunted, thrusting into me even faster. My back arched in return. He plunged into me hard. Then he did it again, harder. It's me you need. God, did he know. Wasn't it painfully obvious that I did? Another brisk thrust. Say it. Yes, I moaned, my body losing all its strength under the waves of pleasure. You, Aaron, I need you. That last word broke the thin grasp of sanity he had seemed to be holding on to, and his thrusts lost all sense of rhythm. They came harder, faster, deeper, all of it at once. Aaron rocked into me with abandon. Our flesh clashed together while I remained holding on to the headboard and watched his body move around me. His cock slid in and out of me, the muscles of his abs flexing, his powerful shoulders bunched, all of it jamming me closer and closer to the edge. I want to feel you milking me, baby, he said before stealing my mouth. One of his hands flew to my breasts, closing over my rosy peak. Come for me, he demanded in a husky voice. Come on my cock. His words, his feral rhythm, his body pinning mine, all of it made my eyelids flutter shut. My blood burned, blazed with every thrust. A desperate plea escaped my lips. Aaron. Look at me. I want you to look at me. He lifted my weight, placing me against his chest. He moved me, burrowing himself into me from below, lifting and pressing me into him. Wrapping my arms around his neck, I felt the high coming alive. I tugged at his hair, hard. Aaron pulled both my arms behind my back, securing my wrists with one hand. My back arched. Look at you, at my mercy. He increased the rhythm of my hips of the way he jerked me onto his cock. Just where I've wanted you all this time. One deep and hard thrust after, Aaron's jaw tightened at the same time his other hand reached between us, his fingers landing above the spot where we were connected, circling, rubbing. And before I could do anything about it, I was sent flying right at the same time as I felt Aaron pulsating his release inside of me. My name left him in an animalistic growl. Pure, unadulterated bliss shocked me as the motion of his hips continued, his thrusts growing slower, riding us both through the climax. His arms tightened around me, his face burrowed in my neck, the outline of our bodies a blur until his hips came to a stop. We remained there suspended in time, the beating of our hearts against each other's skin and the soothing rhythm of his pulse under my touch. Eventually, Aaron pulled out of me and laid us on our sides, his arms still wrapped around me. He nestled me against his chest, and I knew I was ruined for any other embrace. Nothing else would ever compare. He brushed a kiss against my neck, then one against my temple, leaving his lips there for a long moment. Was that too much? I turned my face into his chest and placed my lips above his heart. No, never. And I meant it. I, I trailed off, my voice turning into a whisper. I liked how you lost control. I liked it a lot. Careful. I felt his hand on my hair, his palm brushing down the tousled locks. If you get any more perfect, I'm going to believe you were made just for me. My lips curled up in a giddy smile with a thought, and I had to press my mouth into his chest so I wouldn't say what was on my mind. Keep me. It's the least you can do if I was. After a few minutes, Aaron shifted, my arms locked tighter around his neck. I need to take care of the condom, baby. He tried pushing away, but I refused to let him go. His chuckle came light and sunny, and just like a blow to the chest, it distracted me enough for him to slip out. I whimpered, disappointed and cold. I guessed I was a greedy woman when it came to cuddles. Or perhaps it was when it came to him. I'll be back before you blink, promise. 
Luckily for him, he was. And the sight he treated me to as he strolled flawlessly naked across the room helped his case. Once back on the bed, he wrapped himself around me, tucking me to his side. He pulled the light comforter over us and hummed with deep, sultry content. Yep, I thought, same here. See, he said against my hair, not even a full minute. I sighed into his chest. I'm needy, okay, I admitted unashamed. And I'm not talking just snuggles needy. I'm spider monkey needy. I made my point, throwing my leg over his and my arm over his chest, tangling our bodies in a way that I guessed wasn't anywhere close to being cute. Somehow, even with my face buried in his neck, I knew he was smiling. Then his chest rumbled, confirming that he wasn't just doing that. Are you laughing at my misfortune? I wouldn't dare. Just enjoying you being all greedy with me, spider monkey. His palm trailed down my spine, stopping at my backside. He squeezed. But if you don't behave, we will never manage to get any sleep tonight. And as devastating as it is, I only had that condom. My grip on him loosened a little. Did you expect this to happen? I asked, thinking of him slipping a condom in his luggage. A rush of anticipation rose beneath my skin. No, he answered softly, his fingers making their way up my neck. But I'm not going to lie to you. A big part of me hoped it would, and maybe that's why I left it in. It had been there forever anyway, so I thought it wouldn't hurt. I'm happy you did, I told him truthfully, and his hand came to rest at the nape of my neck. His fingers slipped in, tangling with my hair. It's too bad you didn't think of throwing in more. The sound that came out of Aaron's throat gave me life. Oh, yeah? Instead of answering what I hoped was a rhetorical question, because how could I not mourn the loss of more mind-blowing sex like that, a different question popped up in my mind. Can I ask you something? I ventured, leaning back so I could look at his face. Aaron's head tilted back, too, finding my eyes. You can ask me anything. How in the world is your Spanish so good? His lips tugged sheepishly. Seriously, I continued, grilling him for an answer. I had no idea you spoke a word of Spanish. You never told me you were so good at it. I watched his eyes sparkle at the compliment. I liked putting that there, just as much as I liked making him smile. To think that you might have understood all the names I called you? He sighed, his cheeks turning a little pink. I really didn't. What do you mean? You said everything had to go absolutely perfectly. I searched his face for the meaning behind that. So you just, what, started a crash course before flying here? It had been a joke, but Aaron shrugged his shoulders. Understanding sank in slowly. Oh my God, you did, I said under my breath. For me, he did that for me. It's not like I had never learned Spanish before, I did, in school. He reached for my hair again, playing absently with a strand curling it around his index finger. And now there's an app for anything. I learned enough to make a good impression. I still have a long way to go. Something must have been plastered all over my face, something I hoped wasn't the adoration I felt for him in that precise moment, because Aaron's eyes seemed oddly interested in studying me. Then, he brought me even closer to his chest, tucked me securely against him, and placed a kiss on my shoulder. I melted onto that brush of his lips like butter left under the sun. I bet I'm still missing all the interesting vocabulary, he added, sounding thoughtful. He brushed another kiss on my shoulder. The best words. Oh, my lips curled up, interested in the direction the conversation was taking. You want me to teach you all the dirty words? I looked up at him and wiggled my eyebrows. Aaron gave me a lopsided smile that would have made my panties drop to the floor had they been resting on my hips. Well, you are in luck. I'm a wonderful teacher. And I am a highly dedicated student. He winked, and that goddamn wink disrupted the beating of my heart. Although I might get a little distracted every now and then. I see. I placed my index finger against his chest, watching Aaron's eyes dive down quickly before returning to my face. Maybe you need the right kind of motivation to keep your attention on the subject. I trailed that finger up, 
traveling across his peck and then up his neck, following the line of his jaw until reaching his lips. They parted with a shallow breath. This, I pushed myself up and kissed his lips gently. This is a six-letter word in Spanish. Labios, tus labios, your lips. The only answer he gave me was taking my mouth in his again, as if the only way he'd learn the word was tasting it. And this, I said before parting his lips and making the kiss deeper, our tongues dancing together, is another six-letter word. Lengua, tongue. I think I really like that one. Aaron's head dipped low, his new favorite word reaching my breast. And this? What do you call this? He said, grazing his mouth over the peak. A giggle that soon turned into a moan left my mouth before I was able to answer. That's a five-letter word. Beson, nipple. Aaron hummed while his lips traveled up my chest, placing soft kisses on his way. So, we have worked on six and five letter words. He placed more of those pecks on my skin. Just for the sake of sticking to your method, we should go over four letter words. Would you teach me one? Aaron's wish fell against my skin. A four letter word. It shouldn't have been complicated. There were probably thousands of four letter words in my mother tongue. But my mind was a treacherous thing and it betrayed me, often and the only word I could think of was a very particular one. One that, despite not being too long, was powerful enough to change things, to change people's lives, to move mountains and start wars. It was a big word that I had promised myself I wouldn't give anybody without being sure I meant it with every molecule in my body, without being sure I was safe. My silence seemed to give Aaron the perfect opportunity to keep exploring my skin his mouth causing my heart to pound against my chest. I don't know, I murmured distractedly, scared and turned on, too. More kisses were brushed against my skin, making me fight to catch my breath. It's okay, he said, like he really meant it. We can break the rules. That's the magic in being us, the ones making them. He took my mouth keenly, getting me out of my head for a blissful moment. And when we came up for air, his head dipped one more time, placing an open-mouthed kiss above my heart. Corazon, he said softly, so softly that the word seeped into my blood, mixing with my own so it would never be able to leave. Heart, that's your heart, seven letters. Looking into his eyes for a long moment, I swore I could see in them everything he wasn't voicing. I'll make it mine and everything I wasn't brave enough to say. Take it. When Aaron finally spoke, it sounded like a promise. I'll earn my four-letter word. And there wasn't a doubt in my mind that he would. But at what cost? Chapter 24 The experience of waking up next to Aaron that following morning had absolutely nothing to do with the two other times I had opened my eyes to find him lying in the same bed. For one, we were naked. Something I thought I could quickly get used to. Effortlessly. Then there was this teeny tiny thing that separated this morning from the previous ones. A technicality, really. And that was the beaming grin already on my face. It was stupidly wide, and I was afraid I might have slept with it. Ridiculous, I knew. But who had the time to be embarrassed when Aaron Blackford was right there, all big and naked and ready to be eaten? Not me. And not when something definitely not tiny was throbbing against my thigh. Aaron grunted, shifting and pushing that pulsating part of his body into me. Ah, hello, new favorite limb. Morning. He rasped. His voice was thick with sleep, begging me to snuggle into him. Mmm, I managed to answer. It was terribly rude of me, but I was busy with more important stuff, like learning every inch of his chest with my hands, or the abs that topped his stomach, and the narrow trail of dark hair. Yes, I needed to get well acquainted with that, too. Your parents are picking us up soon he told me almost breathlessly. Yep, I was aware. 
but one hour is 60 minutes, and if we manage to pack our suitcase in five and shower in three, that leaves us 52 whole minutes. Time I was planning to spend learning more of Aaron's body. One can do many things with so many minutes. It's all about time management. My fingers continued their pathway down, 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 finally closing around his length. Aaron pushed his hips up into my palm. Baby. The words sounded strangled, but I continued palming his hardness up and down. Do you want to kill me? He kept asking me that as if I had the answer. No? I rasped, my focus completely gone. Yes? His hips thrust into my hand. What was the question? Aaron groaned, and his hand came to rest on the small of my back, pulling me to his side, hard, making me straddle his hip. Unconsciously, instinctively, I rocked against him, looking for release, just like Aaron was doing into my hand. At that moment, I was starting to consider the possibility of forgetting about my suitcase, my parents, our flight back, work, life, and basically anything outside this bed, anything that wasn't Aaron. I simply didn't care enough. And the next thing I knew, we were up in the air. Well, I was. With my body in his arms, Aaron crossed the distance to the end suite bathroom in a few long strides. He turned the shower on without placing me on the floor. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but 52 minutes is not nearly enough time for what I want to do to you, so we'll have to multitask, he explained, placing me under the stream of hot water. His eyes roamed up and down my body, hunger obscuring the blue in them. Time management and multitasking. I told him, watching him step inside the shower with me. You have an impressive resume, Mr. Blackford. His hands came to rest on my hips, the grip of his fingers demanding, desperate. And I don't shy away from a challenge. Please add that in there, too. His body pressed mine against the cold, smooth tiles. I'll just have to make you come with my tongue while we shower. My new favorite word peeked out, traveling along his lower lip. Hot fucking damn. And made me while we pack. All of it under 52 minutes, but I'm pretty sure I'll manage. Oh, boy. And did he ever. Against all odds, we had made it on time. Turned out that Aaron's soft skills were really that impressive. My parents drove us to the airport with more than enough extra time to have breakfast in the terminal before boarding. Once in the plane, Aaron's arm draped around my shoulders, and I snuggled right into his side. My head rested in the crook of his neck, his delicious scent engulfing me and causing a multitude of happy sighs to leave my lips. The feeling of this new sense of normalcy that had been born between us calmed me enough to knock me out, even before takeoff. It wasn't until we touched American ground that a familiar alarm went off in my head. The conversation. If I were smart, I would have used that large amount of time we had been confined in the same space to have one. We needed to draw lines, to define the box whatever this thing between us was, to decide what to do about it. Because while I wouldn't normally feel that kind of pressure, Aaron wasn't just anybody. He wasn't a man I had started casually dating, or one I had a night of amazing mind-blowing sex with. He was Aaron, my Aaron, my work colleague soon my boss. And that screamed to take a different approach to this. Whatever he wanted it to be. Whatever we wanted to make it. But for that, we needed to talk. His hand came to rest at the small of my back, his thumb brushing a circle over my t-shirt. I looked up at him, finding his gaze already on me. Damn, those eyes of his were quickly becoming my favorite thing in the world. Even more so than triple chocolate brownies. We had just crossed the arrivals gate, so we found ourselves in the middle of the terminal, on New York soil, only a few feet from what awaited us outside the airport, whatever that was. Lena, he said softly. Judging by the way he had uttered my name, the weight with which he had said it, I knew he was going to tell me something important. But that simple word, my name, not Catalina, but Lena, from his lips said things to me to my chest, to my head. I love hearing that, 
My name. My confession left my lips quietly, as if it were meant to be just a thought. You don't call me Lena nearly enough. Aaron looked into my eyes for a long moment, not speaking, not acknowledging my fleeting comment. It wasn't until I thought he wasn't going to say anything at all that we would walk out of that airport in silence and continue our merry separate ways that he spoke. Come home with me, to my place. Caught off guard, I blinked. In stunned silence, I thought about how I would love nothing more than to spend more time with him, to get lost in him for a little longer before having to go back to real life. Before we had to talk, have the conversation that would consolidate or not every single thing that had changed between us. A conversation I feared more and more with every passing minute. I wanted to take the leap, badly, but my experience told me otherwise, warning me not to make the same mistake twice. And I knew deep in my bones that recovering from that, from losing Aaron, or from possibly ruining years of hard work under dirty and unfair accusations, if history was to repeat itself, would not be easy. It would be the hardest thing I'd have to do in my life. I already knew. As all that swirled in my head, I watched something that looked a lot like trepidation, fear, dance in Aaron's features. Come with me, Lena. My eyelids shut briefly. I'll feed you. Make sure we stay awake so the jet lag doesn't last for the rest of the week. Tomorrow, early in the morning, we'll drive to your apartment so you can grab whatever you need, and then we'll head to work. He paused. Together. It sounded like a dream. Just like him. He had to be if he thought he had to convince me to go with him anywhere. I wanted to so badly. I'd follow him anywhere if he asked, but, but, there was always a but, wasn't there? Aaron, I breathed. I'm going to be very honest with you. I owed him, and me, and us, at least that. I'm scared, terrified. You were going to be promoted to my division leader. And that's going to change things. I switched my gaze to his chest. There was too much in his eyes. They distracted me, stole away my sanity. We are not in Spain any longer. This is real life, and this, I waved a hand between us, is going to complicate things. Or perhaps it was the other way around. Him being promoted to a position above me would complicate whatever this could be. He snatched my hand and brought it to his chest, so warm and firm so full of all the things I wanted but was terrified to reach for. We'll talk about it. Later, once we have cleaned up and I have you comfortable and relaxed. His other hand came to my chin, tilting my head back so he could peer into my eyes. And tomorrow, we'll talk to HR. We will ask Sharon if that gives you any peace of mind. Why? Why, world? Why did he have to be so thoughtful, so fucking perfect? But before doing that, you'll have to give us a chance. It was his turn for a shaky breath to leave his lips. Do you trust me? My hand, which still rested over his chest, right above his heart, fisted the fabric of his shirt, unable to do anything else but hold on to him. Take me home, Aaron Blackford. Staring at the screen of my phone, I deliberated for the hundredth time if I should reply to the message with the truth. She's gonna flip. She's going to kick my ass so hard that she'll send me right back to Spain. Lifting my gaze off the screen and looking at my reflection in the mirror, Aaron's bathroom mirror, I didn't like what I saw. It had nothing to do with the bags under my eyes or the messy knot that had been promoted to chaotic, probably somewhere across the Atlantic Ocean. What bothered me wasn't something I could point out with a finger or fix with a shower, a few hours of sleep, and a brush. Turning away, I leaned on the edge of the impressive and enticing bathtub, large enough to accommodate two errands, just like everything else in his apartment, spacious and luxurious in a very sober and tasteful way. It suited him so perfectly. I peered down at my phone again to reread her message. Rosie, are you back? How bad was it? Tell me everything in front of a coffee, or two, maybe three. How much is there to tell? Just as I finally worked up the courage to answer, three dots started dancing on the screen. Rosie, can I come by your apartment, bring the caffeine to you, in one hour, 30 minutes, now? 
I could picture my friend batting her eyelashes at me. Rosie had never drilled me so hard for a story. Lena, I'm not at my apartment. Rosie, still at the airport? I can come by later. Just give me a time. Taking a deep breath, I typed my answer. Lena, I don't think I'm going back to my place tonight. Three dots bounced back to life on the screen. She typed and typed and typed for a stupidly large amount of time. I frowned at my phone, bracing myself. Rosie, I knew it. A strangled sound climbed up my throat. That's all she was typing? Rosie, so? Spill it, type it, so I can tell you that I saw it coming. I chuckled under my breath. Had I been that blind? Lena, dot, dot, dot. Rosie, say it, say it out loud, say it. Lena, chill, Edward Cullen. Rosie, Catalina, if you don't start talking, I'm going to get pissed, and I never do that. You still don't know what a pissed Rosie looks like. Lena, Aaron's, I'm at Aaron's apartment. Rosie, of course you are, I want to know the rest. Lena, the rest? Rosie, a condensed version, for now. Lena, we sort of kissed, kind of slept together. Rosie, sort of, kinda? What does that even mean? Lena, I roll emoji. We did, kissed, had sex. Rosie, and? And so, so much more, I was about to type. But my thumbs froze above the screen. Ugh, then they worked at breakneck speed. Lena, and I'm a mess. I'm scared and giddy, stupidly happy too. And he's so good to me, so good that it feels like a dream I'm going to wake up from with cold sweat sticking to my skin. And you know how much I hate when that happens. Remember when I dreamed that I was getting raunchy with Joe Manganello and the fire alarm in my building went off right as he was unclasping his belt buckle and I was cranky for a whole month? Lena, this feels a million worlds better than that dream. Galaxies better. It was. And I wasn't just talking about the way my body seemed to come alive under his touch. Hell, that was the smallest part of all of this. Lena, I don't want to wake up, Rosie. Rosie, oh, sweetie. I could almost feel the hug that would have followed that. Lena, anyway, I'll tell you everything about it tomorrow. This wasn't a conversation we should be having via text anyway. Rosie, you'd better do that. Otherwise, I'll kick your ass. A knock came from the door. Baby, said a deep voice from the other side, the word making my heart pound. I'm going to start thinking that you're hiding from me. God, I sucked so much. Aaron continued, come out and let's get something to eat. You pick. My jet-lagged stomach grumbled at the thought. Even fish tacos? Especially fish tacos. Damn it, he was really going after my heart. Okay, one minute. I called as I typed another message to Rosie. Lena, gotta go. We are picking up takeout. Rosie, okay, but tomorrow you and I, we're talking. Lena, si, senorita. Rosie, and Lena? Rosie, it doesn't have to be a dream you need to wake up from. With that thought, no, with that hope, because that was exactly what I felt as I read my friend's message, foolish hope, I left my luscious and tiled hiding spot and went hunting for Aaron. I found him standing in his living room, looking out the industrial-style windows facing the waterfront. Aaron's apartment was in Dumbo, an area of Brooklyn I wasn't all that familiar with, but I was starting to love more and more. The place was incredible, spacious and stark, elegant but simple. Walking up to him, I peered out the massive windows myself. These views of the East River are breathtaking. I'm very lucky to be able to afford all this, he said, and he sounded thoughtful, more than he usually did. Turning and angling my body in his direction, I laid my back on the windows and faced him. How could I tell him that this view of him was just as beautiful? One simply didn't say stuff like that, so I limited myself to look and soak it all up. 
Aaron stared into the distance, the sunlight coming from the glass of the windows and kissing his skin, his blue eyes glinting under the light. But there was something on his mind. I could tell. Is everything all right? I reached out and placed my hand on his arm. Only then did he look at me. Come here. In a swift motion, he had me tucked against his chest. He squeezed me, swaying us. Better. Now everything is much better. I couldn't disagree with him. Anything that involved being in Aaron's arms was far better than anything that didn't. I let him tug a happy sigh out of me, and I reveled in the way he hummed when I squeezed him right back. When he finally released me, his gaze wandered out of the window again. But this time, it did so with a small smile on his face. Baby steps. My eyes somehow ended on an industrial-style console that perfectly complemented the vibe of the windows and the rest of the place. The only items on its surface were a framed photo and what looked like a textbook. Feeling curious about who was in that photo, I walked over to it and picked it up. A woman, a beautiful blue-eyed woman with raven hair and a smile I immediately recognized. My heart warmed. I felt his arm come around my arms, and then a kiss brushed against my hair. Letting my body fall into him, I asked, What was your mom's name? Dorothea. I felt his voice rumbling in his chest, right against my back. She used to complain about it constantly. She made everybody call her Thea. Tell me more about her, about your family. He released a breath, and it hit my hair with a puff. It was her grandmother's name. A pretentious old lady's name, my mom would say. Her side of the family was very wealthy, but always unfortunate when it came to their health. They called it a curse. He paused, sounding a little lost in his memories. When I was a kid, my mom was the only living member left, so I never met my grandparents. And when my mom passed away, the last one of the Abbots became me. So I inherited everything. That's how I can afford this place. That makes sense, I murmured. I considered myself lucky to work for a company like Intech, for having a good wage coming in every month. But this place belonged to a whole different kind of life, one where studio apartments could fit in bathrooms. So you don't really need to work a nine-to-five job? No, but I love what I do, even if some might call me a workaholic cyborg. I snickered. Oops, <laughs> I deserved that. I didn't think anyone at the office knew about this. Aaron had always been so private. But the fact that he didn't need to work and yet worked harder than the vast majority of us was commendable. It made me love him. Whoa, I shook my head. I have always admired you, you know. As much as I've bugged you for being so pragmatic and hard-headed, I have always, always admired you. I, he trailed off, sounding at a loss for a moment. Thank you, baby. I smiled as I put the frame back on top of the console. Your mom was beautiful. I can see where you got your looks from. Aaron chuckled softly. You think I'm beautiful? Of course. You are more than just beautiful. Don't sound so shocked. You know you are. I do. But I never thought you were all that attracted to me. Not for the first few months, at least. I snorted. If he only knew. Then I thought about how he had phrased it. What gave it away? What changed after that time that made you realize I was not made of steel, Mr. Oblivious? His hold on me grew a little tighter, and then he exhaled. Remember that colloquium Intech hosted for high schoolers a few months after I started? We realized there weren't enough chairs when the kids started filing in. I saw you sneaking out, and somehow, I knew where you were going. I remembered that day. Jerk-faced Gerald had miscounted the number of attendees. Folding chairs. Yes, you shot out of there to fetch the folding chairs we kept in storage. Aaron had appeared out of thin air that day, exactly how we always did. Then, he had given me shit about wanting to carry the chairs on my own, that it wasn't my job to do that. So, what gave it away? Was it how I almost smacked you with a chair for being an overbearing jackass? It was how you shivered when I came behind you to help you with one that had been stuck to a shelf. You know right before you pulled again and went toppling down to the floor? Oh. Oh, yeah. I remembered that precise moment exactly. 
I had felt his body behind me. His arms came around me without touching me, and I stared and shivered and flushed and had gotten all worked up at how they flexed under his dress shirt as he tried to disentangle that damn chair. It had been a slap on the face how hot and bothered that left me. That gave it away. I just knew that the red spreading around your neck and cheeks had nothing to do with you calling me a stubborn, heartless robot. Did it? I trailed off, unease growing in my stomach. Did it ever bother you? Everything I called you? Everything I said when we butted heads? My heart raced as I feared his answer. No, he said simply. At that point, I took anything you were willing to give me, Catalina. Something staggered in my chest. The story I told your sister about how we met? I was only speaking the truth. My eyelids fluttered shut, and I thanked the heavens I was currently leaning on Aaron, that he was holding me against his chest, because I would have tumbled to the floor otherwise. By the time I realized how much of an idiot I had been by pushing you away, you already hated me. I tried to swallow the lump in my throat. I heard you talk to Jeff, accidentally. That knot wouldn't go away, squeezing my throat tight. You said you'd work with anybody else, anybody but me. And I felt as if you had just pushed me aside, deemed me worthless as a professional because you didn't like me, because I had crossed some line I hadn't known existed. I, how could I look at you and not think about it after that? I blacklisted you. And I deserved it. Aaron turned me around delicately, flushing our bodies together very slowly. He looked down at me. I meant what I said. When you brought that welcome gift to my office, something tore inside of me. You distracted me. You stole my focus, Lena, like nothing I had ever experienced before. So I panicked. I refused to let that happen. When Jeff suggested I work closely with you, I convinced him that it would be a bad idea. I convinced myself of that, too. But then I got to know you. Aaron looked down at me intently, something weighing behind his eyes, pushing me, pushing us, closer and closer to an emotion that took more and more room in my chest with every second I spent looking into his eyes. I watched you work, laugh, be this bright and kind woman that you are. And the crack that had opened that first day widened. It only kept growing, made me realize how much of a fool I had been. By the time I knew I didn't want to push you away anymore, that I couldn't do it, it was too late. So I took whatever you had for me, even if that was hatred, antagonism, or obvious dislike, anything that gave me a few minutes with you every day. If that put me on your mind, even for a little while. Aaron, I trailed off, everything inside of my chest, my head, my memory stirring into a loud and raging thunderstorm. All this time. I know. I watched his jaw twitch, his features hardening impossibly. You let me antagonize you. All this time, you sat there and let me do that. My voice shook with emotion, with the loss of a time that we could have had. But it also shook with the lie that hid in my own words. Had I really hated him at all? It didn't seem possible at this point. Hadn't I done the same and convinced myself of that because he had hurt me? Why? The question left my lips in a whisper, for him, but also for myself because it was all you were willing to give me, and I'd rather have you hating me than not have you at all. My body trembled. It shuddered under the weight of his words, with the truth underneath the ones rising to my lips. Love. It had to be love. The uproar causing havoc in my chest. Realization grew in me as quickly as lightning hit the ground. I didn't hate you, I breathed. As much as I wanted to, I don't think I ever did. I was just hurt, perhaps because I had always wanted you to like me, and you made me believe you didn't. Something flashed across Aaron's face, the space between our mouths crackling with electricity and an emotion I had never, ever felt before. I want your heart, Catalina. Both his hands rose to my shoulders, trailing up my neck and cupping my face. I want it for myself just how I have given you mine. It's yours, you beautiful and blind man, I wanted to tell him. Take it. I don't want it anymore. I wanted to scream at him and anyone that would listen. But I didn't. 
I didn't think one could be petrified by pure, sheer joy. It never seemed a possibility. Yet there I was, standing in front of him, just as he laid his heart in my hands, and all I could do was stare at him with a thousand unsaid words waiting on the tip of my tongue. So I showed him. My hands reached for his face, just as he had been doing, and I brought him to my lips. I told him with a kiss that I was his, gave myself to him with those lips, and didn't seem capable of articulating any words. Aaron lifted me off the floor and took me in his arms with a tenderness, a reverence that left me breathless, just how I imagined him doing with my heart. My legs went around his hips, and his lips parted mine, his tongue taking, governing mine. With long strides, he crossed the open space in his loft, carrying me in his arms as neither of us stopped to breathe. He placed me on the countertop of the kitchen. Beneath the hem of my shorts, the cool granite caressed the backs of my thighs. Aaron's mouth dragged down my neck, his teeth scraping my skin, finally catching on the neckline of my tank top and pulling it down until revealing my bra. He grunted, and I felt the noise reverberate against my skin. Hands on my hips shoved me against him with roughness, leaving me right on the edge of the counter. God, he was unleashed. My man was ravenous as he pulled at my top, briskly tugging it down to my waist, and then popped open my shorts, almost bursting the zipper. He didn't care, didn't seem to realize he had come undone. I did that. I cracked him open at the seams. The same kind of urgency hummed under my skin under my fingertips, as I pulled at his T-shirt. In a swift motion, it lay on the floor. The warm, sizzling skin of his bare chest came against mine, his hips nestling between my legs as those strong arms fused me against him, merged me with him. I whimpered, the rest of my sanity leaving me with a sound. Wanting the rest of his clothes gone, I tugged at his jeans, desperately, just as I arched my back, looking for the friction I ached no died for. Aaron pushed his hardness into me, pleasure shooting through my body even with the barrier of our pants and underwear. I felt him hot and thick as he rocked against my center, and that alone made my eyelids flutter, my toes curl, and my world explode. He moved again, creating more friction between us, and I saw myself coming if he did that one more time. Again, I told him, begged him, Aaron's hands palmed my ass, thrusting me against him, then pushing into me harder, ripping a chain of moans out of me, hustling me closer to the edge. God, I haven't even touched you, baby. He rasped into my mouth. Then he took my lower lip between his teeth as he kept moving against me. Haven't even been inside you yet. His hands took control of my useless body, mercilessly rocking me against him and my head fell back, a prayer on my lips. Come, he grunted into my ear, our hips moving against each other's, fucking each other with our jeans still on. Come, so I can fuck you better. That, that toppled me over. No, it bulldozed into me. My mind left my body, leaving me behind as I burst into pure, boundless sensation. Not even Aaron's name left my lips even if I wanted to scream it until my voice grew raw. I was spent, rendered empty, weightless. His arms went around my back, and in a heartbeat, I was standing on wobbly legs. My back came against his front, immediately feeling him hot and throbbing with need. The sensation, the knowing of having the power to do that to him, bringing me back to life. In another heartbeat, he brought my shorts and underwear down my legs, helping me step out and shoving them aside. I felt the warmth of his chest on my back, and then his fingers closed around my waist. Hands on the counter, he demanded, guiding my palms to the surface. Then he widened my stance with his knee, right as he brushed open-mouthed kisses down my spine. His hands grabbed onto my hips, one of them trailing down my bare backside. I should take you to my bed. He kneaded my ass and then his palm traveled to my thigh. I should lay you there and fuck you, deep and slow. Whimpering, I pushed into his hips. He grunted and then reared back. I heard him unzip his pants. Then I felt his hard length against my ass. 
He moved up and down, and I could tell he had just pulled himself out of his jeans, hadn't even bothered to push them down or take them off. Madness. It drove me fucking crazy. You know the times I have jerked off to the thought of you on your hands, on your elbows? He passed a shaft along my ass, making me moan and knead. Or bent over my knee after getting all mouthy with me. Another moan, this one soaked with agony, just like I was at the image of bringing his words to life. Oh, he whispered, then his voice lowered. Sounds like you'd love that as much as me. One of the drawers opened and closed, and then a foil was ripped open. This time, I'm prepared. Have a whole box right there. It has been there for months. Aaron, I begged him. I wanted him now, or I would combust into a cloud of dust. I need you. I looked over my shoulder, eyes ablaze, and saw a feral expression on his face. Now. It was my turn to grunt. The back of his hand delicately caressed my jaw, and then his palm fell on my back. He pushed me onto the counter. Grab onto the edge, he growled. I'm going to take you fast and hard, baby. With a deep thrust, he was seated inside of me. I whimpered, feeling wonderfully heavenly full. And before I could ask for more, for all that he had promised, Aaron pushed out and thrust in again. We both moaned. One of his hands came around me and landed on the counter, and the other was fisting my hair. I'd dissolve. If I didn't come soon, I'd disappear under his weight under the rippling pleasure pooling down my belly. More, I managed to say, and the rhythm of his thrusts increased, pushing me into the granite surface, his grunts falling into my neck. Fingers gripped my hip. I can give you more. That hand lifted off my skin and fell back with a tight slap on my bare ass. A moan like no other moan to ever leave my lips emerged from my mouth. I can give you my all. Another soft smack, pushing me down, down, down. Yes, I whimpered. True to his word, he gave me everything. He thrust his cock into me uncontrollably, the sound of his hips against my ass encompassing our pants. Come with me. His front fell on top of my back, deliciously caging me, burying me with him, his fingers now rubbing my clit, accompanying his thrusts. I want to feel you coming on my cock as I go off. One more frantic, desperate thrust. That was all it took for both of us to detonate into bliss. Groans equally powerful left both our mouths, our names blessing each other's lips with them. Aaron's hands came around my middle, holding on to me more than holding me to him. Then he brought us upward, slipping out of me. I turned around in his arms and leaned my chin on his chest, and he brushed a kiss on my forehead, another one on my lips, then another one on my nose. You feel and taste like you are mine. I looked up, right into his eyes. I am. Just two words, two simple words that were used so often in casual conversation that they shouldn't have held much meaning, but they did. Those two ordinary words uttered in that precise moment mattered. I knew because Aaron's face lit up with them, breaking into the most beautiful smile to date, burning down the last of my defenses. And as I stared into the blue of his eyes, I watched those walls of mine collapse as if I hadn't spent all this time building them up. I am, I repeated, crushing the last remnants of the wreckage with my hands. Aaron kissed me again, sealing those two words with his lips, adding a few more of his own. I'm going to prove to you that you are. This time around, instead of having the tacos to go, we devoured them right on the spot. Post-sex hunger did these things to you. Seriously, I said, inserting a finger in my mouth and savoring the sauce that had stuck to it. I'm just saying that if vampires are going to make a comeback, the least they can do is sparkle. Finding Aaron's gaze on my mouth, I let my hand hover in the air and felt the light blush covering my cheeks. Are you listening, Blackford? His eyes bounced up and then down again. Yes, vampires, sparkles. I wiped the rest of the sticky sauce off my hands with a napkin. 
I still can't believe you'd be a vampire over a werewolf, by the way. Something else I couldn't believe either? Aaron had had that conversation with me without batting an eyelash. Not only that, but he had seemed to know a fair bit about paranormal creatures, and I had questions. Aaron retrieved the paper from my grip and threw it in a trash can that stood next to the food truck. They are immortal, he said, as if there were no other point to be made. But you were so werewolfish. True to my accusations, those blue eyes glinted with a hungry edge. Am I? Yes. First off, you are big and hot and, oh, I'm already loving this. One of his arms curled around me, tugging me to his side. Please continue. Get your mind out of the gutter, I grabbed his hand, lifting it in the air in front of us. See, these are like paws. And when I say hot, I mean temperature-wise, like... I trailed off, only thinking about phallic-shaped hot stuff. Dios, had all the sex killed off that many of my brain cells? Your skin feels hot to the touch. Yeah, like a heated, weighted blanket. I turned, watching him frown. I say it as a compliment. I mean it in an I'd love to get under you and snuggle right now way. That frown disappeared. I can live with that. His head dipped, and he placed a kiss on the tip of my nose. What else? You are loyal? He hummed in agreement. Also private. You keep to yourself. And even if people think that you are cold and unfriendly, it's just that you have a stoic approach to most things. You watch everything so that you can anticipate every single thing that comes your way, which honestly is really impressive, but very annoying too. I peeked at him over my shoulder, finding him looking at me strangely. What? Nothing. He shook his head, getting rid of whatever it had been that was making him look all dazed. I watched him compose himself. You are forgetting something. My eyebrows rose. And what's that? I bite, he said, before grazing his teeth over my cheek. Then he nibbled on the sensitive skin where my shoulders met my neck. Giggling like a mad woman, I let my body burrow into his embrace. But just as I was doing so, someone caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. I couldn't be sure, but I thought it was someone from work. One of the guys on Gerald's team, if that glimpse of blonde hair and slender shoulders was enough to recognize him by. Apprehension sank deep in my belly, killing my fit of carefree giggles. Aaron didn't seem to notice the shift in me, and if he did, he didn't say anything. Let's go home. I have a weighted blanket reputation to uphold. True to his word, Aaron had curled his body around mine in that gigantic and dreamy sofa that was planted in the middle of his loft. It had probably been the mixture of exhaustion, jet lag, and warmth coming off his body, but as much as I tried to fight it, I had passed out in under two minutes flat after returning to his apartment. Looking down, I caught a glimpse of a big and hefty hand trailing up my stomach. We were lying on our sides, and judging by the silence around us, the TV was no longer on. Aaron had probably turned it off as soon as I drifted off. Long fingers splayed along my front, reaching the underside of my breasts. Shifting under the sensation traveling down my body, I burrowed myself further into him. A grunt sounded in my neck. It's dark outside. My gaze went to the massive windows that faced the waterfront, as if I had needed confirmation that night had fallen. We fell asleep, I said, returning my gaze to those five fingers on my stomach, my toes already curling with anticipation. I thought you wanted us to fight jet lag together, mister. I did, for a while, Aaron chuckled, and I felt the sound in my back. My lips curved upwards as my mind pictured his beautiful face smiling but you are so fucking soft, curled up against me. His hand trailed up and down, and then I was pulled against him. I couldn't help myself. You made me lose perspective. I turned in his embrace, rolling so I could face him. His hand fell on my lower back, the change of positions making my mouth almost come into contact with his neck. I looked up into his eyes. Excuse me, are you putting this on me? Never. He tugged me closer again, our fronts flushed together. My eyes fluttered closed, and a contented sigh left my lips. 
Would you take me to bed, Aaron Blackford? He never uttered his answer. Instead, he peeled himself off the sofa with me in his arms, wrapping my legs around his waist. I giggled at his sudden enthusiasm. With long, quick strides, he carried me across his apartment, passing the marble kitchen island, and then making his way down the wide and uncluttered hallway and straight into the master bedroom. His bedroom. A shot of something sultry curled its way along my body. I was about to sleep next to Aaron, in his bed, wrapped in his soft, lush linens, my head on the plush pillows where his head had rested many times. And just when I was ready to be dropped onto that king-size mattress that looked like a dream, I was carried into the ensuite bathroom instead. My eyes took in our reflection in the mirror, not expecting how much I would love what I saw. Me, hands clasped behind his neck, me in his arms, me, cheeks flushed and a dazed expression on my face because it was him holding me, me, happy. Aaron attempted to place me on the black and white tiled floor. Nah, I shook my head, holding onto his neck a little closer and keeping my legs around his waist. I like it up here. Yeah? His voice was coated with humor, but also with something thick and glossy. I tightened my grip on him. That much? Yep, I admitted into his neck. I think you can carry me everywhere from now on. Walking on my own is not going to cut it anymore. His palms rearranged me around him, shifting me to his side. He dropped a kiss on my temple. And I think I could get used to that very quickly. He reached for my toiletry bag, opened it, and extracted my toothbrush. Handing it over to me with a small smile, he then repeated the process with his own toothbrush. Teeth first, then bed. With a nod, we did exactly that. We brushed our teeth as we looked at each other in the mirror, all the while with me hanging off his side like a clingy and needy spider monkey. Not that I cared. I'd do this every single night to come. Once we were done, he carried me to bed. Aaron, I whispered after he tucked me under his light comforter. We were facing each other. My hands were below my cheek, and only our feet were touching. I'm glad you came with me to Spain. I heard him release a shaky breath as my own words seeped in, although they didn't really do justice to how I actually felt. Not because our plan worked. I'm actually happy that you were there with me. I'm more than happy. I don't think I told you, so I wanted to let you know. His hand cupped my cheek, his thumb brushing my jaw and lips. Are you glad too, Aaron? I asked him as I covered his palm with mine. I don't think I can put into words just how much. He brought my hand to his mouth and skimmed his lips over the back of it. And it's not only because I somehow managed to get you exactly where you are. Right into your bed? I inched closer, my thighs now brushing his. He tugged at my hand some more, encouraging me to move even closer. Yes. But right here with me, too, exactly where I've always wanted you. I hummed, sparks of happiness flaring up in my chest. <laughs> they loved you, you know. I moved my head into the space between the underside of his jaw and his collarbone. I mean, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but it's kind of hard not to. I placed a kiss on his skin, wondering how I had not realized this myself a long time ago. How loyal and caring and soft he was beneath all that frowning and scowling. Although maybe I had. Maybe that would explain why I had been so hurt over him brushing me aside. Over him not wanting anything to do with me. Over him not letting me in. I shook my head. It didn't matter. Not now. My mom has never talked so highly about someone. Isabel told me that she wouldn't shut up about you. Aaron speaks Spanish so well. Aaron is so tall and handsome. Aaron has the bluest eyes I have ever seen. Have you seen Aaron smiling at Arlena like that? He came all the way from America to meet us. And she wasn't the only one. I was scared Abuela would try to steal you away from me. I swear, she was so enamored. It kind of got a little awkward at some point. I laughed lightly at the memory. Do you think I'll have to fight my grandmother over you? Expecting him to chuckle, I was shocked when a deep sigh left him instead. I looked at him, not able to discern much in the dark. Hey, what's wrong? 
There's nothing wrong, baby. His voice was coated with a kind of emotion I didn't quite understand. I tugged at the fabric of his shirt, encouraging him to tell me. He sighed again. It's just that I've never had that, not ever. Your family is so messy, loud, kind of overstepping all the time. They are, but in the best kind of way. He paused, his hand coming to the back of my head. Long fingers brushed my hair down. The closest I've ever come to that was when it was the three of us. And somehow, I forgot what it was like. My chest hurt at hearing that, and I came even closer to him, wishing I could take all that pain away from him, wishing I could breathe a little warmth into him. Your family loves you, and that's the kind of bond you can't force. It's the kind of love one doesn't find anywhere else. It can be overwhelming, but that's only because it's always honest. And being part of that, even if for only a few days, meant the world. More than you could ever know. His lips fell on my hair with a fierceness that hadn't been there before. I wasn't pretending, Catalina. Not for a minute. It was all real for me. That's why it meant so much. Aaron, I breathed not really knowing what to say, how to explain the uprising inside of me. So it's me, the one who's glad, the one who's fucking relieved you took me and not someone else with you. I'm the one who's thankful. I swallowed, trying my best to push back the unfiltered joy threatening to flood my system and rob me of my next breath. You don't ever have to thank me for something like that, Aaron. You never have to. His chin fell on the top of my head, and I felt his breath on my hair. I do, baby. I do. Chapter 25 Oh my God, you look like you just came out of a sex marathon. Rosie, I hissed, smacking her arm. Her cheeks turned red, and both her hands jumped to her mouth. We were on the co-working space floor of the building at lunchtime so more than a few tables were occupied with groups of people enjoying their break. We had been lucky to snatch one that sat close to the floor-to-ceiling windows. My friend looked around. Shit, I'm so sorry, she whispered. It's okay, I snickered. She looked so flustered, it was even cute. No need to apologize. It's just that you look all glowy and ruffled. She kept her voice low and quiet. You can stop whispering, Rosie. Okay, she whispered again. I rolled my eyes and she cleared her throat. So you guys are not keeping it a secret or anything, right? I guess we are trying to figure that out. I shook my head. But there's a difference between not keeping it a secret and broadcasting to everybody that I just got laid. You are right. Sorry. Some of the pink returned to her cheeks. It's your hair. Seriously, it looks... Her hands spun in the air in an over-exaggerated way. It's really windy today, okay? I passed my hands down my chestnut locks, trying to tame them. I lowered my voice. It's not like we're constantly going at it like animals. Although we sort of were. We had done exactly that earlier this morning, just as soon as the alarm went off, both of us equally voracious and greedy with each other the moment we had opened our eyes to a tangle of arms and legs. Only thinking about his hands and, oh my gosh. Rosie loud whispered. I zeroed back in on her and found her green eyes widening. You are thinking of it right now, aren't you? I didn't bother to deny it. She knew me well enough to catch me on a lie. In the office? She gasped. It's only noon. No, I gasped back, although a spark ignited something low in my belly at the thought of office sex. Damn, am I sex crazed? Back at his place. I shrugged my shoulders, unpacking the bagel we had grabbed on our way to work. It felt weird thinking of Aaron and me as we, who picked up lunch and headed into work together. No, the flutter in my stomach didn't say weird. It said different, lightheaded, butterflies in my tummy different. She searched my face for a long moment, making me frown. Then she broke into a sunny grin. Wow, you have it so bad. Maybe I do, I thought, biting into my bagel. So, what did I miss, Rosaline? Nuh-uh, 
She popped open a metallic container, revealing a rice salad topped with some greens. No time to talk about my boring life or work. Things are the same. Start talking right freaking now, friend. She dug a fork into her food, a little too forcefully. I want all the details and don't leave out cheesy, swoon-worthy ones. My mouth opened with a complaint. Again, no, don't you even dare tell me that there aren't a few movie-worthy moments because I'll unfriend you. Plopping my bagel on the table, I sighed dramatically. Spill the beans, Catalina Martin. Damn, since when are you this bossy? I asked her right before she pointed at me with her fork while she shot me a dagger or two with her eyes. Okay, okay. I lifted my hands in the air, took a deep breath in, and then started reciting every single thing that had gone down between Aaron and me, keeping the name of our soon-to-be boss out just in case. Once my friend was all caught up, and if her shit-eating grin was saying anything, she was more than satisfied with what she had heard. I snatched back my bagel and resumed my lunch. Fuck, Lena, she said through her ear-to-ear -ear smile. I flinched. Rosaline, did you just swear? I blinked, while grinning like a Cheshire cat. Fuck yes, I did, you goddamn idiot. Jaw hanging open, I watched her look around, lifting the few things we had lying on the table and putting them right back where they had been, an unconvinced expression on her face. What the hell are you doing? My throat worked, trying to pass down my bagel. Looking for something I can throw at your head, she answered nonchalantly, but that grin was still there. Is this angry, Rosie? It was unsettling. Maybe if I did, I'd knock some sense into your hard head. Although from what you're telling me, you are not only stubborn, but also pretty darn blind. So really, I am at a loss here. I just want to smack you and see what happens. My mouth opened shut. Smack me? That's where your loyalty lies, so-called friend? She leveled me with a look that immediately sobered me up. Lena. As I released a breath, my shoulders fell with defeat. I know, okay? I deserve some of that smacking. I knew how fucking dumb I had been, how blind and stubborn. I knew she was right, but I was also starting to understand what I felt for Aaron and how big and scary it was. Rosie, I think, no. I know that I, oh no, she cut my words off. And at the same time, a head popped up in my field of vision. Hi, Rosie, Lena, how are you ladies doing? As of right now, not too well, I wanted to tell him. Hello, Gerald, I muttered instead. Neither of us bothered to answer his question. Not that he cared, apparently, because he stayed rooted in place. So, how was the vacay, Lena? The vacay. It hadn't even been a holiday. I had just taken three days off, for Christ's sake, but there was no point in correcting him. Turning in my chair and facing him with what I hoped wasn't a grimace, I braced myself for a few torturous minutes of small talk. Wonderful, thank you. He gave me a knowing nod, followed by a blatant smirk. I frowned. Big day tomorrow with open day, huh? He leaned a hand on our table the buttons of his shirt struggling under the strain. Why did he have to stuff himself in clothing two sizes smaller? Someone should tell him. He didn't deserve the courtesy, but the world didn't deserve this kind of sight either. You have an outfit picked out and all? I know you girls take your time deciding. My teeth grated together with the sheer effort of not turning the table over and flipping him off. Yes, I answered through my teeth. Now, if you don't mind, we were just having luck. Did you have trouble putting everything together? Gerald asked, not caring about my brush off. I thought I'd heard Rosie mutter something that sounded a lot like jerk under her breath. Damn, she's ragey today. A little, but it's all sorted out now, I told him with a neutral expression. I bet you managed to find some help. The last word, help, the way he had said it accompanied by a twitch of his eyebrows, sounded as if it meant much more than it was supposed to. I felt the blood rushing out of my face, a chilly sensation slowly advancing in its place. Yeah, I did. I hadn't thought to hide that Aaron had helped me. That wasn't a point, but of course, that had happened before Spain. Now there was something between us, something new and wonderful and so very fragile. Yes, I just bet, Gerald commented casually. I guess it's as easy as batting your eyelashes and asking nicely, right? Cold glacial, icy cold, 
started seeping in all across my body. I shuddered. Things are easy for girls who ask nicely. My spine stiffened. Nicely. Excuse me? Gerald laughed, waving his hand. Oh, I'm just chatting, honey. Lena. My voice was frosty, but how could it not be? The chill had penetrated, made its way into my bones. Don't let him get to you, I told myself, begged of myself. Not honey. My name is Lena. I watched his eyes roll, and it bugged me. It fucking angered me like it had never before. I've always been very polite to you, Gerald. My tone dripped with fury now, so much that I almost couldn't listen to the petrifying fear beneath it, threatening to come out. So I'm going to invite you to leave our table. I didn't want to hear whatever he had to say. If I did, everything would quiver, shake so violently that it would break. I don't have time for you intersexist crap. His cackle traveled across the whole room, and heads turned in our direction. Oh, honey. Gerald, please leave. Rosie stood up from her chair, but he gave no indication that he'd heard her. No, a man who wore that face, the face of someone who had to lash out, was not going to listen to anybody. Well, 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 Gerald's mouth curled in grim mockery. Look at that, he raised his voice. Gets cozy with the boss and thinks she can go around telling people off, calling me stupid names. My whole world came to a halt. It simply stopped spinning. All that icy anger melted to the floor. The fear roared like a beast let out of a cage after an eternity in captivity. There was a sharp beeping in my ears. My vision blurred. Memories from a past I had thought was left behind came rushing back, smacking into me with the force of a truck. Whore, slut, you fucked your way through college, sucked some dick to get those grades. I had done it again, hadn't I? Stumbled upon the same fucking rock. Although this time, I hadn't just scraped my knees. This time, I had gone down with everything I had. And I didn't think standing back up, brushing it off, and moving on was something I'd be able to do. Not this time. My career. All these years, I had worked my ass off in a field that wasn't exactly easy for a woman. Everything I had accomplished. All lit on fire by a vile man who had turned a beautiful thing, a treasure I had only just found into gruesome mud and used it against me. The warm grip of a hand against my arm. Delicate, too soft, familiar in a way that was contradictory because it felt like I hadn't had enough time to learn, to tattoo it on my skin so I wouldn't forget. What's going on, Lena? A deep voice that spoke directly into my heart came through the chaos in my head. My gaze wandered around, finding pairs of eyes upon more pairs of eyes staring at us eating it all up like one looked at a train wreck. How morbid, how very sad. Catalina, I heard Aaron say with growing urgency. I finally zeroed in on him, a smile wanting to claw its way out of me, but dying off before it could. Nothing, I breathed out, shaking my head, wishing to will him away from me. I didn't want Aaron anywhere near this. I didn't want Gerald's poison to touch him, to splatter onto him. Nothing's going on. Something in his face was screaming at me to touch him, to cup his jaw and comfort him with soft kisses. But I didn't do any of that. I simply watched how he turned toward my friend. Rosie, Aaron said, sounding so wrong, so unlike Aaron. Tell me what's going on. I looked at my friend, silently begging her not to say a word. He'd be enraged and I knew Aaron well enough to be certain that he'd do something, he'd do anything. But Rosie shook her head. Gerald knows. Aaron didn't need more than that to guess what had just happened because his profile hardened into granite. Not like you two tried to hide it, Gerald laughed again, as if this were all a big joke to him. Paul saw you two yesterday, but hey, I get it. It's not a big deal, man. Everybody was watching, enraptured by the unfolding drama. And God, I was so weary and worn out. I wanted to rewind life and go back to any point before this. A word of advice? Don't shit where you eat, Blackford. Word gets out, especially if you are sleeping around with employees. But good for you, and hey, not that I blame her either. I see the appeal in getting it on with the boss. Silence. 
thick loaded silence engulfed us. Then Aaron's voice sliced right through it, sharp as a razor. Do you want to keep your job? Oh, no. Aaron's words had been meant for Gerald, but they harpooned their way right into my chest. Aaron, no. I stepped forward, my hand coming to his arm. Oh, my mistake, Blackford. Gerald tapped his head with a finger. Future boss, you are not there yet. So I think the firing privileges are out of your reach for now. Aaron shook off my hand, stepping in Gerald's direction into him. I asked you a question. One more slow, heavy step, and he got in the other man's face. Do you want to keep your job, Gerald? Because I can end you. Your golf friends up there won't be able to do a single thing, and neither will your minions at HR. Gerald turned quiet, the mockery falling off his face. The frustration at being so powerless, so helpless at how everything had unraveled so out of control, brought a familiar pressure to the backs of my eyes. I hate this. I hate it with all my fucking soul. Why do people find pleasure in bringing down others? Why us? Why so soon? Aaron's sneer, the way his body was so stiff and impossibly tense, told me that he was about to lose his restraint. Aaron, stop, my voice faltered. I couldn't cry, I wouldn't do that. Not right here with half the people in the company staring. But Aaron wasn't budging. He remained a marble statue, awaiting Gerald's answer, as if he had a whole lifetime to do so. Aaron, please, I willed my voice to harden, but he was transfixed, unmovable. You are making it all worse. Was that the truth? I couldn't be sure, but it was what had left my lips. It was what seemed to make it through and hit him like a physical blow, making him flinch. I watched him turn slowly, and he, the man I had come to need and want in my life, faced me, hurt embedded in his eyes. It broke my heart, putting it there. But what was the alternative? I should have known better. I despised myself for putting us both in this situation when I knew firsthand what could happen, and it was happening. Unable to take a single second more of it, of myself, the hurt in Aaron's eyes, everything, I turned and walked away. I saw myself leaving the room and striding across a long hallway. I kept going, taking turns and climbing downstairs without a clear sense of direction. I was on automatic, and cowering was my default. Catalina, stop running away. Pure, unfiltered desperation governed Aaron's voice, and it sickened me. I despised myself even more for putting on him yet another ugly thing. Talk to me. I kept walking, not wanting to turn and not knowing where we were in the building, an empty hallway somewhere. Catalina, would you stop fucking running, please? My legs came to a sudden halt. My eyes closed. I heard, sensed, because that was how it worked now. I could feel the warmth of his body, crave it. Aaron walk around me, and when I opened them back up, I was greeted by an angry, miserable man. Don't do this. You hear me? His voice didn't crack or waver. Don't you even think of it. I won't let you quit. God, he knew me so fucking well, better than I did myself, because his words only solidified what had been bubbling inside of me in the last few minutes. But I was furious, so mad at the world and at myself. Easy for you to say, I snapped unfairly. But Gerald's poison was eating away at me, blackening everything in its path. I'm the one whoring out anyway, right? You'll brush it off and move on. He blinked, his features contorting with outrage and pain. Easy for me to say? I'll brush it off? He hissed. You think it was easy for me not to break his face on the spot? Maybe fuck up his mouth enough so he couldn't utter a word for a few weeks? Not to fucking end him for being a worthless pig? I believed Aaron would have done that. I knew he would have. And that dissipated my anger, leaving anguish in its place. How could I ever have anything for him that wasn't adoration? I won't let you do any of that, I whispered. He's not worth the trouble you'd get into. But you are. You are worth all that trouble. You are worth walking through a fucking fire for. Don't you see that? He exhaled roughly through his nose, his hand coming to my cheek, making me lean on his touch out of pure instinct. 
Whatever shit Danielle put in your head about you not being worth fighting for is wrong. Love is worth fighting for, and I am not him, Lena. This is not the past either. I shook my head, but his palm held on to my face harder. When there is a rock on the way and you fall, I tumble down with you. We fight our way up together. It's not that easy, Aaron. I wished it were. I wanted so bad for the world to be that goddamn easy. Those are just idealistic, beautiful words. At the end of the day, you can't protect me from everything. Hold my hand and fire whoever disrespects me. Maybe I can't, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to try. When someone mistreats you and I have the power to do something about it, I'm going to speak up. I'm not going to wait on the sidelines and watch you take the hit of it on your own. His chest heaved, moving up and down almost violently. Just how I know you would fight tooth and claw against anyone who tried to hurt me. We protect and heal each other. That's how this is supposed to be. This is not only life we are talking about. This is my career. Yours too, Aaron. It is, and I would never do anything to jeopardize it. But what about everybody else? They might. Look at what happened with Gerald. I fought the sudden urge to lean on his chest and break down. What happens from now on? Every time I accomplish something, I will fear the possibility of someone pointing a finger and accusing me of sleeping my way to it? His jaw clenched, fury seeping into his features again. Things don't need to be that way. Gerald is not everyone else, Lena. I closed my eyes, not able to work around the lump in my throat. Aaron continued. I'm not downplaying your fears, baby. I swear I'm not. But we can't give up at the first sign of adversity. We can't let everyone else matter more than we do, not without giving us a fair shot. But what if we don't even get the chance of giving this a shot? I wanted to scream. I need you to trust in us, in me. Can you do that? I trust you, Aaron. I shook my head and stepped out of his reach. But this is just too complicated. I don't think I can do it. Go through it again. My heart would never recover if this didn't work, if Aaron fled the ship like Daniel had. More hurt poured into the blue of his eyes. You don't then, he whispered, his voice broken. If you mean that, then you don't trust me. Silence weighed down on us, Aaron's shoulders eventually falling. I love you, Lena. A crack sliced its way across my poor, beaten heart at how wrong those four words sounded, how void of happiness and full of sorrow they were when they shouldn't have been. How is it possible that it feels like you are breaking my heart and I haven't even had you yet? My soul shattered. I broke in a hundred million pieces. I can't make you trust me like I need you to, with your whole fucking heart. He searched my face, those blue eyes missing their usual light, reflecting only hurt. I can't make you run into my arms instead of in the opposite direction. I just can't make you love me enough to give us a chance. A hole opened in my chest, my knees almost giving out at the earth beneath my feet, tilting the wrong way, unbalanced. We stared into each other's eyes for a long time, our hearts in each other's fists for all the wrong reasons. It all felt unreal, like a cruel nightmare I'd wake up from any minute now but it never happened. At some point, I thought I heard his phone ringing, and I watched him ignore it until it rang again and again. Then I thought he pulled it out of his pocket and peered down at the screen, but I wasn't sure. My head kept chanting, trust him, trust him, trust him, making it hard for me to make sense of anything else but that. I was trapped by my own mind, sucked into a vacuum where I didn't grasp time or space, Although I did remember one thing, and that was Aaron's back moving away from me, his legs walking him down the empty hallway, and him not looking back. Not even once. Chapter 26 Rosie came home with me that night. We curled under a blanket on my bed and rewatched Moulin Rouge on my laptop. How tragic, to find love and see it slip through your fingers before your eyes. I always wondered what Ian McGregor would have done had he known the moment he met the love of his life that their story wouldn't last more than 130 minutes. Would he still take her hand in his and jump? 
Would he still hold on to every moment left, even if only a few? Would he still lie down by her side, knowing that when she was gone, that space would never be filled again? Rosie didn't even think before giving me her answer. Yes, she whispered. When you find that kind of love, time stops mattering. Come what may, Lena, he would love her regardless of how long they had. Then we both bawled our eyes out, Rosie, because she could never hold it in when come what may kicked in, and me, well, mostly because I had welcomed the excuse. So I cried. I let those tears fall as I held my phone in my hand, waiting for a call, a message, a sign that I knew I didn't deserve. But that was what dumb chicken shits like me did. They cowered, hid under a blanket, and cried to El Tango de Roxanne. Ugh, I didn't like myself one single bit. But come what fucking may, I'd still have to live with myself for the rest of my life, find solace in the little time I had shared with Aaron past tense, because when he had asked me to run into his arms instead of in the opposite direction, I hadn't. When he had asked me to trust him in us wholly, I hadn't been capable of doing it, even when I thought I had. And that had pushed him to walk away. I pushed him away. I was the only one responsible for that. Fuck. I wanted him here. With me, mending the broken pieces of this mess together. I wanted him to tell me that he believed we could still be fixed, glued back together and good as new. But that was so selfish and so very naive of me, stupidly so. Sometimes, as much as we wanted something, we weren't meant to have it, to keep it, not when it complicated everything else. And this thing, love, because that was exactly what it was, between us did. It complicated both our lives, the promises of both careers. We were tripping each other, making each other fall, just how Daniel had said all that time ago. We'd have grown to resent each other, because that was what the poison born of malicious mouths did. It infected everything, and I knew just how much. So yeah, after Moulin Rouge crying gate, the following day obviously sucked, it was probably one of the worst, most miserable days I remembered, and I knew a fair bit about those. I dragged my feet the whole day, somehow managing to get through the eight to midnight open day for a bunch of faceless suits. Names and faces bounced right off me, and I presented topic after topic as if every word were being ripped out of me. If Jeff had been around to witness that lame attempt at being welcoming, accommodating, and approachable, he'd have fired me on the spot and I wouldn't have found it in me to care. That's how ironic life could be sometimes. When I entered the building on day two without Aaron, which I realized was my new way to count down time, I waited for the whispers of my colleagues to reach my ears and their fingers to be pointed at me for no reason other than Gerald's public accusations. By the time the clock hit 5 p.m., after I spent the day wishing I'd get a glimpse of Aaron and dreading it, all at the same time, nothing had happened. None of my colleagues had batted an eyelash at me. No disgusting rumors, no nasty accusations, nothing. Not a flash of Aaron either. On day three without him, an odd kind of restlessness burrowed itself in me. I missed Aaron. I missed the possibility of what had been growing between us, and that started outweighing everything else. It didn't seem so important that the incident with Gerald had not led anyone to treat me any differently. I couldn't find it in me to be relieved. What did it matter when there was a hole in my chest? I missed Aaron's face, the ocean blue in his eyes, his stubborn frown, the way his lips puckered when he was lost in thought, the wide line of his shoulders, how he effortlessly stood tall and big as life wherever he went, and his smile that smile that was just for me. So much that I set camp in my office, left the door open, and waited for him to walk down the hallway at some point in the day, or to hear his voice even if in the distance. That would have been enough to appease that need burning inside of me. But none of that happened. On day four, I finally gave up and knocked on his office door, going unanswered. And when I asked Rosie if she had seen him around at all, 
She hugged me and said she hadn't. Neither had Hector or the few people I had somehow found an excuse to ask. That was exactly why I was pacing from one corner of the hallway to the opposite one as I waited to be called into Sharon's office, just like I had been doing at home last night, or that morning in my office, because he had disappeared, and I hated not knowing why, not seeing him, not having him around, not having an excuse to call and ask him because I had pushed him away, and last thing he probably wanted to do was talk to me. Lena, darling, Sharon called as her head peeked out of her office, jerking me back into the present. Please come in and take a seat. Following her inside, I let myself fall into one of the chairs. I watched the blonde woman sit down and lean over her desk with a secretive smile. Sorry about the wait. You know how some people think HR has the answers for everything. She chuckled with bitterness. Even for things like New York City Council deciding to repave the part of the road right outside their window. Any other day, I would have laughed too. Perhaps make a joke about how only the fittest could survive the city that never slept and always closed some road to keep you awake at all times. But I simply couldn't muster the energy for that. I'm sure it makes up for a few awkward conversations. Sharon's eyes scanned my face, something like understanding dawning in her features. What exactly she found or understood, I had no idea. All right, let's get to the chase. Good, I liked that, just like I had always liked Sharon, too. I've called you in here in light of some serious allegations that have been made which directly involve you. Something dropped to the bottom of my stomach, and I felt myself blanch. Oh, okay, I cleared my throat. What do you want to know? She inhaled deeply before she spoke, as if she was readying herself for something. Lena? she said, using a tone that I had heard from my own mother, comforting but also admonishing. We both are aware that Gerald knows the right kind of people, and frankly, I will never understand how someone so horrible manages to make so many good acquaintances. Her fingers air-quoted that last word. But as much as he has remained untouchable so far, that doesn't mean that he can't be knocked down. For that, however, we must do something. We should at least try. I felt myself nod, still trying to process what Sharon was telling me. She was admitting to being on my side. Not only that, but also she wouldn't remain a silent bystander. If that's something you want to do, we can work together on an employee formal complaint. I can help you. You'd need to sign it and submit it to us, and after that, I'd try to push for a thorough investigation. I know many complaints are ignored, but more than a few people having your back will make a difference. More than a few people? What? I trailed off, shaking my head. What people? I don't understand. She flicked her nails on the table, tilting her head. After the altercation in the co-working floor, a number of people came by my desk to inform me of what had happened. Half of them wanted to file the complaint themselves, but just like I told them, it has to be you. I, I just, my gaze fell on my hands, resting on my lap. I felt my heart expanding with gratitude, with something else, too, realization. So they are on my side? They have spoken on my behalf and not Gerald's? They are, Lena, she smiled, and they have. I know people like Gerald often go unpunished. It's how the world works sometimes. But that doesn't mean we should stop trying to change that, doesn't it? Doesn't mean that we stop fighting. Her words reminded me of those someone had said to me begged me to believe only a few days ago. Words that I had chosen to ignore. You can think about what I just told you, okay? Take your time to decide what you want to do. Yeah, I will. There was so much to think about, so much to process. To anybody else, this might have been nothing more than a bureaucratic process I should have thought of before. But to me, learning that my colleagues, those who had witnessed everything, were actively taking my side, it meant something. Although it didn't change what I had done. How I had thrown away everything I could have had with Aaron. How I had denied him the one thing he had asked of me. My full trust. My faith in us. And over what? He would have given me that much, and I had just given up without a fight. And please, Sharon said, 
If you could tell Aaron to come by as soon as he's back, I can't seem to get a hold of him. As soon as he's back? Oh, um, I don't, I just, my words tumbled out of me, mixing with questions spinning in my head. It's all good, Lena. He was very clear about your relationship. Came here first thing this week to ask if there was any kind of company policy or contract clause that would perhaps complicate things. The heartbeat that had flattened, accompanying me during these days without him, came back to life, peeking out. He had come to HR to be sure that all fronts were covered, to reassure me, because he'd known that I'd need exactly that, because he had wanted me to feel safe. Tears that hadn't been there before were in a rush to get to my eyes. Hey, it's okay, Lena. There aren't, there's no reason for you guys to worry. No stones in the way. No, the only one taking those possible obstacles on our way and turning them into impediments we couldn't get over was me. Okay, I muttered, willing my eyes to hold tight a little longer. That's good. Nothing was good, not a single thing because I had ruined it anyway. All right, good. Sharon's blonde head bobbed, her motherly eyes warming up. But please, do tell him to call me back, yes? I know these are hard times, but it's about his promotion. Hard times. Those two words echoed through my mind. Sharon's earlier request bounced right back. Tell Aaron to come by as soon as he's back. Did, did Aaron leave? Did something happen? Sharon's eyes widened, confusion mixing up with shock. You don't know? I shook my head, feeling my skin pale. No. Her head shook. Lena, this is not my place. Please, I begged, now desperate to know what was wrong, need clawing at my skin. Please, Sharon, we had a fight and I just messed up. It doesn't matter. But if there's something wrong, if something happened to him, I need to know. Please. She looked at me for a long moment. Darling, she finally said, and that alone made all the alarms in my head go off. He had to fly home. His dad is, he has cancer. He has been in a critical state for the last few weeks. Chapter 27 There was this show I'd loved when I was a teenager. It was an American TV series we got on one of the Spanish national channels, naturally dubbed. I absolutely loved it. High schoolers with big dreams and bigger egos, or hearts, depending on who you asked, angsty plot twists, and a level of drama someone at 16 shouldn't have been experiencing, at least not in a small town somewhere in North Carolina, or in the north of Spain, for that matter, which was perhaps why it all resonated so much with me. There was this one episode in particular that had somehow stuck in a way others never did. It started with a voiceover narrator who asked something along the lines of, what's the minimum length of time with the power to change your life? A year, a day, a few minutes? The answer to that question had come to be that when you were young, one single hour could make a difference. It could change everything. And I wholeheartedly disagreed. One didn't need to be young for their life to change in the span of an hour a handful of minutes, or nothing more than a few seconds. Life changed constantly, wickedly fast, and terribly slow, when one least expected it to, or after a long time of chasing that change. Life could be turned around, inside out, backward and forward, or it could even transform into something else entirely. And it happened regardless of age. But most importantly, it didn't care for time. Life-altering moments span from a few seconds to decades. It was part of the magic of life, of living. In my 28 years of life, I had experienced few but very different life-altering moments. Some had lasted seconds, no more than glimpses or moments in which a realization dawned. And others had lasted minutes, hours, even weeks. Either way, I could count those moments with both hands. Recite them from memory, too. The first time I dipped my feet into the sea. The first math equation I'd solved. My first kiss. Falling in and out of love with Daniel. All the terrible months after. Boarding that plane to New York to start a new life. 
watching my sister walk down the aisle with the biggest, happiest smile I had ever seen on her. And then there was Aaron. I thought I wouldn't be able to pick one single moment when it came to him, because it was him, the one thing that made that span of time important, life-altering. Falling asleep in his arms, watching his lips bend into that smile that I knew now had only been for me. Waking up to his voice, to the warmth of his skin against mine. Watching his face crumbling down, him walking away, his absence. All of them had left a dent in my heart, in me. All of them had changed me, shaped me into someone who allowed herself to open up, to love, to needing and wanting to give herself not to anybody, but to him. But as much as those moments that had made me fall helplessly in love with him left a mark I'd never be able to erase, one that I didn't think would ever fade, it was the split second when I had known I needed to get myself on a plane to Seattle and find him, the one moment that felt transcendental. The realization that I had let him go too soon, too carelessly, so foolishly. The moment it had dawned on me that nothing else besides going to him mattered, that nothing should have stopped me from running into his arms, from being there for him when he needed someone the most. But was it too late? Was the clock still ticking on my life-altering moment so I could turn it around? Or had I lost my chance? My head spun with that question for six hours on the flight from New York to Seattle, continuously bouncing from blinding hope to the dread that could only come from anticipating loss. And when the plane touched ground, I still wasn't sure whether to feel hopeful I was closer to him or whether I should have employed that time to ready myself if Aaron told me that it was too late and asked me to walk away. I thought about it some more as I waited for a taxi, I drove to the first hospital on my list of medical centers with oncology specialists in Seattle, and asked in reception for Richard Blackford, a name I had dug out from the internet from what Aaron had told me about him and his past. That question kept whirling in my mind as I turned around, got myself into a new taxi, and repeated the whole process with hospital number two, then hospital number three. And right as my knees almost doubled with a mix of relief and trepidation at finally hearing the nurse at the counter of hospital number three ask if I was family or friend, that question that was stuck in my head was still screaming at me to be answered. It still was now as I made my way to the waiting room on what would soon become the longest elevator ride of my life. Did I throw it all away out of fear and stupidity? Am I too late? So when the polished and metallic doors finally opened, I stumbled out of the elevator like someone walking out of an interminable road trip. Limbs numb, skin sticky with dry sweat, and the sense of not knowing where we were. My gaze anxiously scanned the space along the hallway before me, all the way to the waiting room, where I had been told he'd probably be. My Aaron, the man who I had to get to, to get back. And there, right there, sitting on a chair that barely accommodated his size, was my answer. With his arms on his knees and his head hanging low beneath his shoulders, there was my life-altering moment. And I realized, as I stared into the distance, my heart feeling as weightless and hollow as ever when I saw him there, alone, without me, that as long as I had him, my life-altering moment would never be a measurement of time. It would never be as simple as marking a few points in the timeline of my life that I could identify as transcendent. It was him, Aaron. He was my moment. And for as long as I had him, my life would constantly be changing, be altered. I'd be challenged, cherished, loved. With him, I'd live. And I'd fight for that. I'd fight for him like I hadn't when he asked me to. I wouldn't take no for an answer. He was stuck with me, just like he had promised me in Spain in front of the people I loved the most in this world. I'd prove that to him. Aaron, I heard myself say, let me be your rock, the hand that holds yours, your home. My voice was barely a whisper, too low and quiet to make it all the way to where he was. But somehow it did. It reached him, because Aaron's head snapped up. As he sat in that rigid plastic chair, his back straightened, and his gaze half turned in my direction, 
I could see the disbelief in his profile, as if he thought he must have imagined me calling his name. But I hadn't. I was there. And if he let me, I could take care of him. I would caress his back while he sat in the dull and impersonable waiting room, brush his hair with soothing fingers, and make sure he ate and slept. I'd comfort him with hugs and be the shoulder he leaned his forehead on as he grieved the dad he might lose soon. The one who had missed so much. The one I knew Aaron felt like was already gone. His gaze scanned the space that separated us with the sheer determination I knew only he was capable of. And I'd never know why, but I waited. I held very still as he swiped around. And then, after what felt like an eternity, and at the same time not enough time to prepare myself, blue eyes locked with mine. My heart toppled over itself, and I felt the commotion inside my chest. I watched his legs straighten, bringing him up. Then his lips parted with my name. Lena. It wasn't the Lena instead of Catalina. It was the anguish in his voice, the need, the way his hair was ruffled, the bags resting under his eyes, the wrinkles in his clothes that screamed they hadn't been changed in a couple of days, that propelled me forward. My legs sprinted across that hallway that separated us like they had never run before, towards him, right into his arms, just how he had asked me to. And when I reached him, I launched myself at him. I locked my body around his. It wasn't appropriate. It wasn't the time or the place, but he was carrying so much on his shoulders already. There was so much we needed to talk about, but it was right. I knew it in my bones as his arms closed around me. He lifted me off the floor, squeezed me into his chest, held me in his arms. I buried my face in his neck as I kept murmuring into him. I'm here. I'm here. I'm running toward you. I trust you. I love you hoping it wasn't too late. And he kept repeating my name. Lena, baby. Lena, are you really here? Hushed and broken, sounding like he still didn't believe it was me in his arms. That it was me who had finally come to him like I should have done days ago. No, like I should have done an eternity ago. Aaron walked backwards, sitting back down as he held me in his arms. As I took him into mine, my body curled into his lap, and his palm cupped the nape of my neck. I'm so sorry, Aaron. I breathed into the skin between his shoulders and the underside of his jaw. For everything. For your dad and for not being here by your side earlier. How is he? Have you seen him? I felt his throat swallow against my temple. He's... Aaron shook his head. I have seen him, but he's been out of it all this time. I just... He trailed off, sounding exhausted defeated. Are you really here, baby? He repeated, holding me tighter. Or is this my imagination playing tricks on me? I haven't slept in, I don't know how many days, two, three. I'm here. I'm right here. I lifted my head and moved so I could cup his face. Take a good look at that face I had been so set on despising and now loved so much. And I'm going to take care of you. His eyes fluttered closed and I heard a strangled sound coming from his throat. I love you, Aaron. You shouldn't be alone, ever. And I am the one meant to be with you, here, holding your hand. His eyes remained closed, his jaw pressed tightly. Let me do it. Let me prove to you that I trust you and that I can earn your trust back, that I am the one who's supposed to be by your side right now and as long as you'll let me. You want to do that? Yes, I rushed out quickly. Yes, yes, of course I want to, I repeated. I need to, I whispered, not trusting my voice. Let me be here for you, take care of you. His eyes opened, our gazes connecting. After a long moment, a pain chuckle rose to his lips. You drive me so fucking crazy, Lena. I don't think you understand. One of his hands latched onto my wrist as I still cupped his face desperately. I was ready to fight. I was ready to beg if it was necessary. You came all the way here? You. He trailed off, disbelief crumpling his face. How did you even find me? I had to come to you. My fingers trailed down the side of his neck, my palms settling against the warm skin. I remembered everything you told me about Seattle, your dad being somewhat known here. So I googled your last name, the university football team, the coaching staff. 
Then I looked for a list of hospitals where he could have checked in. I knew you'd be here because you wouldn't leave his side if he was in critical condition, like Sharon had told me. And you haven't. You are here. It only took me a few tries. I would have turned the city upside down if I hadn't found you. I wouldn't have rested until I got to you. I finally allowed my lungs to take in a breath, and I found Aaron's eyes shining with something that made my chest ache in a warm and wonderful way. I did call you, but it went straight to voicemail, and then I just didn't want to busy your head with anything else, and my voice lowered to a whisper. And I did not want to give you a chance to tell me not to come. I was terrified you wouldn't want me to. So I didn't call again. I just came to you instead. A shudder rocked Aaron's body. You blow my goddamn mind. My rules, my world. He breathed those ocean blue eyes, capturing my gaze like they never had before. When I least expect it, I find you ready to dynamite your way right into my heart, as if you hadn't done that already. The grip of his fingers on my wrist tightened, pulling me to him, and I could feel the soft air leaving his mouth, falling on my lips. As if you hadn't already dismantled me for anybody else. As if I wasn't at your mercy. Hope, warm and soft hope, fell over my shoulders. I have done all that? You have, Lena. Aaron's forehead fell on mine, and I had no choice but to close my eyes, to take it all and control this whirlwind of emotion threatening to turn me inside out. With every smile, you have done exactly that. I felt his lips brushing over mine briefly, sending a shiver down my spine. With every single time, you have been infuriatingly stubborn and impossibly beautiful all at once. He placed a kiss on the corner of my eye. With every time you have shown the world how incredibly strong you are, even when you don't believe so yourself. A kiss on the tip of my nose. With all the ways your mind amazes and disturbs me in ways I'll never understand and not ever tire of. His lips landed on my cheekbone, flicking across the skin. Without every single time you laugh, I want to throw you over my shoulder and run somewhere I can covet that sound just for myself. A kiss was brushed on my jaw, his lips then sweeping along until reaching my ear. And with every other unfathomable way, you have made me completely yours. Yours, I repeated, my heart expanding in my chest, lurching itself against my rib cage, wanting out and into Aaron's. I'm yours too, Aaron, so completely yours. I have fallen in love with you. I don't know how it happened, but it did. I love you. I didn't recognize my own voice, not with a loud thumping in my ears. I was so stupid to let you walk away, so, so dumb. But I got lost in my head. I was so scared, Aaron. I didn't want to lose everything I had worked so hard for, to have people look at me like they had all those years ago. To lose you, too, when you realized that I was a complication? You'd never be that. I know that now, but I somehow convinced myself that letting you go was the best thing I could do to protect myself from that happening again. I shook my head, pushing that dreadful emotion out of my chest. I'd tell Aaron about Sharon and the investigation into Gerald, but now wasn't the time. I'm sorry for not being here for you like I should have. He looked at me like he didn't want my apologies, but I didn't let him talk. I am, my voice wavered. Knowing that your dad was sick and you were all the way here alone, taking it all without anyone to hold you, that he had been critical for weeks and yet you came to Spain with me, that you... I trailed off, my voice now shaking. That you would give me so fucking much without ever asking for anything in return. It destroyed me. But I'm here now, I whispered, looking into his eyes. I'm here, and I'm not going anywhere. Not because I believe that we can somehow be together now, but because I can't conceive of being anywhere else but beside you. I swallowed hard, trying to rein in every emotion threatening to burst out. You know that, right? I leaned in, my lips brushing over his, very softly, almost tentatively, waiting for his answer. I do now. A low grunt came from his throat. His fingers tightened once more around my wrist. The arm around my waist brought me even deeper into his chest. I do, Lena, and I don't plan on letting you forget that. The hand that had been on my wrist trailed up my arm. 
his palm cupping my face. I leaned into his touch, feeling like I could live only on Aaron's caresses and kisses. I would have come back for you, you know. I told you I wouldn't let you quit on us. You still owed me that four-letter word. He had said that, and the realization made my stomach drop to my feet. How dumb I had been. Aaron hadn't given up on us. That had been only me, only temporarily. While Aaron had been holding on to this, to us, all this time, even when he needed someone by his side the most. And that, that made the heart in my chest burst into a hundred million pieces, only to reassemble into something different, something that didn't belong to me anymore. It belonged to us. It's yours, love and all the four-letter words I could ever give you. I placed a kiss on his mouth, not able to hold myself back any longer. I took my time with his lips, claiming them as mine, claiming him. A hum sounded deep in his throat. You're stuck with me, Catalina. Both arms cradled me closer to his lap, further into his chest. The side of my head rested against his drumming heart, his chin on top of my hair, and peace, an overpowering kind of peace I had never heard of or experienced before, settled between my shoulders. And I knew then, that we'd take anything on as long as we were together. We were a team. We'd light up each other's way, hold each other's hand, and push the other forward when we stumbled. Together, we'd do anything together. Just like we would get through this, I'd get Aaron through this. Aaron, I lifted my gaze and met his. I'm here for you now. I'm going to take care of you, I told him simply. He sighed. It was deep and slow, and it sounded like he carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. But just know that if I had known your dad was sick, I would have never let you come to Spain with me. Why didn't you tell me when we talked about him, Aaron? I know you don't owe me an explanation, but I want to know. I want to understand better. Because everything changed. His throat worked, and his gaze took on a lost edge. He has been battling cancer for the last year. Ironic, huh? First mom, and now... Aaron trailed off, needing a second to compose himself. Until a few days ago, I had planned on remaining away. Leave things the way they were between us, even when I flew home a few weeks ago. You did? Yes. It was after my promotion was announced. That was what kept me from talking to you about our deal. I had not noticed Aaron taking days off back then, although work had been completely crazy so I guessed I had been distracted. But it all made sense now. I would have talked to you eventually. I would have managed either way. That doesn't matter now, baby, I told him, meaning every word. He sighed deeply. So I came all the way to Seattle, but I couldn't bring myself to talk to him, to admit to myself, to show him that I still cared when he had pushed me away all those years ago, when he was the father I had already lost. My fingers drew circles on his chest, right above his heart. What changed then? Everything did. He exhaled, and it came out shaky and pained. I, I somehow thought I had you, and then just as quickly I didn't. And as much as I was set on not letting you quit on me, I saw it in your eyes. You had really given up on us. You believed in your decision. A shadow came over his face and I instinctively leaned to place a kiss to the corner of his lips, dissipating that temporary darkness. The possibility that I could really lose you started solidifying in my head, and I just... He shook his head. God, it's not the same, I know, but I finally got it. I understood how hard it had hit him, losing Mom. How lost he must have been at the reality of not having a way to get her back. How many reckless decisions he must have taken. It did not justify that he pushed me away, but I am to blame too. I had been so lost in my own head that I let him do that, and then I allowed both of us to keep it on for years. Neither of you is at fault, Aaron. We are not programmed to lose those we love. There's no right or wrong way to grieve. My hand trailed up his chest, my palms settling against his collarbone. We just try our best, even when often our best is not good enough. Blaming yourself now is not going to change the past. It's only going to take away energy that you should be spending in the present. And look where you are now. You are here. It's not too late. 
He brushed a kiss over my head. That day when everything with Gerald went down, I got a call from the hospital. They told me that things didn't look well for him. Apparently, my dad had asked for me, several times, demanded that I be contacted. His voice trailed off, and I let my fingers play with the hair at the nape of his neck, letting him know I was here, listening, having his back. It's like everything lined up, and suddenly, not only did I understand him in a way I hadn't before, but I also had this urge to see him, not to apologize or to mend things between us, but to at least say goodbye. And I knew this was probably my last chance to do that. Did you do that? Say goodbye? The moment I got here, I went into his room with the intention to do that, say goodbye, walk out, and just wait. But I somehow ended up talking to him, telling him everything I hadn't said in all these years we were apart. He wasn't conscious. I can't be sure if he was even listening. But I just went on. I couldn't stop. I talked and talked to Lena. Told him everything. I don't even know how long I was there. And I don't know if it was for nothing because maybe not a word was getting through to him, but I did it anyway. You did good, amor. I brushed my lips against the skin of his neck. You did so good. Aaron melted a little more into me, into my touch. They told me a few hours ago that he seems to be doing a bit better today, that he might get more time. They don't know if it's days, weeks, or months, but they are hopeful. His chest deflated, the arms around me losing that desperate edge they'd had a while ago. I am hopeful too. A voice coming from somewhere on the other side of the waiting room reached us, bursting the bubble we had been in. Mr. Blackford? We both turned and looked over. A nurse stood a few feet away, his smile trained to be polite and calming. Yes, Aaron said, his back straightening in the chair. He's finally awake. You can see him now. The nurse slipped his hands in his pockets of his scrubs. Only a few minutes, okay? He needs to rest. Disentangling my body from his, I placed both feet on the ground and stood in front of Aaron, making space for him to walk to the nurse. He followed suit his head still turning toward the entrance of the waiting room. Okay, yeah, he said almost absently. But before he stepped away, he looked at me. Come with me, please. My heart skipped a beat just then, the answer sounding loud and clear in my head. I'd go anywhere with you if you so much as asked. Yes, of course I will. I didn't wait for him to stretch out his hand and take mine. I did that myself and I kept my hold tight and as reassuring as I possibly could as we followed the nurse to the room where Aaron's dad waited. We stepped in, and I did not know what to expect. Perhaps I should have readied myself on the way to the room and the realization that I hadn't made part of my bravado scatter away. This was the only living family Aaron had left, and I was about to meet him, and I I suddenly stumbled a little under the importance of the moment. I wish it could have been under different circumstances, that there was more time, or that I was sure about what to say, how to handle this situation so everything went as well as it could. But there wasn't time. This was what we had, what Aaron and his dad had. And even if a little scared or uneasy, I was humbled that Aaron wanted to share it with me. There's someone here to see you, Richard, the nurse announced into the room, and then looked over at us. His smile inched up. I'll be back in a few minutes, okay? Aaron took a step forward, and I remained a little behind him, letting him have this moment to himself. Son, the man perched on the bed said in a raspy voice. I looked over at him and found the ghost of the features I knew so well. The hard jaw, the way both brows met, that intent and confidence about them. It was all there, although faded and worn. You are still here, Aaron's dad said, and I could hear the surprise in his tone. Dad, I heard Aaron's answer, and the grip of his hand on mine tightened. Of course I'm still here, and there's someone I'd like you to meet. Blue eyes that looked in our direction from the bed trailed behind Aaron with curiosity. Hi, Mr. Blackford, I smiled at him, feeling Aaron's hand leave mine and fall on my shoulders. I'm Catalina, and I'm happy to finally meet you. Aaron's dad didn't return the smile, not completely but his eyes told a different story, just like I had seen his son do so many times, all under lock and key. Call me Richard, please. 
His gaze searched my face, something akin to wonder slowly seeping in. Is this her son? The question caught me by surprise, and so I glanced back at Aaron. I found him staring at his dad with a mirroring expression. Then his profile softened. I wasn't sure you were listening, he said almost absently. Then his arm brought me closer to him, as if tucking me into him were nothing more than a reflex. Yes, this is her, he answered loudly, and my breath hitched in my chest. The woman I told you all about. Aaron looked down at me, his eyes shining under the fluorescent light of the room. You're Thea, I heard Richard say, emotion coating his voice. Thea, that had been his wife's name, Aaron's mom. I peered in his direction, finding that smile he had hidden earlier. It was small and weak, but it was enough to make mine break free in return. Hold on to her, son, for as long as time lets you. I will. Aaron's words brushed the skin on my temple. I looked up at him, finding those blue eyes smiling down at me with a devotion I had never experienced or imagined being on the receiving end of. With the warmth that I could feel right in the middle of my chest, pounding and expanding with every passing second I spent under his gaze, by his side, Aaron looked at me with a world of possibility shining bright and dazzling in his eyes. A promise. This is the woman I plan on spending the rest of my life with. I'm not letting go of her anytime soon. Epilogue. One year later. Catalina? The deep voice that had lured me to sleep and ignited every cell in my body countless times in the last 12 months reached my ears. My pen dropped from my mouth, smacking the glossy surface of the oak conference table. Catalina, I'm going to need an answer. My back straightened in my chair, my gaze meeting a pair of blue eyes as I cleared my throat. Shit, I totally spaced out. Yes, yes, ahem, <clears throat> an answer. Coming right up, Mr. Blackford. I rushed out, just mentally recapping. I watched the corner of his lips tip up, his eyes simmering with an emotion I was more than familiar with. My heart skipped a beat, because apparently, I'd never not react to this man's smile, no matter how small it was. Rosie, if you could maybe assist Catalina as she mentally recaps, he said, cocking a brow. We all have places to be, and I'd appreciate being through with this meeting in the next five minutes. Of course, my best friend and new team leader of our division agreed from my right. I'm sure Lena was being very thorough with the notes she was taking. Yep, I was doing exactly that. I confirmed, looking over at her and finding her cheeks flushed. We both still sucked at lying. I sent her a wobbly smile and mouthed, thanks. I heard Aaron's deep exhalation. Impatient and sexy-eyed grump. He was lucky I was head over heels in love with him. Aaron was suggesting that perhaps now that Linda and Patricia are back from their maternity leaves, someone from your team could transfer to Hector's, Rosie explained her fingers fumbling on top of her open planner. Just to temporarily cover the vacancy I left now that I'm leading Gerald's team after his departure. After the tedious and lengthy HR investigation Sharon had pushed for unearthed more than a few sexual misconduct instances, Gerald had been finally laid off. Aaron, our division leader and owner of my heart, hadn't hesitated, and the moment Gerald had walked out of Intec, Rosie's name had already been on the table for that position. Before we knew it, we had been celebrating her promotion. Do you think we can make that work, Catalina? My future husband asked. Not that he had proposed, not yet. As much as I had the suspicion he would soon, perhaps I'd be the one putting a ring on him before he ever did. I was impatient like that. 100%, I answered, scribbling a note on my pad, this time for real. I'll make sure to move around a few people and see who can support Hector's team. The old man sighed. Thanks, Lena. No one will be able to fill Rosie's shoes, not really. His shoulders bunched as he smiled sadly. But I knew for a while that I'd lose her soon anyway. He shrugged, his smile turning brighter as he looked at my friend and his former team member. I'm so proud of you, Rosie. Thank you, Rosie said, emotion coating her words. She cleared her throat. Now stop it. 
Crying on my first division meeting would be highly unprofessional. A notepad was snapped closed briskly. All right, I'll consider that done, Mr. Grumps concluded. I looked at him just in time to see him checking the clock behind me. Meeting wrapped up. Have. But Aaron, Kabir called, his voice dancing with trepidation. What about? Sorry, but I'm officially on vacation. Aaron sliced his hand through the air. Yep, we both were. Just a half day. But it had taken me some convincing, so I called that a success anyway. It will have to wait until Monday. Have a great weekend, everyone. He pushed back the chair and stood up gifting me with a view of his whole torso. I sighed internally, happily, all mine. All of that was just for me and for my taking. And what was even better, that strong and resilient heart beating inside his hard chest with loyalty, selflessness, and integrity was all mine too. Catalina? Snapping out of my temporary trance, I straightened too, gathering all my things together. Coming, coming. I walked to where Aaron was waiting for me, right by the door. He lowered his voice. You are awfully distracted today. A retort was ready to leave my lips, but the way he looked at me with that brand of deep concern that melted my heart killed it before it could ever come out. You are awfully distracting, I said just for him. His eyes glazed over, and I could see how he was stopping himself from pouncing on me. But we were at our workplace and we were always meticulously professional. Not because we needed to be, as everyone knew and respected our relationship, but because we had made that choice. So I switched to a safer topic. I am also a little nervous. I know, he admitted, as we made our way down the hallway, carrying the packed laptop bags we had brought to the meeting. Our luggage is already in the car, so we'll make it to the airport just in time to pick them up. We entered the empty elevator. Aaron placing himself close beside me, our arms brushing softly. I checked earlier and their flight will land as scheduled, he said as the metallic doors closed. Thanks, I breathed out, unconsciously inching closer to him. But I'm still a little anxious. It's their first time in the U.S. and everyone is coming. That's a lot of Martins in an aircraft for everything to go smoothly. What if the flight was too much for Abuela? What if Papa forgot the medication for his tension? You know, I had to FaceTime him to explain to him how to set a reminder on his phone so he would take it, but even that way, he probably snoozed it and forgot about that too. And I'm scared of what Mama packed in her suitcase. Remember I told you that one time she wanted me to bring a whole pata de jamón in my carry-on? That's a leg of pig, Aaron. What if she's carrying some illegal produce and Customs thinks she's smuggling something into the... The elevator came to a brisk halt. Then Aaron's lips were on mine the sudden kiss rendering me immediately speechless, disarmed, weightless. I melted into him, my legs turning to butter. I couldn't help it. Aaron would always have that effect on me. I knew it. Baby, he breathed into my mouth. Stop overthinking. He took my lips in his again, his arms coming around me, his body gently pushing back against the cool surface behind me. Did you just stop the elevator, Mr. Blackford? My voice sounded breathless, not that I cared. Aaron was fully aware of the power he held over me, and I wanted it that way. Neither of us wanted a single unsaid thing between us. There had been plenty of those in the past. Yes, he brushed his lips along my jaw. And we have three minutes to get all those worries out of your head before the front desk is called. His mouth trailed down my neck, warm palms falling on my waist. My lips parted. Oh, okay, I murmured as he nibbled at the sensitive skin. My blood started swirling, certain parts of my body demanding attention. I like how that sounds. I made sure your dad would take his pills with him when I talked to him on the phone before they left the house. Aaron's hands trailed up, reaching the swell of my breasts. Christina is only bringing a few cuts of cured meat, he continued as his legs crowded mine. It wasn't easy, and I might have promised a few things I shouldn't have, but she compromised. A low chuckle left my mouth, but all humor died when his hips rocked briefly against mine. Abuela will be fine. She's tough as nails. Or don't you remember how I had to literally pluck her off that dance floor last Christmas? He tucked at the lobe of my ear with his teeth. And Isabel's pregnancy doesn't put her at risk. 
Gonzalo called the airline to ask, twice. I whimpered, relishing in the sensation of feeling Aaron all around me, his warmth, the strength of his body, his breath and voice falling on my skin, but also in how deep his words and actions ran, how much love and attention there was in them, in him. It's crazy how much my family adores you, I told him, grasping both his arms with neglected need running through my body. You're like a Martin whisper. How do you manage to do that? I thought that my success in convincing them about how serious I was about you after we confessed the truth about our deal was pure luck. But I might have a way with words when it comes to the Martins. He whispered like it was his biggest secret. With one particular Martin, though, I want to believe I have a way with more than just that. My hands trailed up his strong arms, passing over his shoulders, and finally clasping behind his neck. You do, I murmured. I adore you too, treasure you, love you, want you, need you. I pulled him closer. Who's being awfully distracting now? He rasped. I answered by grinding myself against his hard body, briefly but intently. A grunt fell from his lips. Look at you, teasing me like this. What an adoring and distracting woman I have in my hands. How much longer do we have? I arched my back, pressing our chests together. He exhaled roughly. Not nearly enough for what I have in mind. His palm fell on my behind, as if he couldn't stop himself. He squeezed me possessively, proving his point. His voice turned low. Later, I swear, as soon as I get you alone in our room. Aaron kissed me deeply then, silently promising all the things he'd do to me much later. Hours from now, when we finally reached the house we had rented in Montauk for the weekend, and our family was settled comfortably inside. Okay, cupping his face in my palms, I brushed one last kiss against his lips. Have you talked to your dad? Aaron reluctantly peeled himself off me and pressed the yellow button on the panel. The elevator resumed its descent. Yes, earlier today. He admitted, almost guardedly, just like every time he talked about Richard. I knew Aaron hadn't let go of part of the guilt he carried around, but father and son had come a long way, and they both knew Richard didn't have much time. This past year had already been a gift. He and Martha should be getting to the house in a few hours. Martha, his caregiver, was another gift sent straight from heaven. She was amazing to Richard and always kept us updated. We trusted her fully, and having her constant support and company not only reassured Aaron and me, but also soothed Richard. I'll check on them again while we wait for your family at the airport. The elevator doors opened in front of us, and we stepped out at the same time. Everything will be all right, amor, I told him, breaking my rules and reaching for his hand in the middle of the lobby. Your dad will make it to Montauk safely, and he's going to love everyone just how everyone will love him. Breaking his own rules, too, he brought my hand to his mouth, his lips brushing the backs of my fingers. I know, baby, he whispered just for me. Everything will always be okay, no matter what. You know why? We stepped out of the building, right into one of New York's overwhelming summer days. Why? Because it's you and me. He smiled down at me then meeting my gaze with the conviction his words held, just as he held my heart in his hands, my love, my whole world, confidently and completely. And no matter what comes our way, we have each other. That Aaron smile, which was just for me and never failed to make my heart skip a beat, widened. We are in this together for the long run. The Spanish Love Deception, a novel, was written by Elena Armas and read by Scarlett Hayes. Editing and post-production by, like, 2,000 pounds. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio. The Spanish Love Deception, a novel, is available in print from Atria Books.